have been infringed by a law or by the actions of the public body, he or she may bring a legal challenge in court. Hence, it is possible for individuals to argue that our existing laws and policies on marriage are unconstitutional and seek a ruling from the court to that effect. Just as there have been challenges on the constitutionality of 377A, there can also be challenges to laws and policies related to marriage. The experiences of other jurisdictions show the perils of court-led change. Most recently, in August 2022, the Indian Supreme Court observed that the definition of a family unit should be expanded to include homosexual relationships as well as unmarried partnerships or same-sex relationships. relationships. This did not even arise from a challenge of the de definition of family per se. It arose from a case when an employer denied a nurse her application for maternity leave because she had already taken leave to care for her husband's children from a previous marriage. Before this, in 2018, the Indian Supreme Court also struck down Section 377 of the Indian Penal Code, which similarly criminalized male homosexual acts. We also see the same trend in other jurisdictions. In the US, for instance, controversial issues such as abortion are litigated and re-litigated in their courts. When the courts decide, things change overnight with drastic social repercussions that paralyze society. Hence, we are proactively safeguarding the institution of marriage and related laws and policies from being challenged in court. This will allow the government to continue to make laws and policies which depend on heterosexual marriage as its foundation. There have been questions on why the government is intervening now. Why repeal? Why even amend the constitution? Perhaps we should leave things as they are. Let the courts decide when there is a challenge. Why do this now when there are other issues of concern, such as cost of living? That might be politically expedient. We acknowledge that there are indeed other issues of conscience to Singaporeans, such as cost of living. To use that as a reason for inaction might be politically expedient, but would not be the right or responsible thing to do. We have assessed that there is a significant risk to our laws being struck down. We cannot just ignore the legal risk. This amendment is necessary and is the right thing to deal with it now and not delay. We have the mandate and the responsibility to govern, and we must put forward what we think is best for Singapore and Singaporeans. This includes making changes in a calibrated and careful manner that may not please everyone. We appreciate our courts for exercising wisdom and restraint on this matter. But a responsible government should not leave the courts to grapple with controversial social issues. The role of the courts is to interpret and apply the law. It's not their constitutional function to settle political questions or rule on social norms and values. It's not their function to engage with the political, social, ethical, and other dimensions of the issues. Nor do the courts wish to do so. Litigation is a zero-sum, adversarial process with win-lose outcomes. It's unlike a political process where the interests of stakeholders can be considered, accommodation can be sought to reach consensus. The courts also recognize that controversial social issues are best dealt with within the sphere of parliament. This bill is what a responsible government carrying out its duty to the people of Singapore would introduce. It allows the political process to balance different interests and perspectives and does not pass the buck to the courts. 
to rule on social issues which are best dealt with via Parliament. Let me now elaborate on the provisions of the Bill. There will be a new Article 156 under the general provisions of the Constitution. Clause 1 of the article makes clear that Parliament can act to define, regulate, protect, safeguard, support, foster and promote marriage. For example, today the Women's Charter in AMLA defines civil and Muslim marriages respectively and make clear that same-sex marriages are not valid. This clause empowers Parliament to continue to make and amend laws for these purposes. The interpretation of other constitutional provisions must recognize this. For example, in applying the reasonable classification test under Article 12.1, the courts must recognize that the promotion and safeguarding of heterosexual marriage are legitimate and permissible legislative objects. Clause 2 of the article applies to the government and any public authority. It allows them to exercise their functions to protect, safeguard, support, foster and promote marriage. This includes, but is not limited to the following situations. HDB can implement public housing policies that give preference to married couples to support, foster and promote marriage. MSF when they evaluate adoption applications, can recognize and take into account the public policy goal to foster and promote the formation of families within the context of marriage as defined in Women's Charter and AMLA. Curricular for preschools and MOE schools center on the values that reflect Singapore's mainstream society. That is, marriage as being a union between a man and a woman and children being born within marriage and raised within such a family construct. In the context of sexuality education, contents will be age appropriate. This means, for example, in preschools and primary schools, our curriculum will not feature same-sex parents or same-sex romantic relationships. At older ages, if introduced, we'll focus on educating our young to treat everyone with respect and empathy, but will not promote same-sex relationships. IMDA, in regulating media content, is guided by principles that include prevailing social norms and values that are generally acceptable to members of the public and protecting younger audiences from age-inappropriate content. Clause 3A, provides that nothing in Part 4 of the Constitution. It sets out the eight fundamental liberties, will invalidate any legislative definition of marriage as a union between a man and a woman. Clause 3B and Clause 4, respectively, provides that laws and executive actions cannot be invalidated by Part 4 just because they are based on a heterosexual definition of marriage. Some may ask why specify all the other fundamental liberties in Part 4 and not just Article 12. Mr. Desmond will explain, but broadly, we need Article 156 to cover all of Part 4 so that it can apply to other radical legal arguments that may be brought in the future and based on other articles in Part 4. Article 156 will provide a strong shield. However, the shield is also precise, where it only protects the heterosexual definition of marriage and the laws and policies that rely on this definition. In effect, Article 156 is an exception to the fundamental liberties. There are already such exceptions. For example, Article 39A empowers the legislature to create group representation constituency or GRCs to ensure minority representation in parliament. Article 39A3 of the constitution exempts any law regarding GRCs from being invalidated on the ground of inconsistency with Article 12. Article 1491 
prevents the Internal Security Act from being invalidated by Articles 9, 11, 12, 13 or 14. Article 9.6 creates exceptions from Article 9 for the Criminal Law Temporary Provisions Act and for rehabilitative detention for drug addicts. Article 14.2 also has limits on Article 14, where one's rights to freedom of speech, assembly and association is subject to public order, morality or security of Singapore. Article 12.3 makes clear that the right to equal protection does not apply to laws that regulate personal law or to laws and practices that restrict office or employment connected with affairs of any religion. Each case involves a balance between the fundamental liberties and countervailing interests. In the case of Article 1563 and 4, we have struck the balance in favour of having the strongest protection for the heterosexual definition of marriage adopted by Parliament and the ability of Parliament and the government to make laws and policies on the basis of this definition. This reflects the importance of heterosexual marriage in our society. Some have commented that this is an ouster clause and could be subject to legal challenges. To be clear, the nature of Article 156 is not an ouster clause. Instead, it provides exceptions or limits to the fundamental liberties. As mentioned, such, such exception already exists today. Let me now turn to another aspect that have come up in our engagements. They have been wide-ranging, and we have heard from Singaporeans across various walks of life. I, I first want to take the opportunity to appreciate the different groups of Singaporeans who have written in and whom we have engaged before and after PM's announcements. These engagements include those with religious leaders, grassroots leaders, union leaders, LGBT groups, social sector professionals, youth groups, and members of the public. Many have written in to share their views on this matter. Singaporeans have generally understood the need to respect, graciously and mutually accommodate each other's views and support the government's approach. Gay people appreciate the repeal of Section 377A, but express some apprehension of the implications of the constitutional amendments. Those in favour of the status quo have constructively shared their views and emphasised the need to safeguard the institution of marriage. Others, whom we have engaged, such as leaders from the community, also support the proposed approach to keep the heterosexual definition of marriage while repealing 377A. Many are concerned about cancel culture, religious freedom, discrimination faced by those with differing views on this issue, and the narrowing public space, to speak openly about it. These are important feedback and concerns that Mr. Desmond Lee will also address when he speaks. Some express the wish to go further than what we are proposing, protecting the definition of marriage in our current laws. They want the definition of marriage to be enshrined in the Constitution. We understand that these calls come from a sincere belief in the sanctity of marriage and reflect a genuine worry that the institution of marriage, marriage might be changed in the future to include same-sex marriage. I thank those who have spoken up for taking a stand on what they think is best for Singapore. But the government has to govern with principle. Our view is that elevating marriage to the same level as fundamental rights in the Constitution would not be appropriate. As explained earlier, the Constitution should be for functions such as sovereignty and our systems, system of governance. The institution of marriage and family is the bedrock of society, but to elevate it to the same level as fundamental rights would fundamentally change the whole complexion and schema of the Constitution. There are many important laws and principles that are not in the Constitution 
but are in acts of parliament. For example, national service in the Enlistment Act. Corruption is in the Prevention of Corruption Act. Zero tolerance to drugs is in the Misuse of Drugs Act. Home ownership is in the HDB Act. The definition of marriage is and will remain in the Women's Charter, Interpretation Act and AMLA. Importantly, this government will not use our current supermajority in Parliament to tie the hands of the future generations. Hence, the constitutional amendment will not prevent future governments elected by the people from amending the legal de definition of marriage by a simple majority in Parliament, should they choose to do so. This is how democracy works. But what we want to be clear is that the definition of marriage and related policies should not be determined by the courts. In fact, the constitutional amendment provides greater protection than today, not just for the definition of marriage, but also related policies. PM has said that this government has no intention of changing the definition of marriage, nor the policies that rely on this definition. DPM Lawrence Wong, as 4G leader, has also said that the government will not change them under his watch if the PAP were to win the next general election. I reiterate these assurances in this House. Ultimately, whether marriage in Singapore will remain as a union between a man and a woman depends on the consensus in society, shaped by the values we all hold. So long as society strongly supports the current definition of marriage, no government will change the definition. If society's support erodes, no amount of legislation or constitutional attrenchment will prevent change. On our part, the government is doing all we can to promote social norms and values aligned to the current definition of marriage. But it's not something the government can accomplish on its own. The transmission of social values to the next generation is something Singaporeans practice within their own families and with their loved ones. Sir, this approach in this the approach in this bill reflects Singapore's unique approach. Singapore is a secular state, but a multi-religious and multi-racial society. We are one of the most diverse societies in the world. There are different ethnic and religious groups, each with their own practices, customs, norms, convictions, and beliefs. This diversity and harmony makes Singapore unique and is a key part of our Singaporean identity. It's not easy to hold such a diverse society together. We are a young nation, and all of us have taken great care and effort to preserve the harmony and peace that we have. We have been able to live together peacefully because we learn to understand, go beyond our own perspectives, and graciously accommodate one another. This has been the Singapore way, because we recognize what is best for our society. Some may wish to maximize their own positions, but when this happens, it unsettles others and causes resistance, which will lead to further pushback and split our society apart. Singapore will not come out well in the end. It's therefore important that certain groups do not push beyond what is acceptable to our society. In most cases, society needs time to adjust to change, especially on issues that can polarize us. We may have different ideals and perspectives, but we are all Singaporeans, and I hope this is an identity we, can, we continue to be proud of. We forge a majority based on what we share in common and what <laughs> unites us. This is why the government has consistently emphasized the importance of preserving our common space 
fostering good citizens and upholding the principle of equality regardless of race, language or religion. Only then can we be united as Singaporeans to achieve progress as a nation. We are fortunate that our religious leaders understand the context of our diverse society and their communities trust the government to treat all faith completely impartially. While they are honest and constructive in providing their views on matters of concern in their religious communities, they trust that laws and policies are in the national interest and not to favour one religion over another. This approach works because the government on its part is fair and considers all perspectives, including those who are religious as well as those who are not religious. No one can act only for the interests of a few segments of the society without regard for the rest. Maintaining this approach requires wisdom and courage from everyone. As we see in other societies, it's very easy to yield to sectarian or tribalist views. Even if you do not win, you will be popular with them. But we need to guard against this. We also continue to protect all from scorn and harm. This includes homosexuals who are members of society, our kith, our kin. Our homosexuals have a place in our society and space to live their lives in Singapore. In our families, we should not exclude our, lo our loved ones who are homosexuals. In our communities, they, like other Singaporeans, have access to education and employment, to healthcare and social services, to protection from violence and harassment. Workplace discrimination against homosexuals for reasons unrelated to their ability to do the job is a breach of the principle of fair and merit-based employment, outlined in the Tripartite Guidelines on Fair Employment Practices. But on marriage and family, most Singaporeans wish to retain current norms. As I've mentioned before, it is the government's view as well. As a society, regardless of your views on marriage, family or homosexuality, no one should feel unsafe express, expressing your views of fear of being cancelled, bullied or discriminated against. It's dangerous for our society if we do not learn to respect others who hold differing views from us. This threatens the common space and Singapore will not be able to progress as a cohesive society. Sir in Malay. Dalam berkongsi niat pemerintah untuk memansuhkan Section 377A, kami telah melibatkan masyarakat Melayu Islam secara meluas sepanjang tahun ini. Ini termasuklah para pemimpin agama, asatiza serta ketua masyarakat dan badan-badan Melayu Islam. Ramai pada mulanya bimbang ia akan mengakibatkan perubahan mendadak pada dasar-dasar lain seperti takrifan perkahwinan, pengambilan anak angkat, peraturan atas kandungan media dan kurikulum pendidikan, serta pendekatan masyarakat secara keseluruhan. Secara jelas, masyarakat kita mahu institusi keluarga kekal sebagai tunggak utama kita. Saya telah memberi penjelasan bahawa pemansuhan Seksyen 377A akan diiringi pindaan perlambakan akan dilakukan sekaligus supaya Parlimen terus berhak menetapkan Undang-Undang Perkahwinan dan Keluarga. Ia akan membolehkan pemerintah untuk terus menegakkan takrifan perkahwinan dan dasar yang bergantung padanya. Pindaan ini memberi perlindungan kepada Undang-Undang tersebut daripada cabaran baru yang bersandarkan bagian empat dalam perlembagaan negara seperti cabaran sering dibuat terhadap Seksyen 377A. Ini juga bermakna sokongan-sokongan lain yang mengambil rujukan daripada takrifan perkahwinan kita termasuk subsidi perumahan awam 
dan akses ketumaan, keutamaan bagi pasangan suami isteri serta insentif kewangan untuk pasangan suami isteri mendapatkan anak seperti hadiah tunai bonus bayi akan kekal. Dalam kesemua perbincangan tersebut, saya berpersahati dengan sikap pemimpin masyarakat kita yang dapat berbincang secara tenang dan rasional. Irsyad Mufti dan ulama mapan kita pula telah memberi kata putus pendirian agama mengenai homoseksualiti secara arif. Bahawa dalam Islam, hanya hubungan seksual antara lelaki dan wanita dalam perkahwinan dibenarkan. Pada masa yang sama, Mufti juga menjelaskan bahawa gaya hidup homoseksual tidak mengeluarkan seseorang itu dari agamanya. Mereka mesti tetap didekati dengan rahmah dan belas isan, apalagi oleh keluarga mereka sendiri. Sifat terbuka pemimpin masyarakat dan kebijaksanaan ahli agama kita telah menghindar situasi di mana emosi masyarakat dalam hal ini sengaja dapat dipanas-panaskan. Terima kasih kami pada mereka semua. Sir, I believe that many of us appreciate this secular approach that has provided Singaporeans security and safety, living together, and the freedom to practice our religion. Religious groups can continue to preach about homosexuality according to their religious beliefs. However, for all the diverse groups that may be for or against homosexuality, no one can violate the laws of the land or instigate violence or intimidation towards others or particular group. We are protected by the constitutional right to be free to profess, practice and propagate our religion. But this right is not absolute. It's subject to considerations of public order, public health or morality. As Singaporeans, we must also have respect for each other as fellow citizens in exercising this right. I want to make clear that our pro-family values and position are not a result of a majoritarian or religious approach. It is one that we share in common as Singaporeans and what this government believes in and stands for. It is how we have come so far and will enable our society to perpetuate and flourish in the future. It is in the public interest and not the narrow interest or of a specific religious group. Our community leaders, many of whom we have engaged on this issue, also support our pro-family approach and have helped families over the years. They will continue to have a critical role in maintaining social cohesion and rallying support for our family values. Such is a system that ensures the safety, survival and success of Singapore. No one group can have everything they want, all the time. The preferences of other Singaporeans matter too. As PM has said, we're seeking a political accommodation that balances different legitimate views and aspirations among Singaporeans. Sir, we are taking a calibrated approach through these constitutional amendments which seeks to address the concerns that people may have on whether a repeal will cause a sudden shift. However, it's also done in a way not to tie the hands of a future parliament. Above all, we want to ensure that parliament should be the main platform to discuss sensitive issues and not the courts. We must also redouble our effort to sustain the system that's brought about peace and harmony in our multi-religious and multi-ethnic society. As we advocate for what we believe in, let us also do it respectfully and in the knowledge that we are united by our Singapore identity. So I beg to Mr. Shamugam.
Minister Masagos has explained the reasons for the constitutional amendments, I will now speak on the repeal of Section 377A of the Penal Code. Uh, we thought very carefully before moving on the repeal of this section. Uh, over the past year, we have engaged extensively with various groups, some several times. Those we spoke with include religious leaders, uh, LGBT groups, community leaders, people who want heterosexual marriage as a social norm, youth groups, members of the public who had written to us, and many others. For many who uh, did not believe that Section 377A should be repealed, their main concerns were about the consequences of the repeal of Section 377A, what will happen after the section is repealed, and not because they thought that gay sex between men should in itself be criminalized. In considering whether we should repeal Section 377A, I will cover three areas. First, the historical context of Section 377A. Second, the political compromise that has been struck in Singapore. And third, the reasons for now moving on the repeal. First, the historical context. Why do we have to look at history? We need to understand why and how Section 377A became part of the law, whether it was a deliberate, considered decision, or perhaps more of happenstance. And that provides a context for the discussion. Uh, as members will know, Section 377A makes it an offense for a male person, whether in public or private, uh, to commit an act of gross indecency with another male. The term gross indecency can include both non-penetrative and penetrative sex acts. The section was introduced in 1938 when Singapore was a British colony. Attorney General Howell moved the bill in 1938. He said that Section 377A was being introduced to bring our law in line with the UK criminal law. Thus, to understand the genesis of Section 377A, we will need to look at the original UK law passed 137 years ago, which is Section 11 of the UK Criminal Law Amendment Act, or UKCL. <clears throat> Section 377A is almost a word-for-word -word copy of Section 11 of the UKCL. And Section 11 of the UKCL was passed in 1885 its origin is quite obscure, and we have not been able to find any background which explains why this section was introduced and made into law. What we did find was that it was introduced in the UK House of Commons at 2.30 a.m. in the morning, with very few MPs were present, as a last-minute amendment to an entirely unrelated bill. And the unrelated bill was meant to protect women and girls and for the suppression of brothels. At that point, that unrelated bill on protection of women and girls had been through a four-year-long process. It had endured a long debate in Parliament, and it had passed the House of Lords without amendment. The unrelated amendment on male homosexuality was introduced by a member of Parliament, Mr. Henry Labusher. His motives for introducing Section 11 into the bill on protection of women and girls uh, are unclear. One school of thought is that Mr. Labusher in, had intended it to be a wrecking amendment to derail and discredit the entire bill on protection of women and girls. He had that reputation. In fact, he had introduced another amendment to the same bill, and another member of parliament said that Mr. Labusher couldn't have been serious in introducing that other amendment. Academics who have studied the matter have pointed to Mr. Labusher's habitual parliamentary obstructionist technique. He would make spoiling amendments to discredit bills that had been introduced. Another school of thought is that Mr. Labusher was fiercely homophobic, and so he introduced the amendment. Mr. Labusher himself gave an explanation in Parliament for why he introduced Section 11. 
and his explanation raises more questions than it answers. He said that his amendment was to protect any person from an assault of the kind dealt with under Section 11, whether the person was above or under the age of 13 years. After that short explanation, he, did, he said he did not think it was necessary to discuss the proposal at any length because the government was willing to accept it. If we take at face value what Mr. Labusha said in Parliament in 1885, then the purpose of Section 11 was to prevent an indecent assault by one male against another male. The provision he introduced, which was passed into law, was, however, much wider than that, including those where the sex acts were done between consenting male adults. Thus, the amendment that was introduced was quite different from the explanation that was given. Indeed, the explanation he gave is somewhat contrary, and the amendment was dealt with in Parliament in less than four minutes. There was no discussion about the fact that the provision criminalizes consenting male homosexual behavior, even though the stated purpose was to criminalize sexual assaults. People have spent time trying to work out the motives of Mr. Labusha and the reasons the UK Parliament passed the amendment. Some have suggested that the MPs were fatigued by the late hour, it was 2.30 a.m., and that the MPs had been worn out by the long debate on the bill to protect women and girls, which, as I said earlier, had taken four years and that the MPs had just wanted to get on with it to let the amendment through. This is the genesis, the background to the law passed in 1885, which has gone on to impact the lives of tens of thousands of people and has caused much controversy and intense debate in many countries. Uh, Mr. Speaker, sir, with your permission, may I ask for the distribution of a folder which contains annexes one to seven that I'm going to refer to? Yes, please. Uh, members may also access the annexes through the SGPAL mobile app. In addition to Section 11 of the UKCL, the UK also had three other offences which were used sometimes to prosecute homosexual conduct. The first was sodomy. Sodomy was first criminalised under the Buggery Act of 1533 during the reign of King Henry VIII. The reason this law was passed is linked to a specific important historical event in British history, uh, and not because there was any specific intention to make sodomy a crime. I have in Annex 1 set out the background and context to how and why the Buggery Act was passed into law. Prior to 1533, sodomy was considered an offence punished by the Church. It was tried in the ecclesiastical courts. In other words, not a crime defined by the state, it was an offence in a religious context to be dealt with by the church. Members will know that Henry VIII broke with the church in Rome, started the Church of England with him as the head of the church. He wanted to reduce the power of the church, and one of the ways he did that was to reduce the power of the ecclesiastical courts. And he did that by converting many of the church's canon laws into secular laws. The Buggery Act was one such law that was brought over from the canon laws and made into secular criminal law. That way, the king's courts will deal with the matter and the church's jurisdiction was removed. What happened thereafter is also useful to note. His daughter, Mary, was an ardent Catholic, so when she became queen in 1553, she abolished the Buggery Act and moved it back to the ecclesiastical courts. Queen Elizabeth, Another of Henry's daughters succeeded Queen Mary five years later in 1558. There were questions on her legitimacy and her claims to the throne. She took several steps to establish her legitimacy, and one of the steps she took was to reduce the role of the church by moving the laws out of canon laws and making them secular laws to show that she was following in her father's footsteps. So the Buggery Act thus became secular criminal law again. So when you go through this history into the origins of the offense of sodomy, we see that it was introduced as part of a power struggle between Henry and the Catholic Church, and not because of any view that sodomy per se ought to be criminalized. I'm setting out this historical context factually, not suggesting that sodomy ought or ought not to have been criminalized. 
The second act that was used to prosecute homosexual conduct was the offense of solicitating or importuning in public places for immoral purposes. This was first introduced under the Vagrancy Act of 1898. It was initially intended to target pimps, men who lift off the earnings of female prostitutes. In practice, however, the legislation was used almost exclusively to prosecute men who engaged in homosexual conduct in public, though male homosexuality was not discussed in Parliament when the bill was first introduced. The third offence was the offence of indecent assault against males. This was first introduced under the Offences Against the Person Act 1861, and the offence criminalised homosexual acts committed against males without consent. It was introduced as part of a wider omnibus bill consolidating all offenses against a person and was included in the same provision as an offense of attempting to commit sodomy. Unfortunately, the provision and its overlap with existing homosexual offenses and even male homosexuality were not discussed at all during the parliamentary debates. So what we see is that these provisions, when they were first introduced, there was no uh, substantive deliberation on whether there was indeed a need to criminalize homosexual behavior. And it looks more like happenstance than a deliberate decision. Regardless, the criminal provisions were retained as part of UK's criminal law until the 1960s. The UK government appointed a committee known as the Wolfenden Committee in August 1954 to review the laws relating to homosexual offences. That committee published a report in 1957. The committee stated that it was not charged to enter into matters of private moral conduct, except in so far as they directly affected the public good. The committee was only concerned with whether homosexual behaviour should be dealt with under criminal law. The committee concluded that the function of criminal law was threefold. One, to preserve public order and decency. Two, to protect the citizen from what is offensive and injurious. And three, to provide sufficient safeguards against the exploitation and corruption of others. In their view, it was not the function of criminal law to intervene in the private lives of citizens or to seek to enforce any particular pattern of behavior further than it was necessary to carry out these three functions. The committee took the view that homosexual activities in private should not be criminalized. Committee stated, and I quote, unless a deliberate attempt be made by society through the agency of the law to equate the sphere of crime with that of sin, there must remain a realm of private morality and immorality, which is not the law's business. To say this is not to condone or encourage private immorality. Moral conviction or instinctive feeling, however strong, is not a valid basis for overriding the individual's privacy and for bringing within the ambit of the criminal law private sexual behavior of this kind. The committee accepted that homosexual behavior between males could have a damaging effect on family life. And let me pause there. I think many Singaporeans believe this as well, and we must acknowledge these feelings and beliefs. The committee, however, emphasized that this damage was no greater than many other activities which were sins and may be considered immoral but were not otherwise criminal offenses. The debate continued through the late 1950s and early 1960s. Law students may recall the well-known debate between Lord Devlin and Professor Hart on the Wolfenden Report. For members' reference, I have summarized the points they made in Annex 7. Eventually, Lord Devlin, who had argued for the criminalization of shared morality, also said that private consensual homosexual sex between adults should be decriminalized. In 1967, the UK Parliament voted to decriminalize private consensual homosexual sex between two adults. By that time, religious groups such as the Church of England and the Methodist Conference and members of both houses had publicly expressed support for a change. The members of the House of Lords who spoke in support of decriminalization included the Lord Chancellor, he was the Speaker of the House of Lords and the head of the judiciary, 
as well as the Lord Archbishop of Canterbury, who was the leader of the Church of England and the head of the Global Anglican Union, as well as various other bishops. I would like to briefly cite the speech made by the Lord Archbishop of Canterbury. He stated up front that he believed that homosexual acts were wrong. He went on to say that the case for amending the law rested on reason and justice and on considerations of the good of the community. He said to amend the law was not to condone the wrongness of the act. It, however, put such acts in the realm of private moral responsibility. He believed that the law as it stood gave a sense of injustice and bitterness, which helped morality no more than would a law which made fornication a crime. He further agreed with his predecessor that having such a law created fear, secretiveness, and despair in gay persons who did not dare to seek help in case they exposed themselves and their friends to criminal proceedings. I would add that not all religious groups were in favor of the change. Some, such as the Church of Scotland and the Church of Ireland and the Baptist Church, objected to the reform. In 2003, all of the United Kingdom's laws that specifically criminalized male homosexual be behavior, including the offense of gross indecency, were fully repealed. Before I move on from the UK, I would like to highlight the context of Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland was and is part of the UK. However, the partial decriminalization of homosexual conduct in the UK in 1967 only applied to the mainland and did not apply to Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland's path to decriminalization started instead from the courts. After 14 years, in 1981, the European Court of Human Rights found that criminalizing private homosexual conduct between men was an unjustified interference with a person's right to respect for his private life and was a breach of the European Convention on Human Rights. UK was bound by that decision and UK Parliament decriminalized private consensual homosexual conduct between adults in Northern Ireland in 1982. However, at that time, Northern Ireland society was deeply religious, largely conservative, and the majority of the population of Northern Ireland opposed the decriminalization, including most of the Protestant churches, as well as the Roman Catholic Church. The bill was opposed by all of the 12 Northern Ireland MPs in the UK Parliament. But nonetheless, it passed through both houses by majority vote. Northern Ireland's experience shows how a court decision can force a change, even though a society is not ready for such change. And I'll come back to this later. Today, homosexuality remains a deeply divisive issue around the world. This is true even within more religiously homogeneous communities, such as the Church of England and the Global Anglican Church. If you look at the Anglican Communion, it comprises 42 member churches. It's the third largest Christian communion after the Catholic and Eastern Orthodox churches. For decades, there has been a strong difference of views within the Anglican Communion on whether same-sex unions can be legitimized and blessed and whether persons living in same-sex relationships can be ordained. Some Anglican churches in the global north, such as the United States and Canada, are increasing, increasingly supportive of homosexuality. They allow same-sex marriages and ordain persons in same-sex relationships. However, several Anglican churches from the global south do not agree with this approach, and this has resulted in the creation of the Global Anglican Future Conference, or GAFCON, uh, in 2008, led by the more conservative Anglican bishops and leaders. In the Church of England, LGBT issues have also been the subject of intense debate for decades. I mentioned earlier that the Church of England had supported the partial decriminalization of homosexual conduct in the UK in 1967. But actually, within the Church of England, there was no consensus. Church was more or less equally split on the issue when it was put to a vote of its 735 members, 155 voted in favor, 138 voted against, and the rest either absented themselves or abstained. 
So there continues to be strong differences in viewpoints on this issue, as uh, members may have seen from recent media reports. So what does all of this show? First, that even within a single religious community, it is difficult to agree on the right answer, assuming there is one, on the issue of homosexuality. Second, that homosexuality is a topic that continues to raise strong viewpoints. Third, that if we do not handle this carefully, homosexuality can be a deeply divisive issue, even among those who share a common belief. <clears throat> <clears throat> Some of the international media outlets that report on these issues often gloss over these differences. They gloss over the problems that societies face, don't understand the need to deal with these issues sensitively with understanding. They present views as if they are settled and that anyone who has a negative view of male homosexuality is a bigot and is wrong. If you look at the US, it's considered more accepting of LGBT rights than many other countries. But the country is internally split over this issue. For example, in the Republic, Republican states of Florida and Texas, there remain strong objections to LGBT rights. The Republican Party of Texas recently adopted anti-LGBT positions into their party platform. They state, and I quote, homosexuality is an abnormal lifestyle choice. We believe there should be no granting of special legal entitlements or creation of special status for homosexual behavior, regardless of state of origin, and we oppose any criminal or civil penalties against those who oppose homosexuality out of faith, conviction, or belief in traditional values. No one should be granted special legal status based on their LGBTQ plus identification. But other Republicans have different views on homosexuality. A survey of more than 22,000 people by the Public Religion Research Institute in March of this year found that 48% supported same-sex marriage and 50% opposed it. These were persons who identified themselves as Republicans. If we look at, say, Italy, and I will not go through it in detail, I've set out what has been happening in Italy in Annex 2, you will see the divisions. I have laid out examples of how within the same religion, the same denomination, the same churches within the denomination, and in wider society, within some Western countries, even those who are often described as liberal, the issues remain deeply divisive. To be clear, it is not the exact same issue in all these communities. In some, the division is about homosexuality in itself. In some, it is about the roles of LGBT people, for example, in church ordination. And in others, it is other related issues, like same-sex unions, that are divisive. Let me now say something about global trends. Around the world in several countries, as well as in uh, jurisdictions and territories, which are not quite countries, several have decriminalized their version of Section 377A, uh, including Commonwealth countries and Southeast Asian countries. Some have decriminalized it through the parliamentary process. Some have had their Section 377A equivalent struck down by the courts. But there are also some countries which continue to keep the criminal laws. Mr. Speaker, with your permission, uh, I would like to display some slides on the screen. Uh, slides one and two of Annex three show the countries, that are their countries and territories and jurisdictions that have decriminalized homosexuality and those which have not done so, because not all the places in these two slides are countries. And slide three shows the same for Asian uh, states and places and jurisdictions. We can see that across the world there are different approaches, even though there is a trend towards decriminalization. In Singapore, we look carefully at international trends, but we don't simply follow such trends. We chart our own path based on what we believe is in our own best interests. And we have made it clear to foreign governments and companies that these are political, social, and moral choices for Singaporeans to decide and that they should not interfere. For example, last year in 2021, the US Embassy co-hosted a webinar on LGBT rights with a Singaporean LGBT organization. 
MFA spoke to the embassy to remind them not to interfere in our domestic politics. More recently, in August this year, U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi issued a statement when she was in Singapore asking business groups to support the LGBT community in Singapore. MHA issued a statement reminding foreign businesses to be careful about advocating on socially divisive issues in Singapore. We would also say to U.S. politicians who feel very strongly about these issues that perhaps they should first try and persuade the people in Texas and other such places uh, before they issue statements in Singapore. In Singapore, Section 377A was substantively debated in Parliament 15 years ago in 2007 during the second reading of the Penal Code Amendment Bill. Over the course of two days, 16 MPs and NMPs came out to speak on Section 377A to argue for and against its retention. It was a long debate. I have summarized the different positions taken by the MPs and NMPs in Annex 4. Prime Minister spoke and stated the government's position. He said that Singaporeans as a whole remained largely conservative. Majority wanted to keep Singapore a conservative society with heterosexual, stable families. But at the same time, there was a growing science-based evidence that sexual orientation was substantially inborn. Gay people must have a place in society, and they are entitled to their private lives. But there were still very different views amongst Singaporeans on whether homosexuality was acceptable or morally right. Thus, LGBT advocacy should not set the tone for the rest of Singapore society. We will try and maintain a balance said the Prime Minister, to uphold a stable society with traditional heterosexual family values, but with space for homosexuals to live their lives and contribute to society. He added that we would continue to retain Section 377A, but not proactively enforce it. It was a very Singaporean way of dealing with the situation, which best fitted with the way our society was. PM also reminded MPs that Section 377A was inherited from the British and that Asian societies which were similar to ours did not have such laws, not in Japan, not in China, not in Taiwan. But if we forced the issue, it would divide and polarize our society. It would lead to even less space for the gay community in Singapore. Therefore, it was better to let the situation evolve gradually. It was a compromise, it was better, and it has worked for Singapore in the past 15 years. We managed to maintain some harmony, while many other societies have become deeply divided on these issues over the same period. Now, let me now move on to explain why we propose to repeal Section 377A at this point. There are two main reasons. First. It is the right thing to do, and society is more ready now for the repeal. Second, there is a significant legal risk that the courts will strike down Section 377A if we left it alone and did nothing. Let me deal with the first reason. In some religions, homosexuality is considered a sin. As members heard earlier, some sins are crimes, but not every sin is a crime. Our position in Singapore is for a conduct to be a crime, there should generally be a public order or public interest issue. It's broadly similar to the position set out by the Wolfenden Committee, which I referred to earlier. Basic function of criminal law is to preserve public order and decency, to protect citizens from what is offensive and injurious, and to provide sufficient safeguards against exploitation and corruption by corruption of others. In Singapore, like in many other places, it is generally not the function of criminal law to intervene in the private lives of citizens. As we consider this question, it is also important to understand what will remain criminalized even if Section 377A is repealed. First, non-consensual sexual assault by males against other males will obviously be an offense, and it's a serious offense. Two, Sexual acts committed by males against young persons, again, a serious offense regardless of consent. 
Three, sexual acts between two males committed in public that offense public decency will remain an offense. The maximum penalty for the first two offenses is in fact more severe than the maximum penalty under section 377A, and rightly so, this government takes an extremely stern view against all non-consensual sexual offenses in and in respect of sexual offenses against minors. The only thing that will no longer be an offense after the repeal is consensual male adult homosexual conduct conducted in private. Such conduct does not raise law and order concerns. The time has come for us to remove Section 377A. It humiliates and hurts gay people. Most gay people do not cause harm to others. They just want to live peacefully and quietly and be accepted as part of society. The same as any other Singaporean. They are our family, our friends, our colleagues. They deserve dignity, respect, acceptance. They do not deserve to be stigmatized because of their sexual orientation. To a gay person, even if Section 377A is not enforced, it is there, memorialized in law, a sword hanging over his head, a daily reminder that every time he engages in private sexual activity behind closed doors in the sanctity of his bedrooms, he is nevertheless a criminal. We have to ask, is it fair that gays have to live in this way? This is not something we should accept, even if we personally disagree with homosexuality. So I will say, let us start to deal with these divides, heal these divides, remove their pain. Section 377A should no longer be in our books. Repealing Section 377A makes it clear that gay people are not criminals. Compared to 2007, we are now at a stage where our society can accept the repeal of Section 377A. From our engagements, we see that most Singaporeans accept that sex between men should not be a crime. Even those who want to retain Section 377A do not want to see it actively enforced. But as has been stated in and out of Parliament, we must and we will take steps at the same time to deal with the possible consequences of the repeal. The constitutional amendment is one big step. There are others. Because some consequences would be unacceptable to a significant section of our society. The government has explained its position about dealing with consequences. Members can refer to Annex 5 for a summary of what the Prime Minister, uh, Deputy Prime Minister Lawrence Wong, various ministries, as well as I have said on the matter. Now let me move on to the second reason for the repeal, and that is that leaving Section 377A alone in the books carries a significant legal risk. The courts may strike down Section 377A in the future, and with the courts strike down Section 377A, it will be a binary process. They cannot deal, the courts cannot deal with all the legitimate concerns about the consequential effects of the repeal, which many are concerned about. Why do we say there is a significant legal risk of Section 377A being struck down? <coughs> Let me take members through two Court of Appeal decisions. The CA has dealt with Section 377A twice in the last 10 years. First in Lim Meng Suang versus Attorney General decided in 2014, and second in Tan Se Ki versus Attorney General decided earlier this year, 2022. Both decisions took quite different approaches on two issues. The first, a procedural issue, and second, a substantive issue. In Lim Meng Suang, the court made a procedural decision in 2012 and the substantive decision in 2014. The procedural decision was on standing, where the, whether the applicants had locus standi or standing, whether they were entitled to make the application. The Court of Appeals said that the applicants did have locus standi. 
because there was a real and credible threat of future prosecution. The CA further added that even if no prosecution was contemplated, the applicants could bring the action they had standing because of the very existence of a law which is unconstitutional. Members should note the CA in 2012 said the very existence of 377A gave locus standi for an applicant to make an application. On the substantive issue, the Court of Appeals said that Section 377A did not contravene either Article 9 or Article 12 of the Constitution. On Article 12, the Court of Appeal applied a legal test known as a reasonable classification test to come to that conclusion. It said that Section 377A satisfied that test and did not violate Article 12. The CA therefore dismissed the application in Lim Ming Swang on the substantive basis that Section 377A was not unconstitutional, even though the applicants had locus standi to bring the challenge. Section 377A was then challenged again in the courts in Tan Seng Key. It was again argued that 377A contravened Articles 9 and 12. In addition, 377A was also challenged on the ground that it contravened Article 14 of the Constitution, which guaranteed the right of freedom of speech and expression. Court of Appeal dismissed the challenge. How and why the CA came to that decision and what it said is important. This time in Tan Seng Key, the appeal was dismissed on procedural grounds on the basis that the applicants lacked locus standi to challenge Section 377A and the court deliberately did not rule on one of the substantive grounds. First on the procedural issue, the CA reversed itself on the locus standi point and took a different view from its earlier decision in Lim Meng Suan. The CA said that there was no locus standi because the AG had said that absent other factors, there would generally be no prosecution under Section 377A where the conduct was between two consenting adults in a private place. On this basis, the CA said that Section 377A was unenforceable until the AG gave clear notice that he intended to enforce 377A. Thus, according to the CA, the applicants did not face any real or credible threat or prosecution under 377A, and so they did not have standing to bring the case. In Lim Meng Song, the court of appeal had said that the very existence of 377A was enough to give locus standi. In Tan Seng Key, the court took a diametrically opposite view. Members will note one court of appeal can disagree with another court of appeal. I'll come back to this. It is also significant to see what the court of appeal had to say in Tan Seng Key on the substantive issue as to whether Section 377A was unconstitutional. The CA actually did not need to give any view on the substantive merits of the challenge because it had already said that the applicants could not bring the case, but it nevertheless went on to give its views. And, sir, with your permission, if we can show in a slide some basic points they made. The CA first considered the arguments in relation to Article 9 of the Constitution on life and personal liberty, and said quite clearly that 377A did not violate Article 9. The court then considered whether 377A contravened Article 14 on freedom of speech and expression, and it said, no, nope, there was no contravention. Then it considered Article 12, the Equal Protection Clause. On this, the CA took a different view from its previous decision in Lim Meng Song, and the CA said that there were two ways to apply the reasonable classification test. One is the approach adopted in Lim Meng Song in 2014, and the second was the approach adopted in a 2021 case in Said Sohel. The Court of Appeal went into a detailed comparison between the two approaches. Court said that if the Said Sohel approach is taken, then Section 377A might fall a full, a full of the reasonable classification test. If you see what the Court of Appeal has said in red, 
one can then conclude that it said the differentia embodied in 377A, namely male-male sex acts, lacks a rational relation to legislative, legislative object of reflecting societal disapproval of homosexual conduct in general or safeguarding public morality generally. In plain language, what this means is Section 377A is probably unconstitutional if the site Suhail test is to be applied. Even though the Court of Appeal was careful to say Section 377A might be unconstitutional if the test in Site Suhail was applied. Lawyers will know, at least some lawyers will know, that the Court of Appeal has, in fact, in subsequent cases, applied the Site Suhail test. After the decision in Tan Seng Ki, the Court of Appeal has applied the Site Suhail test and approach in two other cases in May and August of this year. In May 22, in Dachanamurti, and in August, in Tarishu's case. What does all of this mean in plain language? It means that if another constitutional challenge against Section 377A is brought before the court, the site Suhail test is likely to be applied. And if that test is applied, Section 377A is likely to be struck down on the grounds that it breaches Article 12 of the Constitution. Some members could say, well, we accept what the CA has said, but the CA in Tan Seng Ki this year also said there is no local standard to bring the challenge. So as long as the Attorney General maintains a current position and does not reassert the right to prosecute cases under 377A, then there should be no risk that 377A would be found unconstitutional because no one would have standing to challenge it in the first place. Taking such a view, if I can give an analogy, is like letting a small boat sail in choppy waters surrounded by rocks and hoping that the boat won't crash into the rocks. There are two major risks in taking this view. First, just because the applicants in Tan Seng Ki did not have standing does not mean that no one else will have standing in a future case. For example, persons who had been convicted in the past under 377A, they may well have a case in, for standing. And I don't want my speech to be read as giving a right to people. It's my view. Uh, but such persons may well have a case for standing by arguing that their rights have been violated and therefore that they have sufficient interest to challenge the constitutionality of 377A. They will not be able to directly reopen their convictions, but they can ask for 377A to be struck down on the basis that this will give them vindication. And the very fact that they had been convicted under a unconstitutional legislation gives them the standing and to allow them to redress the hurt of their conviction. And if you look at Tan Seng Ki, the CA was very careful to circumscribe what it said about who had locus standi. It expressly stated that its decision on locus standi will not, for example, prevent police from investigating conduct under 377A, uh, if you look at the parts in red. In reality, there is a broad universe of cases where the police may have to investigate because before investigating, they might not know exactly what the facts are. So you can't rule out the possibility that in some situations, a person involved in the investigations brings a challenge. And you cannot rule out that a future court could find this to be sufficient grounds for a person to have locus standi to challenge 377A. And of course, there is the other risk. The CA can always change its mind on locus standi, just as it did uh, between uh, Lim Meng Song and Tan Seng Ki. It changed its mind precisely on this point of locus standi. So we cannot proceed in the belief that the CA will, um, will certainly not change its views in the future. In September this year, I took part in a law forum organized by the Singapore Academy of Law and the Law Society, which discussed the implications of Tan Seng Ki and the legal risks surrounding 377A. There was a panel discussion moderated by the dean of the SMU Law School. Panel and audience included the dean of SUSS Law School, legal scholars from our law faculties, presidents of the Law Society past and present, and senior counsel, and distinguished and senior legal experts. 
panel and the audience were pretty unanimous on the legal risks surrounding Section 377A in light of Tan Seng Key. Members can refer to Annex 6 for key points and views that were shared at the law forum. As the, the Attorney General and I looked carefully at the Tan Seng Key judgment. And as the Prime Minister said during National Day rally, the AG and I have advised the government that in a future court challenge, there is a significant risk of Section 377A being struck down. So let us be clear. One, after the Tan Seng Key judgment, Section 377A is at significant risk of being struck down in a future challenge. And two, we cannot simply hope that the point on locus standi is enough for the government and parliament to do nothing. That will be just wishful thinking, and wishful thinking is no substitute for careful legal analysis or proper policy. If we engage in wishful thinking, and if Section 377A is struck down in the courts, that could lead to a whole series of consequences which would be very damaging to our Singaporean society. I'll come back to this. But before I do that, it is useful to look at what happened in India as an illustration. In India, their Section 377 was challenged on grounds broadly similar to those used to challenge our 377A in Singapore. In 2009, the Delhi High Court ruled that their Section 377 was unconstitutional. The court then said that its decision would apply only until Parliament repealed Section 377, as per the recommendations made by a law commission in the year 2000, nine years before the decision of the court. After the judgment, however, the Indian parliament did not do anything about the law. The government also did not appeal the high court judgment. Instead, an appeal was brought by some organizations and individuals. On appeal in 2013, the Indian Supreme Court overturned the High Court decision, saying there was no constitutional infirmity. So Section 377 was held to be constitutional. Nonetheless, the Court emphasized that Parliament was still free to consider the desirability and propriety of deleting Section 377 from the Indian Penal Code or amending it to exclude private acts between consenting adults. Parliament, however, did nothing after this decision. In 2016, a fresh application was filed in the Indian Supreme Court to again challenge the constitutionality of Section 377. In 2018, the Indian Supreme Court ruled Section 377 to be unconstitutional with regards to consensual acts between adults. It reversed its 2013 decision on the grounds that Section 377 violated the right to life and liberty, which is Article 9 of our Constitution, that it violated the right to equal protection, which is Article 12 of our Constitution, and that it violated the right to freedom of expression, which is Article 14 of our Constitution. And the court found that Section 377 did punish homosexuals arbitrarily. The court said that a subjective notion of public or societal morality which discriminated against LGBT persons and subjected them to criminal sanctions simply on the basis of an innate characteristic ran counter to the Indian Constitution and could not form the basis of legitimate state interest. Court held that Parliament's failure to delete Section 377 was not in any way a good reason for the court not to strike down Section 377. When a provision violated the Constitution, the courts must strike it down. Fast forward to this year, 2022, as Minister Masagos has mentioned in his speech, the Indian Supreme Court has expanded the definition of family to include same-sex relationships. The court held that such atypical manifestations of the family unit are equally deserving of protection. What is the lesson here? When Parliament does not act, when it should act, 
then we may leave the courts with no choice. If fundamental constitutional rights have been violated, and yet Parliament abdicates its duties, then the courts may have no choice but to act. And what will happen, what can happen, if the courts strike down Section 377A? Then our laws defining marriage as being between a man and a woman, and our laws and policies based on that definition could also be at risk sometime in the future. For example, the heterosexual definition of marriage could be challenged on the basis that it is against Article 12 of the Constitution. It could be argued that equal protection means we cannot discriminate against same-sex couples in the same way that Section 377A can be said to discriminate against gay persons. It could be asked, why should a marriage only be between a man and a woman? Why can't a marriage between two men or between two women be considered a marriage? Uh, some places, jurisdictions like Taiwan and some countries like the United States have ended up legalizing same-sex marriage through court challenges. As mentioned earlier, India's Supreme Court also recently said that family will include same-sex relationships. In Singapore so far, the courts have recognized that Parliament as the elected branch of government is better suited to resolve such difficult societal issues. In Parliament, there can be consultation, discussion, debate. Considerations going well beyond the law can be taken into account, whereas courts can only consider the legal issues. Consensus can be forged in Parliament to bridge divergent viewpoints. Open-ended resolutions are possible instead of binary win-lose outcomes. There are some who have said, since our courts have recognized what belongs to the political process and what belongs to the judicial process, it is unlikely that the courts will ever strike down Section 377A. In other words, we can just take the easy way. We don't need to decide. We just let things be. But such an approach would be irresponsible and wrong. Members may know the Court of Appeal has also said that although the 2007 compromise was inherently political, legal standards do still exist and may be applied to judge the legality or constitutionality of Section 377A. So we should not assume that the courts will never strike down 377A just because the government chooses to retain it. Our system has only worked well in all these years because all three branches of the government, Parliament, all three branches of the state, Parliament, the executive, and the judiciary work within their respective boundaries and have fulfilled their respective roles. But if Parliament does not do its duty, if Parliament does not deal with a law which is likely unconstitutional, then you may leave the courts with no choice. If Parliament does not do what it has to do, then the courts will have to do what they don't want to do. So I emphasize, Parliament has a duty to deal squarely with laws which are unconstitutional. If Parliament abdicates its duty and does not do what it has to do, then the courts may have to do what they don't want to do. It would be much easier for us as MPs to leave this to the courts. Leave the question to the wisdom of the Honorable Court, as the Indian government did. If we left it to the courts, the government would bear no blame. It is a path of least resistance. If we approached this purely as politicians, concerned only with votes and not making anyone unhappy or making as few people unhappy as possible, then that route of leaving it to the courts would have been easier. Pretend that these issues do not exist, need not have been talked about after the Court of Appeal decision in Tansenki, leave it to the courts. But this government will not take that approach. As elected representatives of the people, we cannot do that. If we see a risk that a law may be found unconstitutional, it is our duty to act and deal with it in Parliament, both because it is our duty to do so 
and because taking the easy way out would have serious negative consequences for our society. It will be very bad for Singapore. As I said earlier, the court processes are adversarial by nature. Their decisions are binary, zero sum. You either win or you lose. There is no middle ground, no balancing of competing interests. The courts cannot consider competing social norms and social consequences of their decisions. If they strike down Section 377A, they will do so without being able to consider the consequential effects of their decision on the definition of marriage, for example. Whereas in Parliament, we are now proposing amendments to the Constitution to further protect heterosexual marriage. Going further, if the definition of marriage is changed through a court challenge, there can be a cascading effect. It could impact questions relating, relating to same-sex marriage, media content, housing policies, various other policies. Houses, housing policies can be challenged. It could be asked, why should we only give housing benefits to heterosexual married couples? It could be argued that that is unequal under Article 12. Media content rules could be challenged. Why should we impose higher ratings for content on movies and Netflix that depict same-sex family units? It could be argued that this curtails some producers' freedom of expression under Article 9. If we, such changes through the courts are not in our interest. If we want to act in the best interests of Singapore, then we have to move on this, given the legal analysis. We can look at the United States to see how court decisions on such issues can seriously affect the fabric of society, divide the society, unleash partisan views on both sides of the divide. If we have that in Singapore, our social fabric will fray. If the government and parliament do not take responsibility and instead stand by and do nothing, then litigation could change our societal norms very quickly. Now, I want to emphasize this. I have given two reasons for proposing the repeal of Section 377A. One, we should do so because there are no public order issues that are raised from such conduct, so it should not remain criminal. But I accept that MPs and others may disagree with that, that even though there are no public order issues, they may feel that there are other reasons for keeping the law. And I accept that people can and do legitimately have such views, and it's reasonable to hold such views. But the second reason I've given, the legal consequences, that's not a matter of conscience. It's a policy question. It requires each of us to think carefully and apply our minds. The second question is a matter of considering the consequences for Singapore, given that there's a clear legal risk that Section 377A could be struck down, and given that, having heard me, you know what the consequential legal risks are. In fact, this has been talked about in public what the consequential legal risks are to the heterosexual family, housing, education, other policies, that they could all be at risk. Knowing all these risks and refusing to take a position or be clear in how we will deal with it is avoiding our responsibilities as MPs, basically passing it on onto the courts. It is easier politically, but it is also worse for Singapore and Singaporeans. And to put it bluntly, that will be an abdication of duty. And it would be cynical if we, as MPs, did that. Because we would be putting, if we take this as a deliberate decision, political capital over doing what is good for Singaporeans. So, Mr. Speaker, I believe that in this House, if we proceed in good faith, there are matters of conscience, but ultimately there is also the question of what is in Singapore's interest and what is in the interest of Singaporeans. And the law here and the legal consequences here go beyond matters of conscience. 
this is like a train approaching. Question is, are we prepared to take the appropriate steps to save and safeguard what is important for our society? Whether we have the courage of our conviction, which should be to do what is good for Singapore. So Mr. Speaker, I say to all members, let us do what is right, do our duty, what is expected of us in Parliament, and take a path forward on this difficult issue. Thank you. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. Mr. Pritam Singh. Mr. Speaker, beyond the bread and butter matters of economics and material well-being, Singaporeans must occasionally confront issues that concern our collective values, how we see each other as a citizen community, and what kind of place we want Singapore to be. Section 377A of the Penal Code, which I will henceforth refer to as 377A, that criminalizes homosexual conduct in private is such an issue. For some Singaporeans, it is a very difficult subject. For others, especially younger Singaporeans, they wonder why it has to be a difficult subject and why people of a different sexual orientation can't be treated as equal Singaporeans. In recent years, the issue has caused growing tensions between groups who identify themselves for and against the repeal of Section 377A. Singaporeans have formed organizations and groups on the issue. At a personal level, the conversations can be uncomfortable. And discussing the subject without measure and consideration can quickly pull people apart. Speaking in their individual capacities, the Workers' Party MPs have different views on a repeal of 377A. In normal circumstances, I would not lift the whip for parliamentary debates, given the party political structure that overlays elected MPs in this House. However, 377A is unique in that it is conceived through a religious lens by many in Singapore, in addition to being a matter of conscience for a no less significant number. The People's Action Party has announced that it is not lifting the whip for this debate. Given the varied public opinion on the impending repeal of 377A, there is a risk that the democratic value of Parliament could be diluted if the views of Singaporeans on this subject are not adequately ventilated in the House. Not lifting the whip would deny Workers' Party MPs not in favour of a repeal of 377A the opportunity to vote freely, and in doing so, to also represent Singaporeans who see this issue as a matter of deep religious belief and conscience. So I have decided to lift the whip for the Workers' Party MPs. In doing so, I have also asked all who will speak to carefully reflect on the position they take and to envision a set of principles or perspectives from which society as a whole with its different views, can move forward. That is the challenge. We know society is divided on 377A. How can we mitigate this and contribute to lowering temperatures and ensuring Singapore is a home for everyone? For the record, Mr. Speaker, both members of Parliament, Faisal Manab and Louis Tra, are not present for this debate as they are COVID-19 positive. Mr. Faisal disagrees with the repeal of 377A as a matter of religion and conscience, while Mr. Chua agrees to the repeal. The other Workers' Party MPs will state their positions on the matter in the course of their speeches. Mr. Speaker, since 2007, the government has settled on what has 
what was called an uneasy compromise, that 377A would be kept on the books but not enforced. In 2019, in my first term as Secretary General of the Workers' Party, I stated the Workers' Party's position on 377A in a speech to the NUS or National University of Singapore Political Association. The party position I advanced was similar to that of Singapore as a whole. It was varied and diverse, with no consensus as to whether 377A should be repealed. The depth of the impasse in Singapore society at that time was stark and encapsulated somewhat in a panel discussion between Senior, Ma Senior Minister Tarman Shanmugaratnam and Professor Tommy Koh on the Institute of Policy Studies 30th anniversary in late 2018. Professor Koh said, and I quote, a mutual friend of ours was recently invited by one of our religious organizations to speak at a conference on a secular topic. He accepted, prepared the paper, and then he was disinvited. And why was he disinvited? Because he signed a petition to repeal 377A, unquote. Such has been the, divisi the divisiveness over 377A. In my 2019 speech, I said that the LGBT community should LGBTQ plus community should not be exploited for political points. At that time, I believed there was more to consider than deciding which was the right side in this matter, particularly in a society which generally eschews from hosting open and frank conversations on difficult matters in the public realm. Against this political culture and backdrop, the Workers' Party neither took up the cause of LGBTQ plus rights nor stood against it. I still believe that had the Workers' Party openly supported a repeal of 377A, it would not have been good for Singapore politics. More crucially, it would have not served the interests of the LGBTQ plus community. On issues of great social division and contending values, we do not need politicians to be seen as siding with particular groups. From my vantage point as the Leader of the Opposition, my personal belief is that the repeal of 377A does not in any way signal the State's hostility towards the family unit or religious freedom. Rest assured, the family remains, and I dare say will always be at the core of our social norms. I would also like to reiterate that defending the Singaporean family also means doing more to protect its different forms, including families with single, widowed and divorced mothers and fathers. We must do more to help caregivers who perform the labour of caring for aged parents and those with special needs. What the repeal of 377A certainly does not signal is Singapore becoming a more liberal or permissive society. What it does is make room in our shared public space for members of our common Singaporean family to not be discriminated against due to their sexual orientation. Religious Singaporeans are free to maintain their beliefs about homosexuality, but this should not interfere with what is legal in our public sphere. Likewise, supporters of repeal have no business interfering with the private beliefs of religious Singaporeans. In any secular society, sin and crime are separate categories. They may sometimes align for example, we have laws prohibiting crimes such as murder that are also considered wrong in many belief systems. But we also do not outlaw many activities considered sinful in some religious communities. Consuming alcohol and pork are legal but not permissible to Muslims. There are also no laws against eating meat, though this is not an option for Jains and some Hindus and Buddhists. One may argue that 377A is much more complex that not regulating sexual practices has greater social consequences. But let us remember that when Section, when 377, Section 377A of the Penal Code was amended in 2007, it decriminalized other sex acts that some still find unorthodox. 
In singling out homosexuality between men in particular, the decision to keep 377A appears to the LGBTQ plus community and not, and not a small number of Singaporeans to be unjust and unequal. An important reality is that the political compromise in place since 2007 undermined the sense of belonging of Singapore's LGBTQ plus community. Though unenforced, one should not underestimate its symbolic message that they are outsiders. Additionally, this so-called compromise is not binding on future governments who could choose to enforce the law. Yet, repealing 377A will no doubt cause anxiety, if not outrage amongst Singaporeans who believe that our laws must also reflect cultural or religious attitudes towards homosexuality. There are Singaporeans who see this as an erosion of the family as a basic unit of Singapore society. The reality of our political culture, which leans towards conservatism on social issues, is that such concerns cannot be summarily ignored or dismissed. In the main, the Court of Appeal judgment in Tan Seng Kee versus AG appears to have precipitated the government's decision to repeal 377A. But the stark reality before this House and Singaporeans today is that there were never any good options before the government that could please everybody with regard to managing the tensions of 377A. Keeping to the status quo indefinitely would only shine an ever brighter spotlight on the issue, particularly as social mores globally, regionally and locally continue a steady shift towards greater acceptance and accommodation of LGBTQ plus individuals. Like many Singaporeans, I could understand why the uneasy compromise set out by the Prime Minister in 2007 was deemed to be a midpoint that would keep any excessive social cleavage in check. Likewise, I see the decision to protect marriage from constitutional challenge as an institution between men and women only through a very narrow lens. It represents a balancing exercise to ensure that society it also represents a balancing exercise to ensure that society doesn't fray over the decision to repeal 377A. I hope Singaporeans who are against the repeal of 377A approach this issue in spite of their personal beliefs and religious convictions, which I and my colleagues respect, and I suggest everyone in this House respects, through this lens of compromise and accommodation. In repealing 377A, religious Singaporeans are not asked to endorse homosexuality, but instead honour the equality of all Singaporeans in the eyes of the law, that no consenting adults should be regarded as criminals because of what they do in private. Equality and justice, both stars in our flag, are plenty and bountiful. Unlike finite resources, we do not have less of either by extending it to our fellow citizens. We all gain from a more just and equal society. We can also look to some of the timeless principles shared amongst all great faiths. The blessed irony here is that religion plays a huge part in inspiring our best qualities as human beings, to be generous, to love our neighbour, to be merciful. These qualities do not weaken, but strengthen our faith. Wherever you stand on this decision, I hope Singaporeans approach our LGBTQ plus community, who are a small minority of the population, like they are anywhere in the world, with these qualities in mind. More than ever, with the impending repeal of 377A, Singaporeans on all sides must come together in good faith and mutual trust to not let this issue further tear our social fabric. I am certain the decision of this House is not a panacea that repairs the tension between camps. <clears throat> we should anticipate that new battle lines will be drawn. For the LGBTQ plus community, the march towards greater equality has not ended. 
some conservatives are likely to mobilize to try and stop any further expansion of LGBTQ plus rights. In view of the socially divisive nature of 377A, I would suggest three points that could help in keeping things from boiling over. I hope Singaporeans can consider these as guideposts, should they deem them useful. First, any conversation must recognize that there is a distinction between public and private perspectives. Just because one group has a position on an issue does not mean it can impose that position as a public expectation on everyone else. Why? Because in Singapore, there must be a place for everyone. The public space is for all to share, and where we encourage a live and let live, give and take attitude towards our fellow Singaporeans. The public space is where we create conditions for all Singaporeans to succeed, and certainly not to feel marginalized. The public space is where we are tolerant of Singaporeans who are different insofar as the law allows. Second, the fact that we are a secular society does not stop religious Singaporeans from holding views that are reflective of their religious norms and values. It is fully understandable that the faithful wish to propagate their religious convictions. There is no basis for us to feel cancelled provided our views are not set as an expectation for all society. There must be a secular approach to politics and governance, even as we celebrate and protect the freedom of religion in Singapore. The Workers' Party cannot conceive of any other way for different groups and religious communities to live harmoniously with each other in Singapore. Finally, and perhaps most pertinently, as we are free to share our views and propagate our beliefs, let us be thoughtful and put ourselves in the other person's shoes as we welcome conversation and even vigorous debate. But as with most difficult conversations in search of a landing point, it will be crucial to adopt a gentler tone, an enlightened perspective that extends and considers the impact on broader community and society, and most fundamentally, a spirit of empathy. Mr. Speaker, I support both the Penal Code and Constitution Amendment Bills. Thank you. Mr. Morali, <coughs> Mr. Morali Pile. Mr. Speaker, sir. One might be tempted to say that this issue is one of the most polarizing and contentious socio-political issues that this House ever dealt with. The heavy correspondence that I received and numerous meetings that I had with my constituents on this matter reflects that. And I'm sure I'm not alone in this. Let's be clear, though. Should this bill be passed, it does not mean that the underlying issues will simply go away. It will not. At the same time, the fact that we are considering these bills does signify a potential for this House to express its collective will. And I heard the Honourable Leader of Opposition say collective values as well. Across party lines and decides on, on the basis of what is in the greater good of our country. This is what representative politics means. MPs deciding on matters based on national interests and public good, not their personal interests. The well-known politician and philosopher, Sir Edmund Burke, said that Parliament is not a Congress of Ambassadors, where members of Parliament have to decide based on national interests, and not just based on the opinions of their constituents. And this is where our involvement here becomes all the more important, because we cannot decide just on the basis of our personal views. We have to decide on the basis of what's in the national interest, how best can we take Singapore forward and ensure that the future of Singaporeans will always remain bright. That's the issue. So what is my view with respect to this issue? I understand from the Leader of Opposition that uh, he's decided to lift the, uh, the whip. 
I just want to clarify that while the whip is not lifted for the People's Action Party, it does not prevent any MP from my party to speak his views. And I will shortly speak my views too. It, the whip is basically a system to deal with voting. And that's separate and distinct from clearly and honestly expressing our views. On my view, I can be relatively brief. This is because I had already articulated my views on this matter in 2018 when I was interviewed by CNA. Then I stated my support for the repeal of Section 377A. I said that anyone, regardless of his sexual orientation, is deserving of equal treatment, dignity and respect. No one should be treated as social outcasts. I also advocated a holistic review of the matter before any legislative decision is made to address the legis legitimate concerns that the repeal of Section 377A may have an impact on important institutions such as marriage and family. I therefore have no hesitation in supporting the carefully calibrated provisions in these bills today. Repealing Section 377A is the right thing to do. Homosexual males in consenting relationships will no longer be viewed as criminals and we would have taken a decisive step in, remo in removing the stigma that they previously faced. This is the main principle underlying the repeal. I'm indebted to the Honourable Minister Sir Shamugam for painstakingly reviewing the provision based on uh, materials stretching back to the 16th century. Listening to him, it seems to me that the legislative objective behind the equivalent of Section 377A is also rather obscure. At the same time, the amendments to the Constitution in this House makes it clear that the repeal of Section 377A will not affect the important institution of marriage as between a man and a woman and the government policies promoting these traditional families. This is in accord with the views of a significant majority of Singaporeans. There are important lessons that can be drawn from the government's approach in this House to deal with this issue. I wish to highlight three. First, it is about ensuring that our nation for now, and I hope for at least the next 20 years, will continue to be united and stable and not fail to hold because of this divisive issue. So much of what we do as a country depends on our unity and stability. We cannot afford to lose that. We do this by making the political accommodation that these bills collectively represent, something that the Honourable Prime Minister spoke about at some length during his National Day Rally 2022. What we need to guard against is the spectre of identity politics with an emphasis on an all or nothing mindset. If that happens in Singapore, I fear that it may be the beginning of the end of Singapore's cohesive social compact. Second, it's about acknowledging that our laws reflect the changing realities of our times. This includes respecting the voices of all sections of society, including those of our youths, their voices on their vision and aspirations for Singapore. Our youths shape the future of our country. Based on the Today Youth Survey 2022 published in Today on 15 November 2022, about two-thirds of our young adults agreed that the repeal of a law criminalizing gay sex represents a step towards a more inclusive society. These are our millennials and Gen Zers. This is a sizable majority. We need to forge an intergenerational understanding to keep us together as a society. Our founding Prime Minister, the late Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, pithily put this across in a speech he delivered way back in 1966 about the importance of working with our youths to create an enduring future in the context of multiracial harmony. He said, and I quote, the young are so important. We are old. Our values, our attitudes are fixed, but the minds of the young are flexible. They come out of, with innocent minds. And we must give them the values of tolerance, understanding, togetherness, and a society which gives everybody a meaningful life. And in that way, we will secure an enduring future for ourselves." Unquote. Here we have an opportunity. As currently, based on the same Today Youth Survey, three of five youths support the importance of upholding the definition of marriage as between one man and a woman. 
This was reportedly attributed to our youths internalizing the traditional definition of marriage as a norm. Third, it is about upholding the legitimacy of our democratic system of government that we have in Singapore. Both the Honourable Ministers spoke about this. In our Westminster-style government, our judiciary is an independent organ of state that is vested with judicial power to decide on legal issues without interference from this House or the executive. Being an unelected body, it is not directly accountable to our people. We have seen examples in other countries where judges are accused of playing politics when deciding on legal issues that have major socio-political ramifications. In the US, we saw the swinging of the pendulum from one end to the other just about five months ago, when the federal right to, of choice to abort, established in a 1973 case, was overturned by a majority in the US Supreme Court in favor of restoring the state's power to outlaw abortion. This is cause of Ferrari. Based on a September 2022 Pew Research Center survey, Americans' ratings of the Supreme Court are now as negative as and more politically polarized than at any point in time during the three decades of polling among, on the nation's highest court. Such sentiments undermine the confidence in and the legitimacy of the judiciary. This, in turn, can affect the rule of law in Singapore. We must avoid it. And the way to do it is to ensure that the policy issues that have socio-political ramifications are dealt with firmly in this House. We in this House have, much, have a much better ability to deal with such thorny issues as compared to the courts. As elected representatives, we have a much better pulse on what our people think and what is needed to ensure our nation's cohesiveness. We also have a unique ability to accommodate divergent views and reach a consensus that allows our society to march on and make progress. This is not a fanciful argument. In 2018, the Singapore High Court decided to allow a Singaporean gay man to adopt a son he fathered through a surrogate mother by paying her US $200,000 because, amongst others, the Singapore government had not promulgated then a policy against surrogacy. In discussing this case in this House in January 2019, the Honourable Minister, Mr Desmond Lee, in a carefully worded statement, acknowledged the decision has, and I quote, evoked a diverse range of emotions and reactions among Singaporeans and raised questions about its implications, unquote. So it is best that we in this House continue to take the lead to set policies that have socio-political ramifications to preserve the legitimacy of our system of government, particularly our judiciary. I have a query in relation to the proposed Article 156, subsection 3 and 4 of the Constitution. Part 4 of the Constitution lists the fundamental liberties. These are described in the 1957 Report of Federation of Malaya Constitutional Commission, from which our Singapore Constitution was modelled on as, and I quote, fundamental individual rights which are generally regarded as essential conditions for a free and democratic way of life, unquote. There are eight rights enumerated in Part 4. They include safeguards against liberty of a person, slavery, forced labor, protection against retrospective criminal laws, equal protection of all persons before the law, prohibition of banishment and freedom of movement, freedom of speech, religion, and education. The basic idea in this constitution is to protect individuals' rights by vesting in the courts the power to strike down legislation passed by this House or government action should they offend the fundamental liberties stated in this constitution. It is proposed that the entire part four be excluded from application in relation to both a law that defines marriage as a union between men and women and an exercise of executive authority based on such a definition of marriage. In contrast, when it comes to laws against subversion and emergency powers, Article 149, Subsection 1 of the Constitution specifically identifies five provisions that are to be excluded from Part 4. I hope you see the difference in approach here. On matters of national security, we are careful enough to pick out specific exclusions 
because there are at least three individual rights that are so important so as to be able to stand up against issues pertaining to national security. Why then is there a need to adopt a blunderbuss approach in preserving legislation or government action dealing with a definition of marriage as between a man and a woman? Would it not be possible for the government to identify specific provisions, just as what has been done for Article 149, and the Honourable Minister said Article 39A, which deals with um, GRCs. Personally, I prefer such an approach. I, I heard the Honourable Minister saying that um, the reason why we want to have such a shield is because we may not know of an argument that can be raised in the future. But we are dealing with fundamental liberties, and one of the reasons for having fundamental liberties is to curb excess of power or, you, or have a situation whereby there will be an irrational use of power. So as a matter of principle, we should be careful in providing for derogations to fundamental liberties of an individual, as it would ordinarily be inimical, inimical to the concept of democracy and rule of law. Also, may I ask whether it is intended that the court's powers of judicial review of government action on the traditional grounds of illegality, irrationality, and procedural impropriety be ousted. As I heard the Honourable Minister, he mentioned that that is not the intent. But then, maybe to articulate my point, let me give an illustration. Say, for example, a government in the future decides to banish a citizen. Now, that's a fundamental liberty under Article 13, on the basis that he doesn't subscribe to a marriage between a man and a woman, or he enters into a, a marriage uh, which uh, falls outside the definition in the Women's Charter. How can we then protect such a person from being banished? Can, can the courts exercise its judicial powers to provide a solution for such a person? And I would welcome the Honourable Minister's views on this matter. Sir, my point is a simple one, that we should put sufficient weight on this, but not be too heavy-handed as to allow it to trump all fundamental rights, as even on matters of national security, we have been careful to take such a, not to take such a sweeping approach. Sir, the repeal is the correct thing to do. It reflects Singapore's collective will towards equality, as well as the values and realities of our times. We've also, at the same time, captured the wide agreement that marriage is a union between a man and a woman. It is an elegant accommodation and a uniquely Singapore way, using the Honourable Minister Masago's words, of expressing the will of our people through this house. Thank you. Professor Hun Hien Teck. My apologies, Mr. Willem. Mr. Speaker, at the outset, I wish to state that I am in support of the Penal Code Amendment Bill. This is due to the likely unconstitutionality of Section 377A for violating Article 12, especially in the light of recent legal developments. I wish now to focus on the Constitution Amendment Bill before the House. So the bill proposes to add a new Article 156 to the Constitution. I believe it is important to study the various parts of Article 156 in detail. The first half of Article 156, namely sub-Articles 1 and 2, state that laws and policies concerning the promotion of the institution of marriage lie within the province of Parliament and the government. The second half of Article 156, namely sub-articles 3 and 4, declare that laws and policies based on the definition of marriage as between a man and a woman cannot be invalidated on the grounds that they violate Part 4 of the Constitution on Fundamental Liberties. It is further stated in these two sub-articles that the apparent prohibition of a constitutional challenge will apply to laws and policies that are in force whether before, on, or after the commencement of this bill, that is, for all past, current, and future laws and policies. 
Sir, from what I understand, the amendments to the Constitution are an attempt at a quid pro quo for the repeal of Section 377A of the Penal Code. The repeal of Section 377A is concerning to many Singaporeans who are not supportive of the repeal and who fear that the removal of the offence would mainstream gay lifestyles in further spheres of life. I see Article 156 as the government's way of signalling that the definition of marriage in Singapore would not be changed in the near future. However, as pointed out by the Law Minister in August, this does not amount to an entrenchment of the definition of marriage as between a man and a woman. He and Mr Masagos also made clear earlier that it was open to Parliament to change the definition of marriage by amending the law by a simple majority in Parliament. It is therefore appropriate to consider what the actual effect of Article 156 is. I intend to look at each of the four sub-articles in turn. First, Article 156.1. It is stated that Parliament may pass laws which define, regulate, safeguard, support, foster and promote the institution of marriage. On the one hand, that sounds like a clear statement of what Parliament can do. However, with due respect, I am not sure what this sub-article actually achieves apart from stating the obvious. It is indisputable that under Article 38 of the Constitution, legislative power has already been vested in the legislature consisting of the President and Parliament. Parliament can pass laws on any subject. In what way, then, is Article 1561 meaningful? Similarly, for Article 1562, it states that the government and any public authority may exercise the executive authority to protect, safeguard, support, foster and promote the institution of marriage. Again, is there a need to state that the government and any public authority may exercise their executive authority? It already is the position that under Article 23 of the Constitution, executive authority is vested in the President and exercisable by cabinet ministers and other bodies as authorised by law. It is arguable then that Articles 156, 1 and 2 do not add anything new to the current position. I next move to the second half of the proposed Article 156. The latter two sub-articles seek to prohibit challenges under Part 4 of the Constitution to laws and policies based on the current definition of marriage as between a man and a woman. I wish to record my concern about the implications of sub-articles 3 and 4 on judicial oversight of the actions of Parliament and the Government. It bears stating here that Part 4 is the part of the Constitution entitled Fundamental Liberties. It is Part 4 that grants individuals critical protections against abuse of state power, such as ensuring freedom from arbitrary arrest and freedom of religion, and the right to equal protection under the law. These are enshrined in the Constitution for a reason. No doubt, these fundamental liberties may not all be absolute, and some of them have been qualified in the Constitution itself. But if one looks at the existing qualifications, they tend to be scoped tightly and justified on the grounds of national emergencies, security, public order, and public health. This was a point that Member Mr Morali touched on earlier as well. So, sir, to now include the definition of marriage as something that the courts cannot assess for constitutionality does not appear to me to be justified. To clarify, I am not advocating for gay marriages here. My concern is purely about whether it is justified to exclude judicial scrutiny on this topic. From a governance standpoint, I find this position very difficult to accept. Under Article 93 of the Constitution, judicial power has been vested in our courts. Article 4 provides that the Constitution is the supreme law of the land, a point recognised by Minister Masagos earlier. Article 4 provides that laws passed by Parliament that are inconsistent with the Constitution shall to the extent of the inconsistency, be void. The Constitution is the fundamental legal safeguard of citizens to protect them against illegal laws and policies that violate the Constitution. And it is the job of the courts to assess whether any law is constitutional or not. Earlier, I heard Minister Masagos in a second reading speech, and I would humbly submit that it is not um, the same thing to say that when the court is assessing a law for constitutionality, it is intervening in a political space. It is the court's job to ensure that laws and policies conform with the Constitution. 
So this bill today seeks to exclude the courts from reviewing the constitutionality of laws and policies concerning marriage. Quite apart from the decision being taken today, I'm concerned about what this carve-out means for the future. Will the government, present or future, come up with other areas of life where the courts are to be excluded from reviewing laws and policies for constitutionality? Will Parliament in the future be looking at Articles 157, 158 or 159? So it goes without saying that Parliament and the government should instead be ever mindful of what the Constitution requires and act within those parameters. To that end, I'm very concerned about the implications of this new carve-out and what Parliament is asked to do today. So to summarise, I understand the purpose of Article 156 as a quid pro quo for the repeal of Section 377A. However, as far as sub-Articles 1 and 2 are concerned, it does not seem to me that these provisions add anything to the current position. As for Articles 156, 3 and 4, I'm concerned about the courts being further curtailed in their constitutional duty to check Parliament and the government. I'm also concerned about whether the carve-out of judicial oversight on the institution of marriage will set a precedent for future carve-outs, even if this is not the intention today. This is potentially detrimental to Singaporeans. That said, sir, I appreciate the difficulties the government has in navigating this issue of Section 377A. It is not easy to arrive at a solution that addresses the concerns of society, which is divided on the matter. To that end, I understand the signal the government wishes to send through the proposed Article 156, so I will not oppose the bill. Nevertheless, my concerns about safeguarding the courts in doing their constitutional duty remain. For the reasons I've stated, I've decided to cast a vote of abstention on the Constitution Amendment Bill. Sir Chris Souza. Mr. Speaker, sir, thank you for allowing me to speak. Many members in this House have known my long-standing support for the institutions of marriage and family. These institutions deserve continuing protection. I must discharge a duty today. Two questions follow. One, what is that duty? And two, how can I ensure that the carrying out of that duty works to the best for Singapore? My speech today will answer both those questions. For this, my starting point is to go back to 1962 and quote Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. In 1962, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew gave a speech to an audience from the University of Singapore. The speech was about law and order. Mr. Lee said the phrase should be modified. It should read order and law. Why? Because Mr. Lee's view, and I think it is a correct view, is that without order, then laws become useless. Allow me to quote Mr. Lee. Quote, those of you who are just embarking on the study of the law will learn the phrase law and order. In a settled and established society, law appears to be a precursor of order. Good laws lead to good order. That is the form that you will learn. But the hard realities of keeping the peace between man and man and between authority and the individual can be more accurately described if the phrase were inverted to order and law. For without order, the operation of law is impossible." Unquote. MM inverted the phrase law and order to become order and law. By inverting the phrase, he showed how one must establish order first before laws can work. Why is this a good starting point? Because what we are debating today is the order of things, and the order from which all relevant laws and policies should be construed. Some use the phrase societal norms. Some use the phrase social mores. I would use the term, the order of things. Mr. Speaker, we are deciding the order of things today. Even as we are debating removing a law, we are also debating strengthening the order of things by virtue of an amendment to the Constitution. That is a very 
significant move. Let us pause to think about this. We are not just removing a law. We are coupling the removal of a law with, a, with an amendment to the Constitution to protect the order of things. And what more, the Constitution is not just another law. It is the beacon from which all laws take their bearing. It sets the tone. It is the backbone of the order of things. Do I believe that there is a significant risk that Section 377A will be struck down by the courts in a future legal challenge? The AG has said so. The Minister for Law has said so. These are views that must be taken seriously. So I have thought long and hard about this matter and agree that there is a significant risk that Section 377A will be struck down by the courts in a future legal challenge. So the next question to ask is, do we wait or do we move first by shouldering the legislative responsibility of making hard decisions and deciding on what needs to be protected? It is clear in my mind that we must do the latter. So Parliament has to act now. We must analyse, deliberate, look into our own selves and make the hard legislative decisions. As members of this House, we have a duty to decide and reinforce what we desire to protect, given the significant risk that Section 377A may be struck down. For this, I now turn to the amendments of the Constitution before the House today. What does the constitutional amendment do? The bill states the legislature may, by law, define, regulate, protect, safeguard, support, foster, and promote the institution of marriage. And then clause three states, nothing in part four invalidates a law enacted before, on, or after the commencement of this bill by reason that the law defines marriage as a union between a man and a woman. The amendment to the Constitution is clear as to what it seeks to protect. I support it. Why? Mr. Speaker, I believe that the institution of marriage, as defined as the union between one man and one woman, is the basis upon which our society is built. It is something we must protect. It must not be diluted. Marriage is the union of a man and a woman. For centuries, this union has been the foundation of societies. Children and society as a whole flourish when marriages are supported and the resulting family unit is strong. Prime Minister has said in 2007, 2013 and 2016 that the traditional family unit should form the basic building block of our society. PM stated as recently as three months ago, quote, we have upheld and reinforced the importance of families through many national policies and we will continue to do so, unquote. Mr. Speaker, the amendment to the Constitution strengthens this foundation. It states clearly that marriage is between a man and a woman and it follows that this is the basis on which family is built. By constitutionalizing this, we are entrenching our values on what is the core, the base, the order of things from which all other relevant laws and policies in our society take bearing. It is the beacon, the guiding light. As a legislator, I see this inclusion and amendment to the Constitution as a deliberate and positive step. By making this amendment to the Constitution, it means that we are also protecting all our social policies that flow from this definition. As PM has said in the National Day Rally, this includes policies on public housing, education, adoption regulations, advertising standards, firm classification. Such a position has been echoed by various ministries in press statements or by ministers in response to press questions since the National Day Rally. What does this mean? One, the only form of marriage that is recognized in Singapore is the union between one man and one woman. 
No other form of marriage is recognized in Singapore. A religious teacher, an ustaz, imam, priest, pastor, bishop, rabbi, or men and women of any religion cannot be prevented from teaching what their faith teaches about marriage and about homosexuality. If practicing homosexuality is not condoned in a particular faith, the religious leader can state so. Two, spousal, routes, spous spousal rights can only be granted within the context of a heterosexual marriage. Three, education in school, particularly sex education, should affirm heterosexual marriage as the norm and the bedrock of family. There is no room to argue that because Section 377A is being repealed, that this somehow provides a gateway or a license to teachers to promote or normalize homosexuality in schools in Singapore. The repeal does not provide such a license. Four, high age ratings will apply to all media that contains homosexual content. Advertising cannot should, can, content, advertising content should not affirm homosexual unions in any way. Five, housing policies will prioritize allocation and grants for married couples, and here marriage means a union of a man and a woman. Six, library books for children, both physical and digital, should not have content depicting or affirming homosexual unions. Seven, as for adoption, there cannot be a case where a civil union recognized overseas gives a couple in the civil union the ability to adopt under our laws. Eight, and for the complete, and for the complete avoidance of doubt, civil unions and civil partnerships are not recognized in Singapore. Sir, this is not an easy speech for me to deliver. I have spoken with people who want Section 377A to be retained at all costs. They have a right to their view. I have spoken with people who want to do away with Section 377A and open the gates to changes for all institutions, marriage, adoption, the works. They too have the right to hold those views. But in the final analysis, I have to make my own decision on this difficult issue. Believe me, it is difficult. I too have close friends who have same-sex attraction. To take a public position on such a difficult issue is not easy, but I cannot shy away from facing difficult issues, and what I have shared in this speech is my position for Singapore. Is this decision-making a struggle? Yes, but in this struggle is where I belong. We, all of us here, have to make a deep effort to make the right choices in Singapore and for Singapore. Sir, with your permission, I move to my second last point. What we are debating today in this House on Singapore soil is squarely a domestic issue. Other countries can choose how they want to shape their societies but other countries should not impose their choices on us, no matter how well-meaning they perceive themselves to be. Speaking plainly, let us guard against covert and overt foreign influence in our domestic affairs. Allow me, sir, to end with the need for unity. Unity has been a powerful force in modern Singapore's unprecedented history. It must remain a part of our future. Why, in my view, is the aspect of unity so important today? I offer three reasons. One, there are people in our society who hold strong views on these issues. <laughs> Therefore, there is a potential here for Singapore to be torn apart by discord. Two, my hope is that Singaporeans can discuss our views on these issues peacefully. Where we disagree, let us express such disagreement respectfully and politely. What we are doing today in this House is to entrench what we seek to protect and remove a law 
that has a significant risk of being struck down. Three, by choosing to deal with this in Parliament, we are taking a deliberate and considered approach. Parliament, being made up of elected members, has the requisite mandate to deal with these issues, and Parliament can do so with dexterity. No other institution can carry through such a legislative manoeuvre. It is hoped that the choice of deploying Parliament to deal with this issue is the best path for unity for our society. Unity, it is very important. Sir, so in conclusion, while there is no perfect solution, I think the formula we are putting forward today both protects what is of vital importance to our nation and gives Singapore the best chance at unity. So let the decorum, tone, and respect that we display during this debate in this House set a good example to all Singaporeans of how to deal with such difficult and sensitive issues in future. My prayer is that we will not be torn apart by discord, but instead stay united as one nation. In all our deliberations, present and future, in all our debates, present and future, and in all our decisions, present and future, let not the unity of our nation be lost. Thank you very much. Ms. Hazel Poir. Mr. Speaker, sir, the issue of whether 377A should be repealed has been a difficult one for Singapore. When I last spoke in Parliament on this issue at the query of Minister Shamugam, I said that there were two different views within PSP and we had no consensus at that time, similar to the situation in our society at large. Whilst there is a big group that does not feel very strongly about this issue, there is also a significant group that holds very strong and opposing views, and they are not easily persuaded. We were of the view that any attempts to forcefully reach a single position at that point would be divisive. PSP believes that while we strive to establish common ground in core areas for unity, we also need to leave room for diverse viewpoints in other areas. Therefore, we believe that this is one issue where we should allow members to hold on to their personal beliefs so societal values evolve with time and laws evolve accordingly. Let society at large determine when is the right time to change this law. Since then, we have held more rounds of lengthy discussions in yet another attempt to seek common ground. We recognised the unfairness of 377A on the gay community, but we also recognised the fears of many on the subsequent effect on families and the difficulties they face in reconciling with their religious beliefs. Our concern is again whether this issue would damage social harmony in Singapore, which is something that we value. Eventually, recognising that 377A is unenforceable, some members were prepared to put aside their personal opinions and not pursue their objections to the repeal of 377A. With their compromise, PSP is now able to come to a party position of supporting the repeal of 377A. In any society, contentious issues will always arise. Recognising that no one single person can have his way all the time and that taking turns to compromise is part and parcel of democracy, is a sign of maturity. The willingness to compromise is not a sign of weakness, but instead one of maturity, resilience, and community spirit. 
Many Singaporeans are concerned about the effect such a repeal will have on the institution of marriage. PSP's position is that the definition of marriage should be decided via a national referendum rather than by parliament. This will allow the many Singaporeans who have expressed concerns to have a say in the matter. The path towards political maturity is filled with gifts and takes from all sides. PSP is confident that Singaporeans can do it and we will strive towards that direction. Thank you. And where's Sun Shiling? Mr. Speaker, sir, I have spoken to groups who have the whole spectrum of views on this subject, often strongly held with regards to 377A. Given my roles at the Ministry of Social and Family Development, Ministry of Home Affairs, and previously the Ministry of Education, I would like to share on the engagements and the feedback from all these various groups and individuals. First, I have met with groups such as Young Out Here, Greenhouse, Uga Chaga, Sayoni, Tea Project, and others who run support groups to help LGBTQ individuals. These ground up initiatives provide a safe space for their community to come together and support one another where they can be seen and heard, where they are not treated as invisible, and where they will not be judged. I understand that to the gay community, Section 377A, while not actively enforced, is seen as society's judgment of them. A rejection of their right to exist, criminalizes their right to love and be loved in return, and makes them feel like a lesser citizen. It also hangs like the sword of Democles over them, since the law exists and reminds them that they are criminals even when what they are engaging in is a private consensual act between two adults. LGBTQ plus individuals may also suffer from stigma, discrimination, and be disproportionately impacted by mental health concerns. At T Project's shelter for their community, I saw how a small shelter for six persons was stacked with suitcases and personal items of about another 10 individuals. The owners of these items have no permanent abode and move from place to place as their life is often complicated by mental stress, poverty and unemployment. In conversations with Greenhouse, which runs a support group for 200 plus gay individuals, some shared that they have struggled since young to find acceptance from their family, but love and acceptance was not forthcoming. This has consequences on their physical and mental health, ability to find and hold a job, and increases their risk of committing offences and suffering from substance addiction. They shared that substance addiction becomes a coping mechanism for them when they are unable to find acceptance in society. We understand their concerns and are working with social service agencies to be open and sensitive to the diverse needs of clients and to provide social support regardless their backgrounds and sexual orientations. At the same time, I have also spoken to many individuals who are worried about where our society is headed should 377A be repealed. In an engagement with over 100 members of the public who had written to their MPs, some youths recounted how they had experienced being ostracised or cancelled in schools and universities because they were seen to be conservative and not advocating gay rights. Others spoke about how they were singled out at their workplaces because they are religious and by default <coughs> seen to be homophobic and therefore at odds with the company's diversity and inclusion policies. I saw a grandmother's hand trembling as she spoke about her grave concerns should Singapore go down the slippery slope 
as some other countries have after decriminalising gay sex. I would like to clarify that employees are protected against discrimination under the tripartite guidelines for fair employment practices and these guidelines require employers to make employment decisions based on merit and factors relevant to the job. The Ministry of Manpower is also looking at enacting workplace fairness legislation. On being cancelled for one's beliefs, the government is looking into policy solutions to preserve space for persons of different views to share what they think safely. But ultimately, what is important is that we maintain mutual respect when we engage with one another and not tear each other down. I also met with leaders of religious groups, some of them four to five times. They have been steadfast partners in our nation building. They have worked tirelessly to bring Singaporeans from different races and religions together to build common spaces and common values. The religious leaders shared views from their communities on 377A, views anchored on hopes for Singapore to continue to be strong and stable and a place for families. Many of their congregants have a great sense of gratitude and pride in how far our nation has come and wish for nothing more than for our children and future generations to thrive and prosper. And they see the heterosexual family unit as the bedrock of our society. Mr. Speaker, sir, all these individuals, gay or straight, from different walks of life, have stepped forward to share their views because they want to make Singapore a better place a better place for future generations to safeguard Singapore society and safeguard a community. And I want to thank them for being considered in their approach and for sharing the views of their communities in a constructive manner. We have heard their views and will continue to work with them to navigate a way forward. The two bills that stand before us today allow us to repeal 377A in a careful and considered way. The issue that stands before us is one of public policy as to whether gay sex in the context of private sexual behaviour between consenting adults should remain a crime under Singapore laws. Having heard the views from various parties, the two bills have been drafted with great care and aim to address their concerns. A. That the majority of Singaporeans still want the heterosexual family structure as norm B. Most accept that private consensual sex between men should not be criminalised. C. For those who are against the repeal, the main concern is about what the repeal would mean for social norms and not that they want to criminalise sex between men. Though the bills are voted on separately, they should be seen holistically because this is not a zero-sum game where one side wins and the other side loses. And in the spirit of how the two bills are drafted, we hope that Singaporeans with all their varied views on the issue can be united in our desire to find common ground so that we can move forward together. Let us be united in wanting Singapore to be a home for all, a tolerant and inclusive society where all Singaporeans feel a sense of dignity and have collective confidence in our future. Mr. Speaker, sir, in Chinese, please. Li Zongli, in 2007年的国会辩论上提到政府决定将保留三七七 废除三七七A可以达到知行合一，让立法和执法更加协调一致、清晰透明。与此相关的，就如三七七A有可能在法庭上被认定为不符合宪法，新加坡的婚姻定义也可能会面临类似的挑战。而导致与婚姻相关的
来定义和保护婚姻制度，并使得基于一男一女的婚姻制度以及与其相关的法律和政策不能在宪法上被挑战。在过去几个月来，就三七七 A 的课题，政府和社会各界人士进行了多次交流。从各界的反馈来看。大部分人是支持废除三七七 A 法案的。当然，在交流当中也有一些两极化的观点，比如有人认为同性恋是不道德的行为，也有一些人希望同性恋群体获得更多的权利。社会存在不同对立的观点，不一定是坏事。新加坡是一个多元种族、多元宗教、多元文化的社会。但大家又能够和谐共存，正是我们新加坡人引以为荣的地方。我们每个人的家庭背景不同，文化不同，受到的教育也不尽相同，对某一个问题的看法有可能产生不同的观点。有人担心同性恋人士会造成社会问题，但是我们也看到，他们当中的有人，他们当中有的人正是需要社会的理解和救助。我曾经去拜访过一家给同性恋人士提供援助的互助会，当中有些人从小就不被家庭接受，之后在生活中遇到各种问题，比如受霸凌问题、心理健康问题、经济问题。有些人在面临生活危机的时候，感觉上天无路，入地无门。这些人也是新加坡的同胞。我们不必按照别人的生活方式来生活，但也不必强求别人按照我们的生活方式来生活。己所不欲，勿施于人。包容是解决分歧的解药。对于同性恋这个敏感的课题，希望观点对立的群体能够有包容的理念，互相理解，放下分歧，寻求共识。在与华社的交流过程中，我了解到很多人非常重视以家庭为中心的传统价值观，不希望因为废除三七七 A 而改变新加坡人的家庭观念。我认同这个观点：家庭是社会的基石，家庭稳定了，社会也才能稳定。人民行动党政府执政后最早颁布的法律之一是一九六一年的《妇女宪章》。这是一项保护妇女权利的里程碑式的立法，只允许男女之间的一夫一妻婚姻制合法化。之后，政府一直通过各项政策支持新加坡的家庭，例如已婚的家庭在获得公共住房以及相关补贴上一直享有优先权。婴儿花红的发放也是在鼓励婚姻和生育。社会及家庭发展部也通过公共教育项目。积极倡导教育，强调家庭的重要性。我们了解不同家庭所面对的问题，例如单身家庭、离异家庭，社会及家庭发展部也会尽最大的努力去帮助他们。对于婚姻制度，我们要维护，而不是颠覆，这才有利于政策的延续和社会的稳定。否则，目前与婚姻有关的政策和法律，包括婴儿花红、政府组屋等政策，都有可能在未来面对法庭的挑战，这会让问题变得非常复杂。有人可能问：现在民众可能更加关注物价上升、住房等民生问题，我们为什么在此时此刻讨论三七七 A 的议题？这里我需要澄清的是，政府非常关切民生问题，目前正在尽最大努力来应对。例如，二百九十万名国人将在下个月领到定薪与援助配套，减轻国人的生活费负担。政府在上个月刚刚宣布了额外十五亿元的援助配套，应对全球通货膨胀给新加坡带来的压力。在政府解决这些重要的民生问题的当儿，也要解决其他的问题。废除三七七 A， 维护婚姻制度，同样关系到新加坡同胞的生活，他们同样，他们同样需要我们的关注。
，我们不仅要解决宏观问题，也要解决微观问题，让每个新加坡人都能活得有尊严，活得有希望。刚才提到的全球通货膨胀，一个重要原因就是目前的国际局势很不稳定，中美关系持续紧张，俄乌战争也已经持续半年多。造成石油等原材料价格大幅上涨，在国际环境不稳定的时候，我们新加坡内部一定要保持稳定。今天，我们同时提出两项动议，希望大家能够看到政府的苦心。两项动议就像天平的两端，缺一不可。正是为了维护社会的平稳与稳定，一方面。废除三七七 A， 更好的保护个人的自由和权利，减少社会对同性恋者的压力。另一方面，维护婚姻制度能让相关的法律和政策保持稳定，减少各族群的担忧。因此，希望大家以包容和平衡的态度看待这两项动议，团结一心，共同携手前进。另外，我也要感谢华族群体在面对许多社会问题的时候，经常会持有包容的态度，强调社会各方互敬互让、求同存异、和谐共处。有些家长可能会对废除三七七 A 有些顾虑，例如不知是否会影响到社会风气。关于社会风气，在公众场合，无论是男女之间，还是同性之间。过分亲密的行为都是不适当的。社会风气也不是仅仅依靠法律来约定，社会风气需要社会、家庭、教育等各个方面的合力，需要我们每一个人都出一份力。我也知道家长打从心底非常疼爱自己的孩子，希望他们能在一个健康和谐的环境中长大，找到理想的伴侣，将来老有所依，享受天伦之乐。我想说，包容并不是倡导。我们包容同性恋的行为，提议废除三七七 A， 不对男同性恋的行为定罪。但这并不是在倡导某种生活方式，或是倡导某种社会风气。今天提出的两个方案，这一路走来不容易。新加坡是一个多元宗教、多元种族、多元文化的社会。每个种族和宗教团体都有自己的做法、习俗、规范、信仰和信念。要把一个如此多样化的社会凝聚在一起，并不容易。因此，政府一直强调，我们应该不分种族、言语和宗教，维护共同空间，培育好公民和维护平等原则的重要性。只有这样，我们才能团结一致，为国家的尽力、进步而努力。废除三七七 A 法案是一个艰难的决定，即使我们做了最大的努力，寻找一个能让整个社会更加平衡、更加和谐的方案，但无论如何，也都会有一些人不满意。但是我们必须做出一个正确的决定，一个对新加坡人负责的决定。我们提议废除三七七 A， 达到知行合一，同时对于婚姻制度。维护而不是颠覆，两项动议兼顾自由与稳定，好比天平的两端，缺一不可，最大程度的争取整个社会的平衡与和谐。我希望大家能看到政府在整个课题上费的心思和努力。我也呼吁大家继续互相尊重，放下分歧，寻找共识，包容彼此。我们将继续与国人携手前进，努力保持团结。继续维护新加坡社会的和谐与繁荣。谢谢。Mr. Zulkarnain Abdul Rahim. Mr. Speaker, sir. I will focus my speech on two main areas, the legal context behind the necessity for the repeal of Section 377A, which I will deliver in Malay, and the need to support families 
and especially parents and educators in navigating the post-repeal of Section 377A. In Malay, saya akan menyentuh tentang perlunya untuk pemansuhan Section 377A dalam kanun kesiksaan memandangkan perkembangan keputusan Mahkamah Rayuan kita baru-baru ini. Secara penjelasan, perlembagaan kita adalah undang-undang negara yang terulung. Jika ada jua rang undang-undang yang bercanggah dengan perlembagaan, maka ianya tidak sah dan akan luput. Dalam beberapa tahun kebelakangan ini, terdapat banyak cabaran dan rayuan mahkamah tentang status perlembagaan Seksyen 377A. Hujahnya adalah bahawa Seksyen ini melanggar perlembagaan negara. Berikutan keputusan terbaharu tahun ini, Menteri Undang-Undang dan hal ehwal dalam negeri Encik Shan Mungam serta peguam negara kita menasihatkan bahawa ada kemungkinan besar Seksyen 377A akan dimansuhkan jika ianya terus dicabar dalam kes mahkamah yang akan datang. Mahkamah Rayuan dalam kes Tan Seng Ki berpendapat bahawa Seksyen tersebut mungkin tidak selaras dengan perlembagaan Artikel 12 iaitu hak menjaminkan perlindungan undang-undang sama rata bagi semua rakyat Singapura. Ini kerana Seksyen 377A hanya menjenayahkan kelakuan homoseksual antara lelaki dan tidak secara amnya. Ini mungkin menyanggah reasonable classification test dalam tafsiran Artikel 12 Perlembagaan Kita dalam kes Syed Suhail. Namun, atas jaminan yang diberi oleh Perdana Menteri Lee Hsien Loong pada tahun 2007 dan Peguam Negara pada tahun 2018 bahawa Seksyen ini tidak akan dikuatkuasakan, Mahkamah Rayuan berpendapat bahawa ia tidak perlu membuat keputusan atas perlembagaan Seksyen 377A pada kali ini. Dan pihak Rayuan tidak ada local standby atau hak untuk membawa tindakan ke mahkamah. Ini disebabkan doktrin jangkaan yang sah ataupun doktrin of legitimate expectation. Namun, mahkamah rayuan mengiktiraf bahawa peguam negara kini atau di masa yang akan datang boleh mengubah dasar pada bila-bila masa. Ini bermaksud bahawa pendapat mahkamah tentang isu local standby atau doktrin jangkaan sah boleh juga berubah pada bila-bila masa sahaja. Oleh itu, ia bukan persoalan jika tetapi bila Seksyen 377A akan dimansuhkan mahkamah apabila kes yang lain dikemukakan di ke mahkamah. Justru saya bersetuju dengan pendekatan pemerintah untuk membahaskan isu ini di sidang parlimen dan bukan membiarkan mahkamah untuk membuat keputusan pada masa akan datang. Walaupun masyarakat Singapura kita kekal konservatif dalam hal perkahwinan dan keluarga, kebanyakan daripada kita tidak mahu seseorang itu dihukum penjara hanya atas sebab kelakuannya di bawah seksyen tersebut. Walaupun kita tetap berbeza antara agama, bangsa, nilai atau cara hidup, kita sesama manusia dan setiap antara kita ada hak yang sama untuk dilindungi di bawah naungan undang-undang yang adil dan saksama untuk semua warga negara. Pemindaan pada perlembagaan yang diajukan hari ini adalah penting kerana ia bertujuan untuk melindungi undang-undang dan dasar-dasar pemerintah yang berlandaskan definasi keluarga dan perkahwinan antara lelaki dan perempuan. Dengan adanya perlindungan ini, tiada kes yang boleh diajukan ke mahkamah untuk mencabar perlembagaan undang-undang yang mentakrifkan perkahwinan antara lelaki dan perempuan dan juga dasar-dasar pemerintah yang berlandaskan 
definasi perkahwinan termasuk dasar-dasar perumahan awam, pendidikan dan media. Mr. Speaker, sir, this bill sends a signal that everyone must be equally protected under the law. At the same time, the amendment to the Constitution clarifies Parliament's role to protect, safeguard, support, foster and promote the institution of marriage. The new Article 156, subsection 3, protects from a constitutional challenge the laws defining marriage as a union between a man and a woman and also laws and policies based on a heterosexual definition of marriage. Notwithstanding this, I've met many residents in Kat Hong and Chua Chu Kang and members from various organisations and charities, including Malay Muslim organisations, who are uncertain as to what the future changes these amendments will bring. I think it is important to actively engage families and parents on this issue and provide them with various avenues of counselling or parenting support. The same goes for our teachers and educators too. For the Muslim community, a common feedback from mosque or organisation leaders is that there is a need for clearer guidelines or capability training. The new Article 156, subsection 2 states that the government and public authorities may, in the exercise of the executive authority, promote the institution of marriage through public housing, education and media policies that promote and safeguard the institution of marriage. In this regard, may I ask what are the plans of the government to achieve this stated objective to promote and safeguard the institution of marriage? And in particular, whether there are any plans to provide or families, especially parents, with counselling or parenting support. In this regard, such parenting support or counselling should also provide for a faith or value-based support if such is available, so that the individuals concerned would choose what suits them best. Also, it is important to preserve the freedom of conscience in our schools, businesses and religious institutions so that our fellow Singaporeans are free to practice their belief, their faith or otherwise without any fear of cancellation or reprisals against them. I welcome the announcement by Minister Shanmugam and also by MOS Sun Shueling just now that the ministries and agencies are looking into this. May I ask whether there is an update and whether a consultation feedback process will be undertaken. In conclusion, Mr. Speaker, sir, we need to continue to stand united together as fellow Singaporeans, despite our differences in faith, values or belief. Let us not let this issue divide us, but instead unite us. Thank you. Mr. Dennis Tan. Mr. Speaker, today the House is debating the Government's Amendment Bill to repeal Section 377A of the Penal Code and a proposed amendment of the Constitution to insert a new Article 156 relating to the institution of marriage. In 2007, Prime Minister Lee Hsien Long said that the Government will not proactively enforce Section 377A and that has been the position since then. For the record, I still agree with the previous position of the Government in not enforcing Section 377A. Since the government announced that it will be repealing Section 377A of the Penal Code and after the subsequent announcement of the proposed constitutional law amendments, I have received feedback and spoken to many residents and Singaporeans of different races, religions and ages. I've heard and read the views of members of the LGBTQ community, particularly the unhappiness with perceived discrimination and different rights as compared to heterosexual couples in the, in the areas of marriage, owning BTOs, rights of child adoption, etc. I also heard much feedback from residents and Singaporeans of their concerns for the repeal. Many were concerned that we would be removing a symbolic social marker by such a repeal. People are also concerned with the societal changes they have seen in many countries in the areas of gender identity, sex education, 
marriage laws and public policy. And with the repeal, some will press for more changes in law and policy after the repeal, like what is seen in other countries, for example, in Australia and the US. And they wonder to what extent the proposed amendments to the Constitution can prevent such changes. Many express concern that the removal of such a marker may make it difficult for parents in setting down their family and social values at home. Many are also concerned they will be, they will be stopped from expressing their contrary views on sexuality after the repeal, including the fear of being cancelled. Some are concerned that there will be name-calling because you, they take a view on sex, sexuality in their workplace or for young people and children in their schools. People are also concerned that more changes will make society more divided. Mr Speaker, some who are concerned with the repeal are of the view that the present position in law would represent the best balance. The Singaporeans I have spoken to or have written to me with their reservations include those whose views may not be influenced by any religious views and also those of a wide age range. Mr Speaker, I have considered different views and positions, many of which we have heard and we will hear in the House today. The proposed repeal presents a number of difficult issues for different groups of Singaporeans. The symbolism of Section 377A is different to different groups. There are differing views and even the experiences of individuals. As an MP in considering all issues, I'm also guided by my own conscience in arriving at a position that I feel is right for our society and our people, even if some may disagree. Even as I do my best to analyse the issues for different segments of our population and my constituents, for reason of my own conscience, as guided by my own faith and beliefs, I find it difficult to support the repeal of Section 377A. I am personally troubled by the removal of the marker that it represents. Mr Speaker, this has not been an easy decision for me because as an MP, I would like to represent all constituents as best as I can. I thank my party whip and party secretary general and leader of the opposition, Pritam Singh, for lifting the whip. I do not take this lightly. In fact, I make this decision with a heavy heart. This is both a most difficult decision and is the most difficult speech I have to make today. Given the divided issues at play for different segments of our con my constituents and for Singaporeans. Being very careful not to cause hurt or offence and yet having to be principled with my own beliefs. It is also not made easier because like many fellow MPs and Singaporeans, I also have many friends and good, good friends who are from the LGBTQ community. And some have over time shared with me some of their very difficult circumstances and experiences in life, which makes my decision today even more difficult and humbling. I humbly seek their understanding. Mr Speaker, a conscience vote is a very heavy responsibility a Member of Parliament is required to discharge because it is a responsibility each of us carries alone, guided by our own conscience. Mr Speaker, next on the issue of the Constitutional Amendment, my colleague and my honourable friend, Mr Wei Lim, has raised some concerns regarding the implications of the proposed carves out carve outs in the proposed uh, Article 153 to exclude the court's role in ensuring conformity with the Constitution. While I agree that her concerns have some merits, and I look forward to the government's assurances on these issues, <clears throat> I would still support the amendments for the reason that as the government is minded to push through the repeal of Section 377A, if the repeal were to proceed without the proposed constitutional amendments, those who have reservations about the repeal may be even more concerned that there will be no other enhancement in law to address their concerns. Mr Speaker, before I close, I'd like to thank many of my constituents and many Singaporeans who wrote to me and who spoke to me about the proposed repeal of Section 377A, including both uh, the groups who support the repeal and those who object to the repeal. i also like to seek the understanding of my constituents and Singaporeans who may not agree with my decision. The position I take today does not change how I treat all my constituents and all Singaporeans. I will continue to serve all my constituents to the best of my ability. Moving forward, I hope for greater understanding between those who share different views on LGBT and greater tolerance of different views. We may not always agree with each other on every issue, but we can and should agree to disagree. We should still love and respect each other 
no less as fellow human beings. And I hope that there will be more dialogue between those who share different views so that there may be a better understanding and less polarisation. Mr Speaker, I oppose the Penal Code Amendment Bill but will support the Constitutional Amendment Bill. Thank you. Professor Hun Hien Teck. Mr. Speaker, sir, each individual functions within a society. So there is a place for public debate about the laws and institutions which we would want to have in order to regulate life within that society. At one level, I believe that this debate is about whether the family defined as a marriage between a heterosexual couple and their parenthood, is the unit that forms the basic stru structure of a well-ordered society. Children are born into families and develop their complete lives with the investment of the parents who gave birth to them. If we view the family as just defined, as part of the basic structure of society, then we would want to have laws and institutions that support that family. We would want to strengthen this social norm and support the public commitment made by a man and a woman to be married to each other and to raise their children within the safety of their wedding vow. Playing their complementary roles Fathers and mothers raise their children who contribute to the orderly formation and further reproduction of society over many generations. Research shows that the cognitive and the social-emotional skills that are acquired in early childhood and that their development is very much shaped by the family environment well, it has to be acknowledged that there are major challenges that couples will have got to tackle in order to keep their marriages healthy and to provide the best environment to raise their children. Our laws and institutions must help to strengthen a culture where husbands and wives give priority to building strong families. Even when couples are economically disadvantaged, public policy through early interventions in their children's lives can help to improve social mobility. Society can then uplift the quality of life for future generations of citizens by supporting the husband and wife in their child-rearing activities. Singapore has made a transition from an economy built around factories that produce standard labour-intensive goods for sale into the world market to one that is more service-oriented and where the fourth industrial revolution will require workers to exercise a wide range of both cognitive and non-cognitive skills. In such an economy, I believe the family remains the bedrock of society where children born, where children learn complementary lessons from their fathers and their mothers so that they develop the skills needed to become well-functioning future workers. We take for granted that as our parents have invested in our lives, it is our responsibility to provide care for them when they become old. That responsibility is shared among siblings. Even when there are failures in particular cases, we hold as examples those who, as, those who inspire us with their devotion to duty to the care of the aging parents. While the government, through its public programs, provides assistance in various forms, much of the glue that holds a society together comes from the constituent members within the family. We should, one, in instituting our laws to convey through all means possible the gratitude we feel for the complementary roles 
that our fathers and mothers play in raising us to become well-functioning adults. Departing from this norm of what constitutes a family, I believe, leaves us in uncharted waters. Mr. Speaker, sir, the government has reiterated that it has no intention to change the tone of society. It's, it also affirms, I quote, the family as the cornerstone of our social fabric and marriage between a man and a woman, end of quote. A strategy to redefine what constitutes a family from what the government has reaffirmed as marriage between a man and a woman and their parenthood involves taking sequential steps to progressively bring about change. In many historical cases around the world, where the structure of the family has been changed from the norm that the government has reaffirmed, legislative changes have indeed taken place sequentially, beginning with the decriminalization similar to uh, the repeal of the law we are discussing today, to subsequently defining the family in a very different way uh, from the basic structure of the family uh, just mentioned. These changes, these leg legislative changes, make the definition and institution of marriage both contingent and subject to change. I believe that not repealing the law acts to bolster the achieving of the aims of the government to keep the family formed out of a marriage between a man and a woman as a cornerstone of a social fabric for as long as possible in the face of the many challenges to such an understanding of the family as the unit that forms the basic structure of society. I believe that keeping the current law serves to provide an important marker to preserve the present structure of the family and its supporting institution. I believe that it is best not to repeal the law. Thank you. Mr. Fahmi Aliman. Speaker, sir, I'll be speaking in Malay, please. Setelah mendampingi penduduk di kawasan di saya serta masyarakat dan badan-badan Melayu Islam dan sebagai anggota NTUC dan penggerakan buruh Singapura yang selalu mendampingi rakan pemimpin dan pekerja, saya menghargai keprihatinan dan maklum balas mereka yang membina. Oleh itu, saya ingin mengemukakan tiga keprihatinan tentang kemansuhan, pemansuhan Section 377A yang saya harap dapat ditangani dari sekarang. Tiga kepertanyaan ini adalah berkaitan dengan tempat kerja, keluarga dan pendidikan, khususnya pendidikan madrasah di Singapura. Salah satu unsur penting yang mewujudkan pengalaman kerja yang baik bagi setiap pekerja ialah keharmonian di tempat kerja. Majikan harus pastikan dasar dan amalan mereka membuka ruang kerja inklusif yang menghormati dan peka terhadap perbezaan pegangan serta nilai pribadi semua pekerja. Janganlah mengalakkan kegiatan yang dapat membawa kepada diskriminasi atau tindakan membuli. NTUC berpegang bahawa semua pekerja patut dilayani dengan adil berdasarkan kelebihan masing-masing. Mereka tidak patut mengalami diskriminasi berdasarkan apa jua ciri yang tiada kaitan dengan pekerjaan termasuk perjayaan atau identiti diri. Apabila syarikat-syarikat menganjurkan program atau aktiviti bagi menggalakkan keagamaan dan keterangkuman dan ada pekerja yang tidak mau hadir bagi keperluan yang tidak yang tiada kaitan dengan pekerjaan, NTUC menyeru agar mereka tidak dipaksa turut serta atau berasa dianak tirikan kerana tidak mahu turut serta. Kemajuan, kemajuan kerjaya mereka tidak patut terjejas disebabkan tidak ikut serta. Demi sokongan yang lebih baik untuk majikan dan pekerja dalam menelusuri liku-liku tempat kerja masa hadapan, saya menyeru agar pemerintah menimbangkan garis panduan atau nasihat yang memberi paduman jelas ke arah aktiviti sedemikian di tempat kerja. Di Singapura, unit keluarga merupakan tunggak utama masyarakat. 
Banyak dasar pertabiran kita seperti perumahan berkisar pada unit atau nukleus keluarga. Saya suka cerita pemerintah akan tetap menegakkan keluarga tradisional dalam dasar dan undang-undang sambil bekerjasama dengan pihak kepentingan untuk melakarkan haluan kehadapan. Pada masa yang sama, terdapat keperluan mendesak untuk mewujudkan ruang selamat bagi keluarga membincangkan perkara berkaitan seksualiti secara terbuka. Khususnya ibu bapa yang dan anak-anak sepatutnya bebas membincangkan perkara-perkara begini tanpa dikhuatir di madang serong. Ibu bapa yang tidak setuju dengan pandangan komuniti gay dan homosexual, homosexual tentu tentang seksualiti tidak patut diaibkan di mata umum. Mereka patut bebas menyuarakan pegangan sendiri kepada anak-anak mereka didasari oleh ajaran agama dan pandangan dunia mereka. Ibu bapa patut diberikan ruang untuk melindungi anak-anak mereka daripada sebarang kandungan yang mereka tidak anggap yang mereka anggap tidak wajar. Termasuk yang berkaitan dengan komuniti gay dan homoseksual. Oleh itu, saya menyuruh pemerintah supaya meneguhkan lagi unik keluarga tradisional agar kekal menjadi keluarga selamat akan menjadi ruang selamat untuk keluarga membincangkan perkara berkaitan seksualiti. Akhir sekali, akhir sekali soal sama ada azah tiza di madrasah dibekalkan dengan ilmu yang diperlukan bagi mengupas topik berkaitan seksualiti di bilik darjah. Dalam jawab, jawapan kepada soalan Parlimen Cik Maram Jaafar tahun lepas, Menteri bertanggungjawab bagi ehwal masyarakat Islam merangkap Menteri Pembangunan Sosial dan Keluarga Encik Mahasagos Zulkifli berkata, Madrasah kita menggabungkan pendidikan seksualiti dalam kurikulum sedia ada untuk pelajar lelaki dan perempuan. Walaupun bukan pelajaran tersendiri, perkara ini mendapat liputan luas dalam sukatan pelajaran melalui topik seperti human, lelaki perempuan, jantina, seksualiti dan mengendalikan isu-isu berkaitan imej diri, akil balik dan keremajaan serta mengendalikan tekanan rakan sebaya. Topik-topik ini didasarkan pada pelajar berumur 13 hingga 16 tahun. Kelulusan rang undang-undang ini menimbulkan kebimbangan tentang kesannya pada pendidikan seksualiti di madrasah. Tambahan pula, buka, belum diketahui sama ada patut diadakan latihan tambahan bagi membekalkan azah tizah dengan kemahiran yang perlu untuk mengupas perkara sensitif berkaitan seksualiti dan bagaimana isu tersebut patut dibentangkan kepada pelajaran. Oleh itu, kajian lanjut patut dijalankan tentang sejauh mana rang undang-undang ini akan mempengaruhi pendidikan seksualiti di madrasah. Sebagai penutup, meskipun beberapa kepertahanan telah saya huraikan tadi, saya menyokong rang undang-undang ini demi nilai inklusif dan dalam masyarakat kita yang beragam. Singapura negara yang beragam dan akan semakin beragam. Walaupun ada pelbagai perbezaan, kita dapat bersatu hati dan berbina bersepakatan, bersepakatan dalam isu-isu negara. Begitu juga dalam hal ini. Oleh itu saya menyokong rang undang-undang ini kerana kita satu keluarga besar dan pegangan setiap pekerja itu penting. Terima kasih. Mr. Leon Pereira. Mr. Speaker, sir, I'd like to start by asking a simple question. What if you were born into a world where your actions mark you out as being in a minority because most people don't want to do what you do? An unpopular minority. What if you were able to live your life in the society you were born into, but at the back of your mind, you could never get over this niggling fear, this fear that one day the majority might turn against you, might bully you, might discriminate against you, or worse. Each of us can close our eyes and imagine that we live in such a world. And then imagine a different world, a different situation. Imagine that you hold dearly to a viewpoint as a matter of conscience, a viewpoint that others believe is deeply offensive and hurtful, even though to you it is a view that does not call for hurt towards any other human being. Rather, it is a view about what sorts of behaviors should be held up as moral markers in our society. Imagine that you cannot speak about that point of view that you hold on pain of being canceled, abused, or attacked on social media, or worse. 
Each of us can close our eyes and imagine that we live in such a world too. So proponents of either side in the 377A debate may identify with either one or the other scenario, or perhaps some may identify with both scenarios at once. That is what is at stake in this debate. Are we to be divided between people who cherish the freedom to act in a certain way versus those who cherish the freedom to espouse views that are deep matters of conscience, and never the twain shall meet? Will this be an unbridgeable chasm in our Singapore? We have seen what such divisions about values can do in other countries. We can look at the culture wars in the USA, for example, an oft-quoted example where differences in values, often with a religious dimension, have become political and polarizing. Another example possibly is Turkey, where differences in values with a religious dimension have had huge political ramifications in the past and still do. Politics is and should be about the contest of ideas, robust, respectful debate about what is best for the country is a good thing, as most Singaporeans would probably agree these days. The truth, what is best for our country in our time, emerges from such disagreement. Other things are needed for political progress, but there can be no progress without respectful, robust political debate. But major political divides around values, around matters of conscience and religion, are a different matter to some extent. Such debates are often impossible to settle with reference to an agreed set of facts. So as we chart a path forward on these issues before the House today, before the country today, it is worth recalling a few truths that almost no one would disagree with on either side of the questions before us. Let's recall a few things that unite us. Firstly, Singaporeans will have to decide these debates ourselves. The touchstone in our hearts should be what is best for and what is possible in this country we love, not some other country we know about. Secondly, I believe that no one in this debate is calling for the active enforcement of 377A. I know that this is the case for my colleagues in the Workers' Party who have a different view from mine on 377A and with whom I've had many lively and meaningful discussions from which I have learned a great deal. I suspect that this would be the case for all other members of this House who can be taken to represent the political mainstream. Let's stop and reflect on that for a second. That is hugely important. No one is saying discrimination is okay. No one is saying bullying is okay. No one is saying violence is okay. That is what unites the vast majority. Some on the fringe on either side may not agree, but no one in the mainstream disagrees. Despite our worst fears, in my humble opinion, sir, the middle ground on this issue is strong. And, Mr. Speaker, sir, given that no one is calling for the active enforcement of 377A in this debate, as we move on to unpack the issues, we must hold fast in our hearts to that realization because it is a truth that unifies and heals and strengthens. So what then is at stake if it is not practical enforcement? What is at stake is the existence of 377A on our statute books as a moral marker, as a symbolic marker. And as I said in my recent speech on national symbols, the debate is not less important for that reason. It is far from trivial. It is important because symbols matter. Mr. Speaker, so what divides us in this debate is whether to keep or throw out 377A in our body of law. But I would like to argue that there is another issue that divides us, which is a subtext to the debate, a subliminal factor, if you like. And that is the concern that if 377A is repealed and that moral marker is no longer, will those who do not view LGBTQ plus relationships as being consonant with their own personal values, will such people be cancelled from expressing their view? Will the expression of their views, say as religious views, for example, be considered to be acts of hatred and discrimination? In explaining my own vote today, I would like to address both these issues in turn. Before I do so, I would like to record my thanks to the Leader of the Opposition for lifting the whip in this debate and thus allowing Workers' Party MPs to speak and vote according to their conscience and deeply held values. Workers' Party MPs do have a majority view, but I support the right of each MP to vote according to their conscience on ret retaining or repealing 377A as a moral marker. So you don't get an issue that is more entwined with conscience than this. Yet, as I said earlier, no one in WP is calling for 377A to be actively enforced. Mr. Speaker, so I'd like to move on to my own view on repealing 377A. I support the repeal. First, I would like to talk about the rightful place of the law in policing private acts between consenting adults. My own view is that there is a public sphere where the law has the right to intervene in private behaviour that has public consequences. 
even when that private behaviour is consensual on the part of all participants. For example, we have the offence of statutory rape where sex with a minor is criminalised. The minor may have consented, but the law recognises that the minor does not have the maturity to meaningfully consent. And I agree with this. Most of us would. But my own view is that the law has no place to intervene in private behaviour among truly consenting adults, provided there is no other public consequence thrown up. So I've received feedback from a number of Singaporeans, including my own constituents, who believe that consenting LGBTQ plus relationships do, do have such public implications. For example, some have made points about public health, some about our ability to reproduce as a nation, some about the undesirability of importing liberal values from the West, and so on. However, let's recall, this is a debate about keeping or throwing out 377A as a symbolic marker, not about actively enforcing it, where there is no disagreement. If we retain 377A as a symbolic marker, should we also introduce other laws into the statute books as symbolic markers without enforcement, such as, for example, for illustrative purposes, laws encouraging healthier sexual behaviour, or laws encouraging Singaporeans to have enough children to lift our total fertility rate, or laws to oppose liberal cultural ideas. I do not think we should, and I do not believe anyone is calling for this. Therefore, by the same token, there is a case to repeal 377A as unnecessary, because symbolic markers are not inserted into our body of laws for other issues of importance. And also because free and respectful conversation about symbolic markers can and should continue completely independently of the law and criminal penalties. Such respectful conversations have a place. I shall return to this in the later part of my speech. There are other better ways to register our views on matters of conscience, ways that are pursued outside of the realm of laws and criminal penalties. So my next argument for supporting a review of 377A, a repeal of 377A, sorry, is that retaining a law that is not actively enforced based on the word of the government of the day is unsatisfactory and dangerous. No doubt the current government has declared that it will not proactively enforce a future government and AGC to reverse its stance. More importantly, a future government and AGC to reverse its stance. More importantly, such an approach to the law, in my mind, places too much power in the hands of the government and AGC to decide what laws should be enforced and what laws should absolutely not be enforced. It leaves too much to prosecutorial discretion and too little to the rightful province of Parliament in making these laws and the courts to interpret them. To keep a law that has a serious impact on the lives of many Singaporeans on the basis that it is a marker but will not be enforced by the current government is not, in my opinion, how we should go about making good laws. Markers can be created and conveyed respectfully in other ways without incorporating them into our laws. Which brings me to the last part of my speech on 377A, the part that addresses the subtext. Will removing 377A mean that in the wider society, those of a religious persuasion or who are otherwise persuaded cannot express their views freely about LGBTQ plus relationships which may be proscribed in religious faith. So the freedom of religion is protected under our constitution. Article 15 protects the right of each Singaporean to profess, practice and propagate their religion. Freedom of speech is also protected by Article 14.1 of our constitution. In making these arguments about 377A, I also want to make another argument. Those who question LGBTQ relationships on the grounds of religion or other considerations rooted in personal conviction should be free to express their views respectfully. As I said earlier, the mainstream of opinion among Singaporeans who want to retain 377A is not to call for its active enforcement and not to condone bullying or discrimination against LGBTQ individuals of any kind. This is a huge point in favour of the common ground, the strong middle in this debate. And I would argue that as the mirror image of that, those who question LGBTQ relationships on the grounds of religious faith or deep personal conviction should have the freedom to espouse their views respectfully, making clear that they regard everyone equally as a citizen, but they hew to their deep personal convictions on this matter. They should not be cancelled. They should not be demonised. To criticise a choice someone makes in their personal life is not tantamount to criticising 
denigrating or disenfranchising that person. But this depends, of course, on how that criticism is made. I recognize that. Already as it stands, some religious teachings do constitute criticisms of certain acts not deemed illegal. Likewise, those of a different persuasion, those who believe in LGBTQ equality, have the right to respectfully criticize opposing views. Is such respectful speech where we agree to disagree even possible? I will return to this topic in the last part of my speech today. Before I leave the subject of repealing 377A, Mr. Speaker, so I must say that it is my personal conviction that every individual should be treated equally regardless of sexual orientation. <coughs> Why? I personally believe that the principles of equality, equality and fairness demand this. I say that as those are rational principles, but I also say that as a human being with the emotional makeup that that entails. As a human being, I close my eyes and imagine if I lived in a world what, where what I deeply feel and who I love are held to be fundamentally wrong by many or most of my fellow human beings, are at odds with the social mores I see everywhere around me, reflected in the media, culture, education, religion. I imagine being in that place. The pain that comes from that sharp disconnect between the inner life and the outer reality cannot be described in words easily. That inequality needs to be addressed. So I would like to move on now to the amendment to the Constitution. So this amendment to the Constitution, which has been tabled today, holds that Parliament has the right to decide on the definition of marriage. I see no reason to disagree with this. On a matter such as the definition of marriage, which is deeply cultural, a law should be made democratically by the people of Singapore, whose voice Parliament reflects. Such laws should be made by the legislature, which is accountable to the people directly, and not by the courts, which have no such direct accountability. So the Workers' Party Chair, MP Ms. Sylvia Lim, has made some important arguments about why this amendment is unsatisfactory, in a sense redundant, and sets a bad precedent. I agree with the points she has made, which come from a good lawyer's understanding of constitutional law, and I say this as a non-lawyer. Nevertheless, as a legislator, I believe that the amendment does signify a correct principle, one I agree with, and I believe that it is a useful signifier to establish. However imperfect the mechanism and wording of it may be on grounds of legal scholarship. So I support it on that basis. Mr. Speaker, sir, in conclusion, where do we go from here? How can we move forward as one united people, as a democratic society? Surely the answer to that question is to cultivate the ability for Singaporeans to talk to each other respectfully and rationally, to decide on important matters that way, to decide our politics that way, to decide our laws that way, to agree to disagree that way, when perfect consensus cannot be forged, as it cannot on a range of issues, not only 377A. For example, in this house, we debated the issue of hiking GST versus alternative revenue raising mechanisms that the Workers' Party put forward. We did not find consensus, but there were, all, but there were points of agreement. But in that GST debate, the debate turned on rational argument and ultimately philosophic considerations of a secular nature. Here, the debate comes down to matters of deep personal conviction that are less easily resolved with reference to agreed facts. Will we succeed in cultivating the ability to respectfully disagree on such matters where much of the rest of the world has failed? Will we succeed in preserving our unity and not allowing these disagreements that are so hard to resolve by debate to become political rifts? Sir, we will not. Not completely and not by making straight line progress. These views are very deeply rooted and passionate on both sides. But can we succeed in moving the needle towards this ideal so that more and more and more of our national discourse gradually becomes like this? Not in a straight line, maybe a zigzag, messy line, but moving more and more towards a dominant paradigm that says that we can respectfully agree to disagree. And tomorrow, we will still be fellow Singaporeans still be brothers and sisters, still defend the political centre and push those spewing hatred, bigotry and violence to the fringes? Can we hold different views that may never be reconciled and have those views respectfully played out in civil discourse, bearing in mind the place of our laws and the place of freedom of speech and religion in a healthy balance, bearing in mind that we are all 
citizens equal before the law. Can we move forward by respectfully agreeing to disagree without demonizing the one we disagree with, but embracing him and her as our fellow citizen, our colleague, our brother and our sister? Can we do this, sir? I think we must. I don't know for a fact that we can or will, but I do know this. From my discussions I've had with my Workers' Party colleagues who have expressed or will express different views from mine in Parliament today on 377A, I would like to say that I am optimistic that Singapore can do it. Why? Because my colleagues and I strive together for a democratic society. We work alongside each other. And on this issue, we debated, discussed, learned from one another, agreed to disagree with respect and humility and affection, and we decided democratically. Thank you. Mr. Lim Biao Chuan. So in 2007, when nominated MP Mr. Siu Kam Hong petitioned to repeal Section 377A of the Penal Code, I spoke to support the government's position of retaining Section 377A. I argue that Parliament should make laws to reflect the public morality of our times. The messaging by the government is important that Singapore is a society whereby the family unit is still seen as a basic structure of society. Further, the government had indicated that there will not be proactive enforcement of those who are gays. At the time, PM Lee had said that the government has decided to keep the status quo despite the legal untidiness and the ambiguity. PM Lee said, it works, do not disturb it. It works, do not disturb it. Thus, 15 years later, when PM Lee made his announcement during the, Nat the National Day rally in August that the government intends to repeal Section 377A of the Penal Code, I was taken aback. What is the intended signal by the government when it announced its intention to repeal this law? How do we explain to the many Singaporeans who are still pro-family and worried about the potential decline in family values? I spoke to many Singaporeans who expressed their concern about the repeal. Many of them said they do not wish to see homosexuals being prosecuted as criminals. But yet, yet they are concerned whether the repeal will lead to an erosion of family values and an increased number of gay people. And I believe many MPs in this House have received letters from concerned residents who express similar concerns. To keep an open mind about this issue, I also spoke to different groups of citizens who felt that we should allow those who are homosexuals to live the lifestyle that they wish. They opine that it is not the government's business to tell our citizens, especially those who are gays, how to lead their lives. While some express concern about the open expression of homosexual relationship, like hands holding and public kissing, they felt that, this, that there is no need to make this behaviour a criminal offence. Hence, it appears that the advocacy by the homosexual community over the years has made our citizens more accepting of the gay people. There are also a number of citizens who felt very neutral about the matter. They have no views on the issue at all. In other words, it is not their concern. So in 2007, I had said that the majority of Singaporeans do not condemn a homosexual or a gay simply because of his lifestyle, nor do they wish to criminalise a homosexual. Minister Indrani Raja, when she was a backbencher, had also in her speech said, I think we do not want to have a situation where we demonise homosexuals. We certainly do not want to regard them as anything less than Singaporeans. The government stand at that time was articulated by PM Lee when he said, there are gay bars and clubs. They exist. We know where they are. Everybody knows where they are. They do not have to go underground. We do not harass gays. The government does not act as moral policemen, and we do not act proactively enforce Section 377A on them. Since the government does not actively enforce Section 377A on homosexuals, the question is whether it is time for Singapore to repeal Section 377A today. Is the Singapore society more accepting of homosexuals in our midst? Will the repeal of Section 377A mean that the family is no longer the basic building block of society. 
Sir, the introduction of Article 156 relating to the institution of marriage has given me great comfort. It reinforces the government's stand that the definition of marriage and laws to protect, safeguard, support, foster and promote the institution of marriage should be for Parliament to decide. And that Parliament's, and that Parliament's power to make such laws on marriage cannot be challenged under, Article, under Part 4 of the Constitution to be discriminatory. It gives assurance to many Singaporeans that the repeal of Section 377A will not lead to a drastic shift in societal norms. So I'm also heartened by the commitment made by PM Lee and DPM Lawrence Wong that there will not be any change in the definition of marriage during their watch. So after speaking to many Singaporeans across a wide spectrum, I've concluded that it is time to repeal Section 377A. Many Singaporeans have accepted that homosexuals are fellow Singaporeans living in our midst and doing their part to contribute to Singapore. Societal norms have changed over the years. In particular, many of the younger generation are accepting of the homosexual people. And similar to the position of many Singaporeans, which I alluded to 15 years ago, we do not wish to see homosexuals being criminalised. But the message that I heard from many Singaporeans is that we need to protect marriage as a union between men and women that we need to support values that promote the role of the family as a basic building block of society, that we need to protect Singaporeans from being intimidated or harassed simply because they disagree with the lifestyle of the gay community. Many within the religious community are also concerned whether the repeal of Section 377A would lead to a situation whereby the religious leaders cannot tell their congregation that they do not agree with the practice of homosexuality. The religious leaders are concerned that they cannot pray for someone who is homosexual to reflect on God's command. In other words, the religious leaders lose their freedom to preach on what is acceptable or wrong based on their faith. And that's their concern. So there are also many who can express concern about the intolerant views of some gays who attack anyone who disagree with their homosexual views. There are fears about the activism of some of the LGBT community who push their ideology that their worldview should be seen as a norm and acceptable. Therefore, anyone who disagrees with their worldview should be condemned and ostracised. In Australia, when the government held a poster poll on same-sex marriage, it resulted in vitriolic abuse against people holding views in opposition to the legalisation of same-sex marriage. An Australian politician said, a culture has developed whereby it is acceptable to vilify, mock, abuse and shame anyone who stands in a way or even raises questions about whether we should legalise same-sex marriage. I've been called a homophobe, a bigot. I have been told that my views are disgusting, so said the Australian politician. And when such strong and intimidating language is used, it is impossible to hold a civil debate or respectful discussion about any topic regarding the gay community. So I met with the organisers of the Protect Singapore Town Hall. They told me that their town hall meeting was almost cancelled because of complaints and threats by the gay community. So they complained that the minority in the gay movement are refusing to allow anyone to have a conversation about their concerns regarding homosexuality. So I think this is sad because many homosexuals that I know are very decent people and I have deep respect for such people because their sexual preference is really not an issue to me. But because of this small minority of militant homosexuals, they give the others a bad name by being bullies and by being difficult in their conduct. So I've also received feedback that employees in international organisations or MNCs located within Singapore, they are harassed in their workplace if they do not support the gay beliefs or if they refuse to attend a Pride event. Thus, it seems that there is a reversal of role. It is not the gays who are being discriminated in Singapore. On the contrary, if you do not agree with the pro-gay movement, you may be penalised at work or face discrimination. And likewise, for students studying in international schools, they are asked to take part in gay team projects as if it was part and parcel of the school curriculum. So I urge the government to look into this to ensure that no organisation 
company or school in Singapore com can compel their staff or students to participate in gay community projects if they do not subscribe to the same values. I submit that every organisation, company or school must have the scope to allow their employees or students to subscribe to different views on sexuality without being discriminated or having to receive hate mail. I also urge the government to consider legislation to make it an offence for anyone to put out hate messages or derogatory comments just purely to intimidate others into keeping silent. And this law should apply equally to those who are anti-gay and those gays who seek to bully others into silent submission. So there should be no space for, Singapore, for people to propagate hate messages within Singapore. Let me say that again. There should be no space for people to propagate hate messages within Singapore. Even as we move to repeal Section 377A, I hope the government will also make, it, make clear its stand that our policies on sexuality education in schools, our content guidelines for publications, for video games and various types of media will remain pro-family. That, that we will not see a prol proliferation of materials, video games or media advertisements promoting the gay lifestyle. That we will not have laws that allow individuals to remove their gender in their NRIC or passport. And that the government will remind all organisations, companies and even embassies operating in Singapore that we are still a society that values family as a building block of society. So I support the repeal of Section 377A of the Penal Code and the amendment to the Constitution to insert Article 156 to the Constitution. Thank you. Order. I propose to take a break now. I suspend the sitting and we'll take the chair at 4.55pm. Order. Order.
Order. Resumption of debate on the Constitution of the Republic of Singapore, Amendment Number no. 3, Bill, Second Reading. Mr. Gerald Yam. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the government has decided to repeal Section 377A of the Penal Code. Since these plans were first revealed, many Aljunied GRC residents have reached out to me to express their views about this issue. Residents spoke to me during my house-to-house -house visits, came to my Meet the People sessions, sent me WhatsApp messages, emails and petitions, and wrote detailed letters explaining their arguments. Several invited me to their homes, where they gathered their friends and family to passionately express their concerns and urged me to raise them in Parliament. These included representations from members of the LGBT community who see Section 377A as a law that discriminates against them and victimises them, and who support its repeal. I acknowledge these sentiments as they cut to the core of who members of the LGBT community see themselves. My constituents' feedback can be grouped into several, sometimes overlapping, categories. First, there are concerns that the repeal of Section 377A will remove an important societal marker and open the door to an erosion of traditional values in our society. Second, some are worried that after this law is repealed, there will be a domino effect on other regulations and policies leading towards a normalisation of homosexuality in our society, from changes to sexuality education in schools to more liberal media portrayals and eventually the legalisation of same-sex marriage. Third, many, especially those from the younger age groups, are concerned that as the societal narrative shifts, they will find it harder to freely express their own beliefs without being labelled as homophobic. They worry about getting cancelled or suffering discrimination in school or at the workplace because of their beliefs. Fourth, some have expressed concerns that the higher health risks of some types of sexual practices are not being adequately communicated to young people for fear of, being sound, of sounding discriminatory. Fifth, others are worried that the disruption to the current equilibrium will lead to an increase in advocacy by groups on both sides and spark the type of culture wars seen in other nations, which will present challenges to Singapore's national cohesion. Sixth, some have argued that the LGBT community is already disadvantaged by the laws that support the heteronormative family and that repealing Section 377A does not confer any tangible disadvantages on those who oppose the change. These residents are of the view that Section 377A should be repealed. Seventh, residents on both sides of the debate have cited the need to live and let live and call for greater tolerance of different views. These are diverse and often opposing positions on what is clearly a very controversial issue. Those at one, of the, one end of the spectrum rule the day that this marker is removed, while those on the other see it as one of the many social changes they wish to see in our country. I have also noticed a large middle ground which does not have strong opinions on this issue and is more concerned about bread and butter issues. There is, in fact, some agreement on both sides of the divide. Both agree that Section 377A bears sim significant symbolic weight in our society. They both also anticipate that the repeal of Section 377A will open the door to many more challenges to the prevailing norms in our society. These are all valid concerns and sincere feedback expressed by Singaporeans, all of whom have the interests of our nation at heart. They included young, middle-aged and older Singaporeans. Listening to constituents on both sides of this contentious debate presented challenges for me on how to raise them both in this House. I see it as my responsibility as a Member of Parliament to reflect the feedback and concerns of my constituents in this House. However, as an elected representative, I will also need to take a stand and vote on these bills. My vote will be based first and foremost on what I believe is in the best long-term interest of our nation. This will take into account, this will take into consideration the viewpoints of my constituents and my own conscience. Mr. Deputy Speaker, it is my sincere belief that retaining Section 377A without enforcing it provides the best balance of the conflicting interests in our society. I've come to agree with the Prime Minister with what the Prime Minister said in Parliament on, on 23rd October 2007 
when he explained that the government was retaining Section 377A but not proactively enforcing it. This was, to quote the Court of Appeal, a political compromise that, were con that was conceived with the express intention of accommodating divergent interests, avoiding polarisation and facilitating incremental change. Attorney General Lucien Wong took further steps in 2018 by noting that the police will not proactively enforce Section 377A, for instance, by conducting enforcement raids. He added that the public prosecutor has taken the position that prosecution of two consenting adults in a private space, in a private place under sec three, Section 377A, absent other factors, would not be in the public interest. This assurance was strengthened when the Court of Appeal ruled in February 2022 that Section 377A is unenforceable in its entirety unless and until the pro public prosecutor of the day provides clear notice that he intends to reassert his right to enforce Section 377A proactively by way of prosecution and will no longer abide by the representations made by Attorney General Wong in 2018. Section 377A is therefore no longer a sort of Damocles hanging over men in same-sex relationships. They will not be prosecuted or convicted under Section 377A for consensual sexual acts done in private. Furthermore, Section 377A has never criminalised same-sex attraction between men or same-sex relations between women. The final reason for the vote I am about to cast is that my conscience does not allow me to vote in favour of a repeal of Section 377A. I am grateful to the Leader of the Opposition for lifting the whip on Workers' Party MPs for a vote on, this, on both these bills. This permits WP MPs to cast conscious votes on these bills. Sir, I entered politics almost 14 years ago because I wanted to contribute to the democratic development of our country and propose policies that would improve the welfare of our people. It is important to me and the example that I set for my children that I hold fast to the values that I have established to be true without wavering because of political headwinds. While some, especially those in the LGBT community and many of my friends, residents, party members and volunteers may strongly disagree with my position. I hope that they will accept that these are my sincerely held values, which I am trying my best to uphold. My vote is not an attack on their values, nor a diminishing of their humanity in any way. Some have criticised me for allowing my faith to inform my vote in Parliament, arguing that the two should be kept separate. However, what one member, informed by their faith and conscience, believed to be in the best interest of the country in some issues may differ from what another member believes. This issue is certainly one of them. I have been told in my face by a constituent that he will not vote for me in the future because of my stand on this issue. I accept the importance that many Singaporeans place on their elected MPs' positions on these bills to the extent that it would be a factor in their decisions at the polls. However, I hope Singaporeans will consider the broader issues at hand. There are too many important issues that affect the lives of Singaporeans for one's vote to be decided based on this single issue. Mr Deputy Speaker, this has been one of the most difficult speeches to prepare. I was worried I might come across as prejudiced against members of the LGBT community. Hand on heart, I am not. LGBT persons are, are, are human beings worthy of the same amount of love and respect that we accord to any other person. Many are our family members, friends, colleagues and fellow Singaporeans. Disagreeing with LGBT positions is not an attack on LGBT persons. In fact, I hope that my speech will open up a platform for more difficult but respectful conversations on this issue. However, we must recognise that LGBT issues are sensitive issues, just like race and religion. People who subscribe to one faith do not force their beliefs on others. Religious beliefs are also not taught as facts in our school curriculum that students are expected to accept without question. Similarly, we should treat LGBT issues as sensitive topics, just like religion. We should not force people to accept one view or another, with the risk of being labelled as bigoted or immoral. This is not to say that the issue should not be discussed at all. On the contrary, 
discussion should be encouraged, but as a balanced discussion on different viewpoints, not as a lesson on facts. It is inherent in a society as diverse as Singapore's that there will be fundamental differences in values and worldviews among our people. This need not be a source of conflict. While we may disagree on some issues, there are so many other issues that we agree on and can work together to advance. We do not need to descend into labelling, name-calling, or questioning the worth of our fellow human beings. Instead, we need to open up spaces for our people to hold different views at work, in schools, and even within families. By looking beyond our differences and working together on what we have in common, we will build that better society we all aspire towards. Mr Deputy Speaker, I will vote against the Penal Code Amendment Bill and vote for the Constitutional Amendment Bill. SPS Bay Yam King. Mr Deputy Speaker, Prime Minister of Luxembourg, Xavier Battelle, Deputy Prime Minister of New Zealand, Grant Murray Robertson, father of theoretical computer science and artificial intelligence, Alan Turing, Apple CEO, Tim Cook, Olympians, swimmer, Yen Top, diver, Tom Daly, poet and playwright, Oscar Wao, actor, Sir Yen McKellen, local theatre director and actor, Ivan Hing, singer-songwriters, Sir Elton John, Ricky, Ma Ricky Martin, George Michael and Freddie Mercury. Freddie Mercury. These individuals are some notable men in the fields of government and politics, science and technology, business, sports, arts and entertainment, who are openly gay. These examples do not mean any direct correlation between their sexual orientation and their talent or achievements. There are many people who just happened to be gay, who have made contributions to the society in their own way, whether in their profession, whether in their profession or just as individuals. These are people who walk among us every day. They are our friends, our family members, our colleagues and our peers. They should not be treated any lesser for what they would like to do in private. We need to be inclusive of different lifestyles just as we like to have the choice and freedom to lead our private life in peace. The repeal of Section 377A is the right thing to do if we are to ensure that Singapore is an inclusive and diverse place to live in and for everyone to be part of. I spoke in 2007 in support of a repeal that was 23 years after the last review of the Penal Code. I said then that I hope we wouldn't take another 23 years to address this again. I'm glad that our government made this decision today. Over the last 15 years, public sentiment has evolved. There is a shift away from our previous views, especially more evident among the young. They feel there is injustice, that there are penalties targeted specifically at sexual acts between men. On the reinforcement of the institution of marriage by the amendment in the Constitution, I welcome it. It signals the pro-family stance of the current government and population. It is also the right thing to allow the definition of marriage to continue to be covered by the Women's Charter. If and when the majority of our population or parliament feels that the current definition needs to change, that should be for our future generation to decide. It is important that the provisions and any amendments in the Constitution are carefully considered, otherwise it loses its value through capriciousness and constant changes. Mr. Deputy Speaker, now in Mandarin. Nianzangoran, 
和三个表兄弟在成长中所发生的爱情故事。这反映了那个年代人们喜欢亲上加亲，无论是媒妁之言，或者是指腹为婚。现在大家对基因科学的认识提高了。明白，如果亲近结婚，明白如果近亲结婚，会大幅度的提高隐形遗患、遗传病的并发率，加大孩子畸形的几率。白居易的一首诗：“后宫佳丽三千人，三千宠爱在一身。”古代的皇上没有受一夫一妻的制度。古代的皇上没有受一夫一妻的限制，皇帝不仅有东宫和西宫，其实我们我们不不需要追追溯到皇朝时代。我的祖父和外公虽然不是什么达官显贵或者富家子弟，但都娶了两个老婆。现在当然这是犯法的。历史这两个例子呢，提醒我们。很多生活习俗，甚至国家法律，都会随着世界的观、社会的观点或科学的进步而演变，可以经历几百、几千年，也可能是数十载、数十载或短短几年。这次的宪法修改将保护目前的婚姻定义，其他和婚姻与家庭有关的国家政策也保持不变。可是，现有的一男一女的婚姻定义。将根据将继续根据妇女宪章。换句话说，如果有一天超过半数的国会议员同意修改妇女宪章，扩扩大婚姻的定义，那将会是新的法律，不需要像修改宪法一样必须得到三分之二的支持票。这是民主制度的运作。我们这一代不应该。也没有权利在这个人终身幸福的课题上把门槛抬高，不让下一代为自己做出法律决定。我有几位朋友是同性恋者，我从来没有用异样眼眼光看待他们。他们当中有专业人士，从事各行各业，有些跟一个同性伴侣在一起几十年了。感情专一，有些热心公益，为社会、为社区做出贡献。有些国人可能没有直接认识或接触过同性恋者，但我相信大家应该听过这些名字：台湾作家白先勇、金马奖最佳导演蔡明亮、香港电影导演关锦鹏、云门云门舞集创始人林怀民。香港歌手黄耀明、张国荣、写词人林夕，和香港著名越剧名伶任建辉，他们都是华族文化艺术和华人娱乐界家喻户晓的人物。他们的才华为我们提供了多少的精神粮食和欢乐消遣，也拥有无数个忠实读者、观众、歌迷。和粉丝，他们都公认承认，他们是同性恋者。他们生活在较保守传统的东方社会，相信从认识到自己的性取向，接受自己是喜欢同性，到公开出柜，接受公众的眼光，甚至是批判。相信都经历了很大的挣扎，拿出了巨大的勇气。我们如果喜欢读他们写的小说，唱他们填的歌词，听他们的歌曲，观赏他们的舞台作品、他们的电影作品，却要用法律来管制他们的私生活，不让他们和心爱的人亲热，我们。是不是太自私、太过分了？所以，我支持我国废除《刑事法典》第三七七 A 节条文条文，不再把男性之间的性行为
视为刑事罪行。I'll continue in English. People's views and social norms do change over time. In the past, it was unusual for men to wear earrings, remove body hair, or perm their hair. For women to wear skirts that do not extend below their knees, or for anyone except gangsters to have tattoos. Now we see these expressions of individuality frequently in our everyday lives. We should not tie our future generations to be restricted by today's traditions and norms. Instead, we should advocate for more freedom to, for them to decide how they want to live their lives. It is difficult to predict how society will change in the future and how our children and grandchildren decide to govern themselves then. It is important that members of Singapore's LGBTQ community are not discriminated for choosing how they want to live their lives and for who they love. Nevertheless, changes in public perception will take place, take time, and we will act accordingly if and when these sentiments are ripe. Today, we are addressing an act of intimacy, in this case for men with men. Just like any other kind of relationship, let us continue to maintain discretion in the public display of affections. Therefore, the advocacy of specific rights before our society is ready may do more harm than good. We aim to be more progressive, but we must ensure that our direction and steps are carefully considered. Today, we are taking a step towards a more tolerant and inclusive Singapore. We are debating on the issue of the freedom to love. Let us continue to keep the love for everyone in Singapore's society. I support the repeal of Section 377A and the amendment of the Constitution to protect the prevailing definition of marriage. Thank you. Mr. Alex Yam. Mr. Speaker, sir, this is a debate that I have thought long and hard about. It's an issue close to my heart and also to many conservative Singaporeans at large. 377A has been a key flashpoint of debate on societal norms, traditional values, freedom, equality, and many other topics. This very House has also seen many a fiery and passionate debate over the last two decades on this issue. In our courts, it has witnessed a share of constitutional challenges as no other law perhaps has seen. And it is with the most recent challenge in the courts that has brought us here today. For many, Section 377A represents a bulwark against a perceived countercultural tide that may engulf society should the law be done away. This has held true for many years, in particular the last 15 following the political compromise of 2007. But it was an uneasy compromise, as each constitutional challenge risked it being struck down by the courts rather than legislated by Parliament. By not proactively enforcing 377A, also in essence made it redundant as a law. At this point, it's worth noting that for most Conservatives, opposition to the repeal of 377A is premised not on the Act nor the Actus itself, but what the repeal may lead to, what I alluded to earlier, of that tide, a slippery slope of what they view as same-sex unions, adoptions and surrogacy by same-sex couples becoming the norm. Recent interviews with Apex religious leaders in the media show that it remains a complex issue. However, they do acknowledge that the prerogative of repeal lies <coughs> with Parliament, as long as the rights of the religious are protected in what they believe in and what they can preach. As a par parliamentarian, my public duty is to make laws that are for all Singaporeans. But I'm not just a legislator. As other members have mentioned, we are guided by our culture, our faith, and who are now the environment that we grow up in. I am a Catholic by faith, guided by the teachings of my faith to discern with justice decisions that are moral. 
I am also a father and a husband whose moral duty it is to ensure stability and the well-being for my children and family. So I arrive at today's debate having wrestled with all my roles and responsibilities. I also arrive having had the opportunity over the last few months to have robust, intense and passionate discussions with fellow legislators on this topic and many constituents and Singaporeans who have corresponded with me and feel passionately about this issue on both sides. I am deeply appreciative of the willingness of all sides of the debate to have listened rationally and respectfully to each other to arrive at common ground. Mr Deputy Speaker, let me first speak on the constitutional amendment and I will state what I believe marriage to be. Marriage is a bond that draws man and woman together. It's a natural relationship framed not just by love but promises of commitment and responsibility. <coughs> Marriage aligns with the way in which man and woman live interdependently and bring out the best in each other. Marriage is also a faithful, exclusive, lifelong union of a man and a woman joined in an intimate community. It is the bedrock of families and conversely, society as well. A man and woman commit themselves to each other for better, for worse, to the wondrous responsibility of bringing children into the world and caring for them. The call to marriage is also woven deeply into how society works, into the human spirit itself. Man and woman, of course, are equal, but, however, are created differently, but made for each other. This sexual difference draws them together in a mutually loving union that should always be open to family. Therefore, erasing the connection between gender and marriage changes the fundamental nature of a marital union which is to nurture society's next generation. Unlike the other relationships, marriage has the potential to create and nurture new lives and making it a unique institution. For these reasons, states recognize the marriage of a man and woman as a public institution in its laws. Marriage is protected and honored because it makes an exclusive and indispensable influence over the common good of society. The real problem today is a view that marriage is simply a formality or a fad with no social obligations, that is just a private and personal decision between two persons with nothing to do with wider society. But marriage is not just a religious or cultural institution. It is a legal institution as well. In a heterosexual marriage, by bringing children into society, the state has an obligation towards the couple and their children. For this reason, Marriage requires the state to intervene and regulate it because of the social implications. If it's just a relationship between two ordinary people, we don't regulate ordinary friendship or even platonic friendships. Mr Deputy Speaker, in preparing for this debate, I was cautioned by quite a number of people that to speak against redefinition of marriage signifies perhaps a failure to keep up with the times that those of us who hold on to the traditional definition of marriage are conservative and old-fashioned, out of touch with reality. Yet earlier this year, a poll did find that the majority of Singaporeans oppose same-sex marriage. Some 66% also agreed with a proposal to perhaps consider enshrining marriage as only between a man and a woman. Those who share these sentiments are called out online accused of blind prejudice, of being bigots. In fact, I accept, as many members have alluded to, that in taking a stand about this, I and other members open ourselves to disagreement by others, strong disagreement at times. I appreciate, therefore, this opportunity for a respectful debate in this House, because in a democracy, it is important that the viewpoints of all citizens can be heard and taken into consideration. I do support the constitutional amendment, but as some would be aware, I would have preferred to push for heterosexual marriage to be enshrined or codified as a fundamental liberty in our constitution. Yet I acknowledge that that same high bar for constitutional amendment in the future would apply to defining marriage in the constitution right now. And as much as the current amendment would not be considered equivalent to enshrining marriage, it offers a clear definition of marriage as it currently stands, as a union between a man and a woman. I hold the government to its word that under its watch, 
that no redefinition of marriage will take place. And even, a fut even if a future government does so, it would perhaps require repeal of this Article 156 that we are introducing, as it would be made redundant. I therefore seek the government's continued affirmation that this remains its commitment. And this being the year of celebrating family, perhaps all the more apt that we collectively pass this amendment and affirm marriage and the family and their place in our society. With the passing of the constitutional amendment, the task is not complete. There is added impetus on multiple fronts. The task ahead will require a whole of society effort to emphasize the importance of marriage and the family, not just on the part of the government, but for every individual and group that believes in the importance of marriage and family and to champion it collectively. Our laws that uphold a family and marriage, especially on spousal rights, must be re-emphasized. Education, that key leveller for society that's widely available for all in Singapore, must continue to ensure that our curricula continues to uphold the current definition of marriage and family. And in the media space, print and in broadcast, must also help to shape the norms as currently established. Mr. Speaker, now let me touch on the operational aspect of the amendment. The amendment as it stands in Article 156 spells out that the government cannot be challenged in court over the definition of marriage. What I hope the government will help to clarify is the protection of non-government entities from legal challenges over the issue of marriage in the public sphere. Rightfully, our government is secular and must remain so. It does not base its laws or policies on religion or faith. But Singapore is also a multi-religious and multi-racial society. We built this city on our Asian values, culture and traditions. Many citizens' beliefs and way of life are shaped in line with their religious and cultural beliefs. Singaporeans must feel free and safe to practice their beliefs without fear of backlash as long as their own actions do not cause harm or danger to others. So what protections are there to ensure that businesses and other institutions, such as religious organisations, are freed from legal challenges regarding teachings and beliefs on marriage? For example, if a religious institution declines to conduct a ceremony for a transgender or same-sex couple, will they be subject to a lawsuit? There are many other implications and I hope that the government would be able to clarify this. Mr Deputy Speaker, I now move on to the repeal of Section 377A of the Penal Code. This is a decision that I struggled deeply over the last few months, personally and professionally. I made the point earlier on the role of Section 377A as a bulwark. If we do pass Article 156, and pass it we must, I am of the belief that the new gate, perhaps not as robust as what uh, many perceive 377A itself to be, but the gate nonetheless will now be in place. As I have made clear earlier, the non-enforcement of 377A has made the law itself redundant. Parliament alone therefore should be responsible for the passing amendment and repeal of all laws, and she states that right clearly today, rather than wait for the courts to strike it down. As such, I am prepared to support the repeal of 377A with the passage of the constitutional amendment. I must also emphasize that I am not unsympathetic to the experiences of rejection, violence and vilification that the LGBTQ plus community faces. I know many of them and I'm honored to enjoy the friendship of many as well. I am also aware of the targeting of religious and social conservatives online by trolls and those opposed to their views on traditional marriage and family. We must therefore come down hard on discrimination in all its forms, in the workplace, in schools, in the public sphere. We should treat bullying and harassment seriously, be they in the physical or virtual spaces, for all parties in this debate. We must endeavour to build a more equal society for all, not just for one. Because whatever the label applied to each of us, we must first acknowledge the wholeness and dignity 
of each person as an individual being. I acknowledge as well the passion and drive that the LGBTQ plus community has displayed over the years in their effort to repeal Section 377A. Many members of the community and their allies are measured, responsible and aware of the complexity of the issue in our society. While we break down this barrier in what is in the private sphere, I continue to believe strongly that this must not lead to the breakdown of the institution of marriage in the public sphere. Mr Deputy Speaker, I welcome the constitutional amendment as an affirmation of the role and importance of traditional marriage and family in shaping our society. I fully acknowledge as well that the view may evolve in the distant future. But for now, we have an opportunity in this House to ensure that the institution of marriage endures and is championed and celebrated. On the basis of the passage of Article 156, I also give my support for the repeal of 377A. After the conclusion of all our debate, we must return to working together. Unity is not the absence of disagreement, but a consensus to agree to work together in spite of those disagreements. Mr Deputy Speaker, I support both bills. Thank you. Dr Vivian Balakrishnan. Mr. Deputy Speaker, this is clearly not a matter of foreign policy, but since my wife and I celebrate our 35th anniversary today, and thank you, and I'm the proud parent of four children and four grandchildren, I thought this was a debate which I sought the opportunity to share some personal perspectives and that of my residents. I start with three propositions. Traditional marriage has been venerated in all societies, all civilizations since time immemorial. First point. Second, a marriage is far more than a legally binding contract between two consenting adults. Third, the rights of children, in fact, are paramount. And in fact, trump even the mutual happiness of parents. So I start off with these three propositions for your consideration. My life was transformed the first moment I held my daughter in my arms. For the first time in my life, I held a precious, new, unique human being, utterly dependent on my wife and me. She may have been delivered by my wife, but my daughter and now her children, my grandchildren, have a future that goes, hopefully, far beyond me. That moment was also the time that I realized just how much my parents loved me. And with some guilt, I realized that actually all of us cannot possibly love our parents as much as our parents love us. And any, every single one of you here who's been a parent, I think, has had that experience. And what it shows is that love flows down the generations. It's actually mainly one way. And so parental love is really about paying it forward. And it is this focus on forward and the future and that drives us, drives all parents to give the best possible start to their children. This is what makes us so focused on leaving the world in a better state for our children to inherit. And you see, it is this focus on the future, 
on protecting, nurturing, saving, investing, building. It is this future-oriented focus that affects the tone of our society. And frankly, even in Parliament, it's why, for me, there's no such thing as saving too much for the future, because it's for them and not for us. And even as we do that, we are simply, in fact, replicating what our parents and grandparents did for us. And so this is why I believe all societies, all religions, have always conferred a sacred status on the institution of marriage. And this is why this is a key pillar, a key prescription for human progress in societies everywhere since time immemorial. The second point is that a marriage is far more than a legally binding contract between two consenting adults for the sake of their mutual happiness. My wife has often reminded me of an aphorism. The best gift you can give your children is to love their mother. Initially, I found this advice bemusing. But the more I thought about it, Actually, this advice makes perfect sense. Because you see, children, and in fact, think back to your own childhood. Children need that reassurance, that sense of stability, of knowing that both parents are in a committed, loving relationship for the long term. And that the parents, both parents, will always be there for them. So, in fact, the way we approach our marriage is not and should not be about just optimizing the happiness of two adults, but really for the sake of our children and their future. Because if we are successful and if we are blessed, then we're good role models for our children. But our mistakes or sometimes our wrong choices have profound impact and implications on our children. So my wife is right. Love the mother of your children. My third point is that every child has a biological father and mother. But it's not just a matter of biology and genes and chromosomes. But think back to your own childhood. Our mothers and our fathers played essential, complementary, but not identical roles. Complementary, but not identical roles. And when I served as minister in MCYS, and I studied the problem of children in juvenile homes or with dysfunctional social circumstances, the single most important factor I often found recurring was an absent father. And that's why one of the things which I'm proudest about was to have been one of the people behind the founding of Fathers for Life. So yes, I do believe absolutely with no apology and with no reservations in the traditional family form as an ideal. One man, one woman, committed to each other to bring up their children in the context of a stable marriage. But having said that, we also need to acknowledge that not everyone will be so blessed and enjoy such a simple, straightforward life. And that sometimes life does not go according to plan. And all children regardless of family circumstances, deserve our fullest support. In fact, some children, especially those in less ideal circumstances, deserve and need additional support, which this House agrees with, I'm sure. Some of my friends whom I've known for the longest time are gay. And 
my generation came of age in the early 80s. The AIDS epidemic had not yet been named or discovered, but it had started. And many of us were not quite aware of the threat. The veil of ignorance, the fear of embarrassment, in fact, contributed tragically to the cutting short of lives of some of my friends. But beyond that, in fact, I'm sure if you all speak to every single one of your gay friends, every single one of them has suffered the pain of rejection, of discrimination, and sometimes of violence. And they have suffered that at home, in schools, and in the workplace. They crave our understanding, our empathy, our support, and our protection. And yet, I think if many of us think back to our school days, I think we all fell short. I will confess to having fallen short. And for that, I apologize to my gay friends. Unfortunately, this debate on Section 377A of the Penal Code, you know, Section 377A has come to symbolize simultaneously two paradoxical imperatives. First, to protect the traditional family, which frankly is under considerable stress in modern days. But equally important, there is also a duty to protect our gay brothers from victimization and the fear and the pain, the dejection and the rejection. There are no simple answers to such apparently contradictory social imperatives. SMS Sim Ann and I, Deputy Speaker Mr. Christopher de Souza and Mr. Edward Chiakamp, represent the GRC of Holland, Oketima. To be frank with all of you, the majority of the feedback that we've received online and in face to face actually has. The majority have expressed great anxiety about families, <clears throat> anxiety about the repeal, and a deeper anxiety about the future of families. <clears throat> Minister Shanmugam has explained, and I accept his explanation, that Section 377A is at significant legal risk of being struck down. So the amendments proposed today to repeal 377A, I believe, helps us avoid that abrupt and potentially disruptive confrontation in a court of law with a binary outcome and with perhaps unpredictable and sometimes uncontrollable social and political consequences. So I agree with him and I support the repeal of 377A in that context. But I also support the amendment to the Constitution that makes it clear that the question of marriage will be decided here in this House. It may not be all of us in the future. It will be a different House. But it will be decided through the political process with all the engagement, discussion, debate, negotiations, and compromises which are needed. And that is the way we need to move forward. Similarly, to my residents who've asked for it to be entrenched, two-third majority and lock it up. And I have to tell them that actually these are issues which no amount of legal and constitutional lockups will decide for the future. The values, the mores, the attitudes of our children and grandchildren. We can all do our best to instill values in them, but we've got to trust them. And trust them 
and entrust them with the power and the authority to make decisions in the future. So I also accept this amendment, which makes it clear that the future definition, the current definition, and if there's going to be any future amendment, will be decided in this House and not in a court of law. We do all this in full appreciation of the fact that difficult issues that go to the heart of identity, deeply held values, and lived experience are best settled through careful, respectful, sincere discussions, without polemics, without win-lose outcomes. And so it is in this spirit that I support the amendments moved today. We have to find ways to continue to protect this precious and fragile institution of the traditional family and marriage. And we have to remember that the welfare and the rights of our children are paramount. Now, in practice, what that means is policies and programs that will unambiguously support the traditional family and parenthood, including adoption rights, housing priority, baby bonuses, reproductive therapy. It also means our public messaging, our education in schools, the mass media, must continue to uphold these traditional family ideals. But having said that, you know, in my earlier versions of the speech, I tried to say we can do all this without discrimination. But actually in life, if you uplift one form, if you prioritize one type of social arrangements, inevitably it means you have to choose and it cannot be completely equal. But having said that, I believe a spirit of mutual respect and perhaps more important than anything else, compassion can allow us to find that hopefully safe landing zone where we can protect our families and protect our gay brothers. So on that note, as the Deputy Speaker, I support the amendments standing before the House today. Thank you all very much. SPS Rahayu Mazam. Mr. Deputy Speaker, in Malay, please. Keputusan untuk memansuhkan Section 377A Kanun Kesiksaan dan meminda perlembagaan untuk melindungi definisi perkahwinan dan undang-undang serta dasar yang berasaskannya daripada cabaran undang-undang tidak dibuat dalam sekelip mata. Ia adalah hasil penglibatan meluas dengan pihak-pihak berkepentingan dan pertimbangan teliti terhadap maklum balas yang diterima. Baik sebelum pengumuman Perdana Menteri semasa rapat umum Hari Kebangsaan tahun ini dan sepanjang beberapa bulan selepasnya. Rakyat Singapura mempunyai pelbagai pandangan tentang isu ini. Setiap pihak ada perspektif unik mereka sendiri. Kebanyakan memilih untuk memelihara norma sosial yang sedia ada berkenaan perkahwinan dan keluarga yang telah memberi manfaat kepada kita sebagai sebuah masyarakat yang stabil dan makmur. Namun terdapat segolongan kecil tetapi bilangannya kian berkembang yang mempunyai pandangan yang berbeza. Ramai daripada mereka adalah daripada golongan belia yang mempunyai pendedahan dan pengalaman yang berbeza. Mereka mempunyai pandangan mereka sendiri mengenai perkara ini. Sejak kali terakhir isu ini dibahaskan di Parlimen pada tahun 2007, sikap dan pemikiran masyarakat telah berubah dan kita boleh menjangkakan ia akan terus berubah dalam dekad-dekad mendatang. Bagi pihak pemerintah, kami berusaha untuk mendapatkan kedudukan yang berhati-hati dan mengimbangi pelbagai perkara dalam isu yang sensitif dan sukar ini. Satu kedudukan yang boleh diterima oleh sebahagian besar masyarakat walaupun ia tidak memenuhi setiap keinginan mereka. Oleh itu, penting bagi kami untuk mendengar pelbagai pandangan daripada segenap lapisan masyarakat Singapura 
termasuk daripada masyarakat Melayu Islam. Saya telah turut serta dalam beberapa sesi-sesi dialog yang melibatkan badan-badan Melayu Islam mengenai hal ini. Saya faham dengan keprihatinan dan kerisauan mereka. Secara pribadi, saya juga telah mendekati pelbagai kumpulan dan ramai individu daripada masyarakat Melayu Islam kita untuk membincangkan isu ini dalam sesi-sesi perbincangan kumpulan kecil dan tidak formal. Saya ingin mengucapkan terima kasih kepada para peserta atas kejujuran dan sikap berani mereka untuk menyertai dialog-dialog ini. Saya ingin berkongsi beberapa pandangan yang telah disampaikan bagi manfaat anggota Dewan. Adanya daripada komuniti homoseksual berkongsi dengan saya tentang kisah mereka berdepan dengan diskriminasi, dipulaukan, malah diancam oleh orang yang paling rapat dengan mereka, termasuk rakan-rakan dan ahli keluarga. Tiada siapa pun patut diperlakukan sebegini, terutamanya dalam masyarakat kita, di mana keluarga dan masyarakat memainkan peranan penting dalam kehidupan seharian kita. Itulah sebabnya mengapa ada beberapa individu, walaupun mereka tidak mengamalkan gaya hidup homoseksual, merasakan kita tidak harus menyisihkan golongan ini. Mereka merasakan kita perlu bersikap terbuka, walaupun kita berbeza pandangan, supaya golongan homoseksual dapat menjalani kehidupan mereka sendiri dengan selamat. Pada masa yang sama, ada juga yang tidak menerima gaya hidup homoseksual, tetapi mahu berbincang atas dasar belas ihsan bersama mereka yang beragama Islam, khususnya mereka yang sedang bergelut dalam kesusahan. Selalunya, golongan ini tidak dapat bersuara kerana risau akan akibat buruk yang boleh melanda. Mereka bimbang tentang kritikan dan respons negatif dan keterlaluan yang mungkin timbul. Mereka bimbang dituduh terlalu konservatif sekiranya ingin menyampaikan pandangan mereka atau terlalu liberal kerana mendekati mereka yang homoseksual. Mereka juga takut dipulaukan dan diugut. Kita dapat lihat sendiri beberapa reaksi dalam talian yang amat kasar dan tidak menyenangkan. Saya juga berbincang dengan golongan belia mengenai isu ini. Ramai yang bersimpati dengan kesukaran yang dihadapi oleh rakan-rakan dan ahli keluarga yang homoseksual. Mereka sangat mengambil berat tentang kesejahteraan mental dan akses kepada sokongan sosial untuk mereka. Namun begitu, masih juga terdapat perbezaan pendapat dalam kalangan golongan belia ini tentang pemansuhan Seksyen 377A dan pindaan perlembagaan. Adanya melihat pemansuhan itu sebagai isu yang sudah lama ditangguhkan dan mempersoalkan keperluan untuk memindah perlembagaan. Yang lain, sama ada mereka berpegang kepada prinsip agama atau tidak, bimbang tentang kesan pemansuhan ini kepada norma sosial yang kita hargai dan struktur keluarga yang tradisional. Isu ini bukan isu hitam putih. Tiada satu naratif atau perspektif yang dapat mencerminkan sepenuhnya realiti yang kita jalani. Dan hanya dengan mengakui kerumitan ini, baru boleh kita mula untuk sama-sama melangkah ke hadapan sebagai sebuah masyarakat. Kita mahu masyarakat yang menunjukkan sifat rahmah dan belas ihsan kepada semua tanpa mengira latar belakang atau keadaan mereka. Termasuk juga kepada mereka yang mungkin tidak berpegang kepada ajaran agama tentang isu homoseksualiti kerana itulah ajaran Islam. Memetik kata-kata mufti dalam irsyad yang membimbing kita dengan penuh hikmah dalam perkara ini, kemanusiaan seseorang dinilai dengan banyak perkara, bukan hanya orientasi seksualiti. Terdapat individu Muslim yang mengalami kesukaran dalam menyesuaikan kecenderungan seksualiti mereka dengan panduan dan tuntutan agama. Sebagaimana... Selagi mana seseorang beriman dan akur dengan tuntutan agama, beliau masih merupakan sebahagian daripada masyarakat Islam. Setiap Muslim perlu dipelihara kehormatan dan maruahnya. Kita perlu memastikan agar setiap Muslim tidak merasa tersingkir daripada agamanya disebabkan sikap kita terhadap mereka. Kita perlu sedia hadapi bersama sebagai sebuah masyarakat cabaran masa hadapan. Keadaan ekonomi yang sukar, norma-norma masyarakat yang kian berubah, Isu-isu baru yang bakal mencabar nilai tradisional kita dan banyak lagi. Sifat dan integriti masyarakat kita akan diuji. Ini peluang kita untuk menetapkan norma-norma buat masyarakat kita. Kita mungkin berbeza pendapat, namun kita perlu cari jalan untuk meleraikan kekhususan dan pilih cara yang terbaik untuk negara kita. Pendekatan yang diambil pemerintah ini menggabung, menggabungkan ajaran agama, nilai kekeluargaan dan masyarakat tradisional dengan keperluan masyarakat berbilang agama dan budaya Singapura. 
Saya yakin sekiranya kita boleh belajar untuk mengemudi isu-isu sensitif dan penting dengan cara yang konstruktif, kita dapat membentuk wawasan yang lebih jelas untuk kita sendiri dan generasi akan datang. Semoga ini dapat membawa kita ke arah masa depan yang lebih cerah untuk kita semua sebagai sebuah negara. Thank you, Dr. Cheng Sing Ya. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I support the repeal of Section 377A of the Penal Code. As PM had said in the 2022 National Day Rally, social attitudes towards gay people have shifted appreciably, and the repeal of the provision will bring the law into line with current social mores. This is an important step towards respecting and acknowledging gay Singaporeans as an integral part of the Singapore society. The colonial law is outdated and it ignores the objective reality that Singapore is home to many gay citizens and residents who are also contributing members of the Singapore society. To retain a law that criminalises a legitimate community of fellow Singaporeans in order to preserve traditional values is at best a stretched logic. There are other better ways to promote traditional values. While the repeal of Section 377A is a major step in the right direction, we should, also, we should also ensure that public policies that affect gay Singaporeans in their everyday lives do not result in any form of stigmatisation and discrimination on a practical level. I recognise that a significant segment of the Singapore society is still very conservative. Some fear the repeal will lead to a flood of changes to the complexion of our society. I also recognise that there is an appropriate time and place for all things. However, Amending some public policies to fairly include gay Singaporeans does not equate to an erosion of the family as society's building block. Like all Singaporeans, gay citizens have everyday concerns about life and livelihoods that public policies can address without threatening the current definition of marriage. We also should be mindful that social norms change and evolve. It may not be prudent to adopt an immutable stance towards any public policies as we may find ourselves out of sync with the realities on the ground in time to come. Thus, it may be pragmatic for the government to always adopt an adaptive stance towards public policies, including policies affecting gay Singaporeans. More importantly, we must not forget that gay Singaporeans contribute economically and socially to Singapore. They are also members of Singaporean families. They should be treated as full members of our society and be accorded the respect and support like any Singapore citizen. As such, we should be careful to ensure that our public policies do not marginalise or pervade stigmatisation or discrimination against them. In the public discourse on the repeal of Section 377A so far, I am heartened to see a lot more restraint exhibited in comparison to what we saw back in 2007, when the repeal was first debated. This is a positive sign that our society has evolved and we are able to discuss difficult issues without being inflammatory. I hope, I hope the forward discourse will continue to be balanced, considered and secular. In a diverse and multifaceted society like ours, fault lines exist everywhere. Some are deep and old, others are new and emergent. We only need to look around the world to see many examples of how once inclusive and tolerant societies could suddenly become severely polarised and fractured. As Singaporeans, we must remember to always demonstrate a high level of respect and willingness to engage with fellow citizens who hold different views. To promote social harmony and cohesion, our national values should promote mutual accommodation and compassion among the different segments of the Singapore society. Even if we cannot agree, we must always uphold mutual respect and be prepared to listen and try to understand each other. In conclusion, I hope we can continue to work to eliminate all forms of discrimination and learn to embrace all fellow citizens as equal members of our society while always maintaining mutual respect and being accommodating towards each other. With that, I support the repeal of Section 377A of the Penal Code. Thank you.
Ms. Jessica Tan. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I'm speaking today on both the Penal Code Amendment Bill and the Bill on the Amendment to the Constitution, as many of my residents have reached out and written, reached out or written to me since PM's National Day Rally speech on the repeal of Section 377E. They had asked that I share their concerns and seek clarification to address the apprehension. This is a difficult topic with differing views, but an important one for all Singaporeans. At this point, I should share that uh, my personal uh, views on this as well. And I will say that uh, it took me quite a long time to write this speech. My speech is not long, don't worry. But uh, it took me a long time to write it because I had to ask myself, where do I stand on this? And um, it, you know, as a parent, and also being an MP for the last 16 years and seeing my residents and when they come to me with their issues, I have a very firm belief that the family is the cornerstone of society. And I really believe it is the source of strength and it's also the source of weakness. And therefore, I do cherish the traditional definition of family and, you know, being a parent for about 30 years, more than 30 years now, and uh, being married for 32 years, over 32 years, I will say to you, as much as I think I'm a good mother, I've realized that my husband and myself play a very important role for our three children. And I do want to preserve and protect that definition of family. So let me now summarize the apprehensions expressed by my residents and what they center around. One, the safeguarding and the definition of marriage as a union between men and a woman, and pro-family policies such as public housing, education, adoption rules, and media standards. Two, that the repeal of Section 377A will encourage gay activists to push the agenda much further, and this may cause reactions and divisions in Singapore, as we see happening in many countries in the world. And the concern of my residents is really the divisions and what it may cause. And three, protecting people from being pressured, bullied, or discriminated against when they do not support the same ideas and beliefs, whether to retain or to repeal Section 377A. Many have shared that they feel that Section 377A is a unique Singapore compromise. Its non-enforcement means our colleagues, friends, neighbours, and family members who identify themselves as homosexuals are able to live out their lives, their private lives, while protecting gay values from becoming mainstream. It has worked for Singapore. So the question is, why the need to make the change now? Ms. Minister Shanmugam has explained the circumstances that there are real risks that Section 377A can be struck down. Section 377A has been challenged as unconstitutional and continues to be challenged. The courts have judged that such matters are sensitive societal issues and, it, and it, it is for Parliament to decide. But the point is that if Parliament does nothing, the courts will have to do what it has to do when it has to do it. And when that happens, the apprehensions that have been expressed will become real. It is precisely that that the government, hearing the views of the majority, is acting. It is easier for the government to do nothing. And in fact, politically, actually, much, much easier. But given how controversial this issue, especially given how controversial this issue is, however, that would be extremely irresponsible as there is real risk and the very definition of marriage and the pro-family policies that the majority want to protect will be challenged as we are already seeing in several countries. On the point of why we keep, we keep 377A, I think it's also important that I also share feedback that I've received from residents that have friends colleagues and neighbours and family members, as I've shared, who are gay members. They and even those that have asked 
for the repeal of 377A, do not, do not view it as a crime that what consenting adult uh, gay men have and do in private. But what it stems more from the fact that of the fear of what it means after that. So what the repeal of 377A really does is it removes the stigma and the hurt that the gay in our community have been feeling. And they make us, and I want to say that gay, gay males are fellow Singaporeans, as they are and they can be your neighbour, your co-worker, your friend, or even your family member. They contribute to and are part of our society, and they too deserve dignity and respect. Now let me touch on the proposed amendment to the Constitution and the insertion of the new Article 156 and whether they will be sufficient to safeguard the definition of the institution of marriage and the associated pro-family policies. The new Article 156, subsection 3 and subsection 4 seek to protect the definition of marriage in such laws like the Women's Charter, the administration of the Muslim laws and laws that confer rights and benefits on or in relation to persons merit under those enactment from constitutional challenges. Pro-family policies of the government, example in regard to housing, education and media standards will therefore also be protected. But the anxiety is if this would make it easy for change as it will only require a simple majority to amend the definition of marriage. I've received feedback from some asking that the definition of marriage be directly in the constitution so as to require a two-thirds majority and not just a simple majority to affect such a radical redefinition. The proposed amendment, I feel, is a balanced one as it protects the traditional definition of marriage and pro-family policies while allowing our future generations to decide on societal norms. To give further reassurance, DPM Wong has given PAP's commitment that the definition of marriage as that of the union between men and a woman and will not change under the watch of the current leadership of PM Lee and if the PAP government were to win the next general election, it would not change under his watch. Those are reassurances that uh, have been given. And I think that that's a balanced approach and one that does seek to protect the definition that the majority want to hold. Finally, I'd like to talk about the cancel culture and bullying. We are hearing strong sentiments and differing views with the debate around the repeal of Section 377A. From the reactions and feedbacks shared, an area that is of concern and we must address is that of bullying and a cancel culture. Youth and working professionals have approached me and expressed fears and anxieties with gay activism. Some have shared that while they accept their friends and family who identify as gays, they find it difficult to voice their opinions when they do not share their values and ideas for fear of being labelled, bullied or cancelled in school or at the workplace. The fear, real or perceived, is that the repeal of 377A will amplify this activism. But similarly, I'd like to caution us that with the debate on this repeal, I, we are also seeing a heightened attention on those that identify as gay. I also have residents expressing concerns of possible discrimination against those who identify themselves as gay. So what is clear is that this is a subject that matters to many, regardless of whether we support or retain, uh, support the repeal or the retention of Section 377A. What we cannot allow is for any persons, regardless of which side they stand, to be labelled, discriminated or bullied. Minister, Shan, uh, Minister Shamugam and MOS Sun Xue Ling have shared that the agencies are looking at ways to ensure that, that discrimination is not tolerated. I would ask, um, and I would ask for more to be shared as to what the details of these are and to reassure 
individuals and groups that there are, that there are clear protections from discriminatory pressures, a cancel culture and bullying in society, in schools and or at the workplace. The societal values and definition of marriage, family and policies affecting our children are important for Singapore and Singaporeans. As we have done before, I do appeal to all. Regardless of where we stand on this matter, we must work together and not allow this to divide us. I do believe that while the amendments strive to provide the legislation to preserve and protect our social norms, how we act will determine the Singapore we have today and in the future. I support the amendment to the, uh, the Penal Code Amendment as well as the amendment to the Constitution. Thank you. Ms. Cheryl Chan. Mr. Deputy Speaker, in our 57 years of independence, Singapore has prided ourselves on being a multiracial, multi-religious country. While diversity exists, we have learned to respect and allow different individuals to practice their faith, beliefs, traditions and religions. All this are possible because first, we have intentional policies in place to enhance behaviours which are widely acceptable or discourage certain behaviours which are less accepted. Second, we learn to respect one another from the values we learned or they are taught in school and at home. Third, we define over time the country we wish to live in and the societal behaviours that most consider as norms. This is the basis I believe have bonded us together and enabled us to live in harmony thus far. But beneath this social model, there still lies frictions and differing views in our country. Some of these frictions or differences are not easily solved or appreciated by different groups as it is not simply an assessment of right or wrong, nor is it about the louder voice chimes. Especially not so when it comes to one's preferences, liberty of choices, and how can one can make others understand their views and accept it without having broader societal impact. If only things were as straightforward, there would be hope of reduced conflicts and more peace today. As it is with any evolving society, when the exposure to different facades of life become wider for most individuals, the reality is we are faced with a gradation of expectations and perceptions from the family, friends, co-workers and society. For us to move forward as a country, there needs to be more ability in us to actively hear different viewpoints, be less biased beginning with a lesser extent of prejudging people and for activists not to plainly impress one's agenda on others to accept regardless of others' preferences and values. How then can we achieve a calibrated balance between one's beliefs and practices without imposing on others? I believe this boils down to the values that define each of us and what we are prepared to accept and adopt in our lives. There are values which are considered key tenets of a society's mainstream, those which most can accept and acknowledge as norms. These values are those where people freely express and are naturally accepted without being judged. However, we must also recognise that there are other values which serve some unique groups or serve some purposes or being adopted by some but are not commonly observed amongst our daily lives. This is where management of social expectations and perceptions play a role. Personally, I was raised on the values where family centricity is key. One where marriage is defined as between one man and woman. This is what I also wish to see remain as the beliefs, teachings and practices in our education system. While I think many may share this view, we should not be oblivious that our next generation will not have access to information that influences them about homosexuality or sensitive topics, just because it is not taught or spoke about in mainstream schools. By not having it as mainstream, we can at best defer the exposure of our young ones to a later stage, when they are more mature to differentiate or make sound decisions independently. Thus, I firmly believe that to repeal 377A, it must be done on the grounds where the recognised legal union 
between a man and woman is also strongly protected by the definition within the Constitution. While well, now we can take reference of this in the form of the Article 156 if it is passed, we must ensure that the government stand by this firmly as we consider any future amendments to the legislations or even the repeals. Particularly so for ours, as many of today's legislations are designed with the family unit being the fundamental social fabric. Take the housing policy as an example. Today, the HDB public housing can be purchased or rented by those who have a family nucleus. But housing demands come from many groups besides those with a family nucleus. These groups include the unmarried singles, single parents with or without children, lone seniors and more. They too have a need for basic housing, but the applications are currently considered or are currently limited, sorry, are currently either limited by conditions or considered on a case-by-case -case basis. Hence, this brings about the question of fairness if the definition of family nucleus for married couple changes. For a need as basic as housing, this becomes a tricky situation. Home then should be given access to public housing and in a timely <coughs> manner. Sir, so, what may not be a social norm today that is publicly expressed and accepted does not imply that it cannot be privately practiced by various groups who adopt it as their way of living. Similarly, this also does not indicate that those who do not believe or adopt it should ostracize individuals who are different from themselves. Every family, every community, every individual have the right to choose what is comfortable for their lives. But as individuals, regardless of our beliefs and inclination, we should not impress upon others that they must embrace our way of living. With time and ability of individuals to perceive different norms, the values of what define us as a society will naturally surface. Thus, sir, I believe that let's not allow divisive voices to break us apart, but rather for us to consider when and how we want to be inclusive while maintaining our own beliefs and values. Thank you. Mr. Darrell David. Mr. Deputy Speaker, even before this debate started in the House, we had already had widespread debate and exchanges of views regarding this matter across various platforms and in the community. The responses and emotions were mixed from disappointment that the repeal was not enough to concern that societal norms and values would be challenged and even eventually possibly changed. Indeed, in the run-up to this parliamentary sitting, I've often been asked what my views are on the matter. And one particular question that I was asked, which, which stuck with me, was if I was pro-repeal or pro-family. Now, these were terms that made me realise how polarising the issue was for many people who took a binary view of the matter. For them, it was either one or the other. My reply was to that person who asked me, and is, that I am pro-people and pro-Singapore. And these are two principles that I've always strongly believed in and is why I'm speaking today in support of this bill and the subsequent repeal of 377A. I would like to address the issue of why 377A should be repealed first. Mr Deputy Speaker, when we use the term community and society, we have to acknowledge that these are larger entities that are made up of individuals. They are made up of people of people. And no one, no one is exactly alike. We, we look different, we, we think different, we have different beliefs, we have different cultures, we have different values, we have different lifestyles, and yes, we have different sexual preferences and practices. Now, a truly inclusive community and society consists of people, people who are willing to not just tolerate, but actually accept those who are different from them. And those who are different should not be discriminated against in any way. As such, while I understand the legal arguments for the repeal of 377A, I would like to say that it's even more important for us to recognise the need to repeal 377A from the perspective of moral integrity. Now, you might ask, how would you define moral integrity? I think simply put, moral integrity is doing the right thing 
because it's the right thing to do. Now, two men having sex in private, in private, is precisely that, a private, and in my opinion, a personal matter, and it should not be something that is regarded as criminal. In this regard, I believe that repealing 377A is thus the right thing to do because it's the right thing to do. Repealing this law sends a strong signal that we do recognize and respect individual differences and that different groups are welcome in our community. Which brings me to my next point about people, community and conversations. Because we now have to look at the issue also from the different perspective of how, while a community and society is made up of people, as I mentioned earlier, these people do not live in isolated silos, but have to live and function within the larger entity of a community. Now, in this regard, the changes that the government is affirming with the definition of marriage, of what constitutes a family and related social policies are done in the context of what it feels would work for our Singaporean community, having taken into account various opinions and views on the matter. Now, differences in opinions such as those arising from a topic such as the repeal of Section 377A can lead different groups to clashing head-on over issues. It may lead to our society fracturing over fault lines because of the different hectoring voices that shout others down. However, and this is my sincere hope, such differences, if looked at rationally, can also be an opportunity, an opportunity for frank and open dialogue to look at the debate and embrace different perspectives and viewpoints. Now, these conversations based on mutual respect can help us evolve into a more inclusive society, one that is richer through plurality and diversity. Enshrining anything in law is important, but equally important is the value of open discussion and mutual respect. It's also important not to embrace a cancel culture or to automatically rule out someone who holds different views or even someone who decides to look at the topic conservatively. Worse still, we should not go back to labelling and stereotyping, even though I know I just used the term conservatively. What does liberal mean? What, what does conservative mean? My view is that it would be good to allow others their views. Even it may seem more traditional, less progressive, there go the labels again, <laughs> when viewed through certain lenses. So I know it's not easy, it's not, it's not possible, but it is really my view that we are able to allow others with a different opinion for us to speak to have their voices heard, for us to have this dialogue. I'd now like to move into education and schools, Mr Deputy Speaker. I believe it would be good to consider education and consider how the schools can play a part in nurturing open conversations so this topic is handled sensitively. Our schools must be safe places for students to engage in respectful conversations or debates with others who may hold contrary opinions. Through the, through the careful management of discussions and controversial issues, schools can help promote freedom of expression as well as inclusion and tolerance. Now, in doing so, I believe they would encourage mutual understanding and acceptance. And in many ways, sensitive handling of these challenging issues would be a form of modeling of open discussion. There could also be instances where students themselves are exploring their own identity and having trained educators who could help them in this journey of discovery would be important. So I feel it would be good if the government could consider how educators could be trained to handle these issues and other related topics that might emerge from this debate. Mr Deputy Speaker, in one of my previous speeches, I referred to the Singaporean identity as a quilt, a patchwork of many cultures and multiple identities that we have stitched together and that has stayed together over the past 55 years. I then made the point that like any quilt in time, we do have occasional tears in the fabric and some parts of the quilt are fraying at the edges. Perhaps these parts are parts of our community that we haven't always heard, engaged or connected with and who are somehow feeling that uh, they're like a discarded scrap of cloth rather than part of a, a beautiful and wonderful quilt. But I believe that what continues to connect us, what will help mend the tears and strengthen the fabric in our quilt will be the strong threads that start with conversation, dialogue, and understanding, and all done with respect. So while this debate might be settled uh, in the House over the next couple of days, I hope that the different groups in our society will continue to have important and relevant conversations and treat one another with dignity and respect 
so we can indeed work towards a Singapore that emerges stronger. With that, I conclude my speech in support of the bill and the repeal of 377A. Thank you, sir. Minister Masagos, would you like to move exempted business? Mr. Speaker, I beg to move that the proceedings on the business set down on the order paper for today be exempted at this day's sitting from the provisions of standing order number two. The question is the motion moved by the Minister, as many as are of the opinion say aye. To the contrary, say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Ms. Joan Pereira. Mr. Speaker, sir, the government's rationale for the repeal of 377A has been laid out quite clearly over the past few months. However, I would like to express my worry that fault lines are being drawn in our society as a result of the views of various groups in our society occupying the centre stage on this issue. The concerns and aspirations of every Singaporean should be heard and should be valued, especially on such issues that matter to all of us. For most of the voices that are speaking up, they have come from a place of love. A love for the future of this country, a love for the future of our people and our society, and a love for this world. There are members of our community who have difficulty accepting the implications that they feared would come with the repeal of Section 377A. The fear is about losing the fundamental values that we have built our society on and the fabric that holds us together. To me, this fear comes from a position of love, not of hate, as they love the country and community that we have built and are worried about it being damaged. There are also members of our community who feel that the repeal of 377A has been long overdue, and some of them are also hoping that our societal norms can further evolve and become more liberal towards different types of marriages and families. This set of views also stems from a place of love, where they would like to embrace differences and allow everyone to pursue whatever lifestyle they so desired. Unfortunately, we have also come across voices who do not come from a place of love, but would rather stir hatred and misunderstanding within our society, and these are the ones who are drawing and then exploiting fault lines within our social fabric. Such views can come from any quarter of society, and may even be disguised as supporters of any of the positions that I had mentioned above. But their ultimate aim is to push Singapore to an extreme corner of the spectrum without consideration as to whether this would be good for us. Some of these could also be driven or initiated by foreign elements with an insidious agenda, given the borderless nature of social media and the internet. We are a small and closely knit nation. Our society cannot afford to be polarised by this issue. We have already so many challenges facing us as families, as communities and as a nation. We need to unite and fight as one to overcome the many difficulties which lie ahead. The COVID pandemic is not yet over. We have to deal with the rising cost of living amid increasing global tensions and geopolitical conflicts. We need to combat social and income inequality and strive to make sure that no Singaporean is left behind. I hope 
that cool heads will prevail and we can all take a step back and understand one another's positions and work together as a society to bridge any differences. Let us all be more understanding of and respectful towards one another so that no one will feel discriminated against. This is one aspect where we individuals have choice. Thank you. Mr. Sharutaha. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, sir. Mr. Speaker, sir, at the National Day Rally, PM Lee's announcement that Singapore will repeal Section 377A of the Penal Code and amend the Constitution to protect the definition of marriage reflects the common agreement that many believe our gay citizens have a place in society and should not be treated as criminals. And in Singapore, marriage between a man and woman remains the fundamental building blocks of a family. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to touch on a few points. One, 377A as a penal code issue. Two, protection of current social and family norms. Three, preventing increasingly aggressive and divisive activism. Mr. Speaker, there remains some concern that the repeal of 377A will lead to a drastic change in so social norms, such as how marriages would be defined in the future, sexuality educations in schools, and what can or cannot be screened on televisions and in the cinema. However, we have to consider how since 2007, when 377A was last debated, social acceptance for homosexuality has shifted appreciably, as mentioned by PM Lee. Back then, it was decided not to actively enforce 377A. In addition to shifting societal values, we have to also consider the significant risk of Section 377A being struck down in the court of law on the grounds that it breaches the provisions of equal protection in our constitution as discussed extensively by Min Shanmugam earlier. It has been unsuccessfully challenged in the past before, but it will be reckless of us to not consider this and the ramifications if it was struck down without any protection on the definition of marriage as how our society values it. Mr. Speaker, while I appreciate that there are some res uh, reservations and concerns from certain segments of society, most of us agree that two males committing sexual act or acts of gross indecency, as the law puts it in private, should not be punished by imprisonment of up to two years. Hence, it is only right that we consider to repeal 377A in our penal code. We acknowledge that we are still a largely conservative society, but our gay citizens have a place in society and should not be treated as criminals. While in general more accepting of homosexuality now, we are also very concerned about protecting the current so social and family norms. With the repeal of 377A, how can we effectively safeguard our social norms and values, and in particular, the institution of marriage which is currently defined as being that between men and women. We must also understand how this definition underpins various national policies such as housing and education. Hence, it is even more necessary for us to ensure that the current social and family norms are protected. Undoubted, undoubtedly, there are strong views for and against the repeal of 377A and the amendment to the Constitution. There are concerns that there will be increased activism on both ends of the spectrum, which can potentially be aggressive and, more importantly, divisive to our society. I think it is necessary for us to accept this as a consensus. The best possible outcome, given the various viewpoints and deliberations with regards to all the various groups of people, religious, non-religious organisations and the community, which has been ongoing since 2007 and before. While we should not curtail or suppress social activism for causes that our citizens believe in, we must also caution against extreme views and actions that may prove to be divisive to our society. In time to come, should values and norms here in Singapore appreciably shift again, then we should be able to come together, sharing our views and reaching a consensus on how we best move forward. Activists in both camps did not think that they should resort to drastic measures to highlight their cause, nor should any of us 
be influenced by foreign developments, including pushing values from multinational corporations which are not aligned with our Singaporean values. Singapore's laws are its own, and we need not follow the lead of other countries if it, did not, if it does not suit the values and disposition of our citizens. Mr. Speaker, in Malay, please. Kita dapat lihat bagaimana seluruh dunia berubah mengikut peredaran zaman. Pandangan masyarakat juga telah berubah. Section 377A, 377A ialah sebuah perundangan yang kita warisi daripada British dan telah dijadikan sebagai satu simbol untuk takrifkan perkahwinan sebagai antara seorang lelaki dan wanita. Awal tahun ini, di dalam kes Tan Seng Ki versus Peguam Negara, Pejabat Peguam Negara mendapati bahawa terdapat risiko besar bahawa Section 377A boleh ditolak di mahkamah kerana ia melanggar peruntukan bagi persamaan dalam perlembagaan kita. Meskipun kes-kes sebelum ini tidak berjaya untuk menolak Section 377A, namun kita tidak boleh mengambil risiko itu. Lebih-lebih lagi kerana keputusan yang besar seperti itu akan meninggalkan impak yang besar kepada perundangan lain. Bagi masyarakat Islam kita, kita mempunyai amlah yang memberikan definasi perkahwinan. Awal tahun ini, saya gembira bahawa Timbalan Perdana Menteri Lawrence Wong telah memberikan jaminan bahawa PAP akan terus menegakkan polisi yang mengutamakan keluarga dan akan terus memastikan bahawa perkahwinan akan ditakrifkan sebagai antara lelaki dan wanita. Walaupun ini memastikan bahawa polisi Walaupun ini memastikan bahawa polisi di Singapura akan terus mengutamakan keluarga dan definasi perkahwinan tidak akan bertukar, kita tidak dapat menafikan bahawa seluruh dunia telah dan akan terus berkembang, termasuk nilai-nilai masyarakat mereka sendiri. Kita tidak boleh dipengaruhi oleh anasir-anasir asing, termasuk syarikat MNC yang menyokong nilai-nilai yang tidak sehaluan dengan masyarakat kita. Undang-undang Singapura adalah undang-undang kita dan kita tidak seharusnya mengikut perkembangan di negara lain jika ia tidak bersesuaian dengan negara kita. Oleh itu, ia adalah penting bagi kita untuk mentakrifkan apakah nilai-nilai yang kita inginkan dalam masyarakat Singapura. Ibarat pepatah Melayu, melentur buluh, biarlah dari rebungnya. Ia adalah penting bagi kita untuk membina keluarga kita dengan nilai-nilai ini supaya kita dapat menanamnya dalam anak-anak kita. Mengenai homoseksualiti, kita harus mengakui bahawa terdapat segelintir dalam masyarakat kita yang berdepan dengan cabaran-cabaran pribadi dan kadangkala mereka diejek, dikutuk dan dipinggirkan atau ketinggalan tanpa sokongan keluarga mereka sejak muda lagi. Dalam menanam nilai-nilai ke- kekeluargaan, kita juga harus memupuk dan menunjukkan nilai-nilai keagamaan. Kita seperti rama, belas kasihan dan kasih sayang antara satu sama lain supaya individu-individu ini tidak terasa tersisih dan tersingkir daripada masyarakat kita. Sedang kita masing-masing memberi sokongan keluarga, saya menggesa masyarakat kita untuk merujuk kepada Asatiza dan Muiz untuk mendapatkan bantuan dan bimbingan jika diperlukan. Mr. Speaker, admittedly, however, this is not the end of our conversation on this topic, just like all the other issues that we face in society. Society is dynamic and ever-changing. Hence, we must continue to keep future dialogue civil, rational, and most importantly, beneficial for Singapore as a whole. We only have to look around us to see how issues can be made very divisive if everyone insists on their entrenched views and not hear each other out and come to a compromise. While we would like to repeal 377A, we would also like to protect the prevailing definition of marriage while still allowing recourse in the future. How then do we protect the definition of marriage, something which we all value as a society? By ensuring that the definition of marriage is dependent of the parliament. And parliament will define marriage based on the prevailing values and views of the Singaporean society at any given point of time. And at this juncture, I wish to thank PM Lee and DPM Wong for the clear assurance that the PAP government will continue to uphold our family-centered policies and is fully committed to that. 
and will continue to uphold marriage as defined between men and women. In this way, even if one does not agree with the repeal of 377A, at least the definition of marriage is preserved for the time being in our constitution. On the other hand, for those who welcome the repeal and look beyond decriminalization, there is room for, def for the definitions to change when public opinion, values, and non norms differ. I think this is a viable compromise for our society to move forward for now. With the points considered earlier, Mr. Speaker, sir, I do support the repeal and the amendments to the Constitution. Thank you. Mr. Mark Chee. Mr. Speaker, Section 377A of the Penal Code is a complex topic, one that has been passionately debated in and out of this House. I'm glad that Singapore's government has decided to finally repeal 377A. I believe Section 377A is no longer relevant in contemporary Singaporean society. I agree with its repeal. I would also like to state my support for the inclusion of Article 156 of the Constitution, which clarifies the power to make laws to do with the institution of marriage rightly vests with this very parliament and for parliament to protect the prevailing definition of marriage. This could potentially be a divisive issue, but it may not be. I see it instead as an opportunity to open meaningful conversations about equality and inclusivity within our society. Equality being one of our nation's ideals. We need to ensure that policies implemented to uphold equal protection of rights for Singaporeans who do not fit squarely into the definition of traditional family unit. So for instance, single parent households and LGBTQ Singaporeans amongst others. After all, these people and many others not mentioned contribute to the diverse, vibrant, welcoming society that is so admired around the world. Do our policies recognize this and are we doing enough for them? In this regard, I would like to put forward the following suggestions. First, can PMO consider co coordinating a policy review across the whole of government and ensure that those who are not married are actively considered as part of the policy making process? Other jurisdictions, such as the European Union, have undertaken similar reviews in ensuring that all citizens, regardless of their background, are not unfairly discriminated against. This also ties into the ongoing Forward Singapore exercise as we refresh our social compact to pursue a more equal and inclusive society. Second, we'll be on education for our children. Are we doing enough to ensure that our children understand that even though their peers may not fit into the definition of a traditional family unit, either because of their home situation or their personal realities, that these peers should not be treated differently, or worse, derivatively. Uh, I would like to encourage MOE to have meaningful conversations with students, not for the purposes of problem solving, but to seek understanding. I would like to see more education content on handling relationships, not just the hetero, in the heterosexual sense, but all definitions of relationships. I agree with my parliamentary colleague here, uh, the Honourable Member Daryl David, that you know, schools should be a safe space to explore, to debate, to educate about respect and, and, and inclusivity. And you know, we should train our teachers to have productive conversations with students about these. So in conclusion, Mr. Speaker, sir, regardless of where all, this, all in this house stand, I think we all agree that we want the best for our country and our people for a prosperous, and inclusive, and forward-looking Singapore. During his speech to announce Singapore's independence from Malaysia on 9th August 1965, our founding father Lee Kuan Yew said, quote, everyone will have his place, equal, language, culture, religion, unquote. We are thus compelled to move in this direction and ensure that every Singaporean 
can live a joyful, happy and peaceful life and contribute meaningfully to this great nation. It is based on these ideals for a better Singapore that were first articulated more than five decades ago that we have built this inclusive global city which we are all proud to call home today. Singapore has indeed become a beacon for many and while conservative in our nature, we are a tolerant, peaceful and harmonious society where everyone can live in community without fear. I hope that one day we will not have to rely on the constitution to safeguard, respect and celebrate our differences, where there is a lot more binding us together as Singaporeans, a love for food, being kiasu, being champion, grumblers, then what differentiates us? We have built a society based on interracial and interreligious harmony. I'm certain we can establish a similarly harmonious relationship between each other regardless of our differences. In fact, we can learn to welcome, protect and even celebrate those differences as one diverse, inclusive, harmonious nation of Singaporeans. Ms. Henry Quick. Mr. Speaker, sir, I stand in support of the amendments proposed today. Our society's view on 377A has evolved over time. Part of it can be attributed to our youth today. Therefore, I believe I can best contribute to the debate by highlighting their views. Most of our youth want 377A gone because it suggests that some Singaporeans are less than others. The views of our youth are not solely attributed to the influx of woke culture from the West. There's a more fundamental reason, and that is, for the past few decades, we have been building a kinder Singapore. Our schools have taught our children and youth the value of justice, empathy and kindness. Naturally, our youth believe that the dignity of every Singaporean matters. Therefore, we should not be surprised that our youth think about that the provisions of 377A are innately discriminatory, even if they are not enforced by the government. So should we be surprised that our youth can empathise with the lived experience of the gay community, some of whom have experienced real or perceived discrimination? No, we should not. At the same time, while our Singaporean youth respect diversity, they also continue to uphold the sensibility of a traditional society. They are pro-family, and most believe marriage is best defined as between a man and a woman. Therefore, with regards to family, their views are not that different from the generations of Singaporeans before them. Most of them have grown up with loving parents, grandparents, and under the nurturing shade of our family-centric policies. They therefore intuitively understand the importance of families, not just for themselves, but also for society. At the same time, many youths also wondered why it took society so long to repeal 377A. However, they have now observed the painstaking consensus-building effort needed to move Singapore along. And because our youth can empathise with differing viewpoints, our youth now have a deeper sense of understanding of how a more traditional Singaporeans view. Therefore, I believe that most of our youth will support the amendments proposed today. To sum up, our youth does not see the repeal of 377A or their belief that all Singaporean matters as contradictory to their pro-family stance. Their views are reasonable and we should listen to them. Next, I'd like to talk about how we can best support our youth on this issue, especially on the one hand, our youth who are gay and worried that they will be ostracized, and on the other hand, our youth who are worried about being cancelled for voicing in a respectful manner their traditional family values. Indeed, we must take pains to ensure that our schools remain neutral on this issue and support both types of youth in an effective and low-key manner. I have observed that for a minority of youth, there's a certain fluidity in gender self-identification. A youth might identify himself as gay at a certain age, but have a different take years later. And the reverse can also be true. Therefore, our schools should neither celebrate or ostracize our youth for being gay. Our schools should not let gender become the defining attribute of who a person is, because if this issue gets polarized, we'll be robbing them opportunity to do an authentic self-evaluation 
in their formative years of who they truly are. We must also remember that for a small country, if our children and youth are fiercely divided along any issues, and then they grow up within the confines of those fault lines, the divide is not just ideological. It can get deeply personal. Remember, we are a small country. Frequently, the divide will have a human face attached to that divide. And in my discussion with many teachers and school leaders, I believe our primary, secondary school and JC leaders have done a good job in keeping our schools neutral. They have taken a child-centric approach to providing quiet and effective support to our youth. And compared to other countries, they have been quite successful in preventing educators from injecting their personal agenda into the classroom. But it has been a while since we have last debated on this issue, so it's best if MOE can remind our school leaders and teachers on this, and Singaporeans will also appreciate it if MOE can reiterate their firm stance on this matter. The situation in our tertiary institute is more complex. At that age, our youth are at the discovery stage in their lives, and our educators have a lot less influence over the students. Therefore, I hope we can consider legislations moving forward to prevent cancer culture from taking root in Singapore. Let me now conclude, Mr. Speaker. I stand in support of the proposed amendments because they are the result of a painstaking consensus-building effort, thereby cementing our common ground into law, and also because they refresh our social compact on gender and marriage for the years ahead, thereby addressing the very reasonable concerns of more traditional Singaporeans and because it helps us move Singapore forward. Thank you. Leader. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move that the debate be now adjourned. The question is that the debate be now adjourned. As many as our opinions say aye. 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 To the contrary, say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Resumption of debate, what day? Tomorrow, sir. So be it. Leader. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move that at its rising today, Parliament do stand adjourned to 12 noon tomorrow. The question is that at its rising today, Parliament do stand adjourned to 12 noon tomorrow. As many as of the opinion say aye. 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 To the contrary, say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Mr. Speaker. I beg to move that Parliament do now adjourn.